A Child's Story by Charles Dickens. Read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Once upon a time, a good many years ago, there was a traveller, and he set out upon a journey. It was a magic journey, and was to seem very long when he began it, and very short when he got halfway through. He travelled along a rather dark path for some little time without meaning anything, until at last he came to a beautiful child. So he said to the child, What do you do here? And the child said, I am always at play. Come and play with me. So he played with that child the whole day long, and they were very merry. The sky was so blue, the sun was so bright, the water was so sparkling, the leaves were so green, the flowers were so lovely, and they heard such singing birds and saw so many butterflies, that everything was beautiful. This was in fine weather. When it rained, they loved to watch the falling drops and to smell the fresh scents. When it blew, it was delightful to listen to the wind and fancy what it said as it came rushing from its home. Where was that, they wondered, whistling and howling, driving the clouds before it, bending the trees, rumbling in the chimneys, shaking the house, and making the sea roar in fury. But when it snowed, that was the best of all. They liked nothing so well as to look up at the white flakes falling fast and thick, like down from the breasts of millions of white birds, and to see how smooth and deep the drift was, and to listen to the hush upon the paths and roads. They had plenty of the finest toys in the world, and the most astonishing picture-books, all about scimitars and slippers and turbans, and dwarfs and giants and genie and fairies, and blue beards and beanstalks and riches and caverns and forests and valentines and orsons, and all new and all true. But one day, of a sudden, the traveller lost the child. He called to him over and over again, but got no answer. So he went upon his road, and went on for a little while without meeting anything, until at last he came to a handsome boy. So he said to the boy, What do you do here? And the boy said, I am always learning. Come and learn with me. So he learned with that boy about Jupiter and Juno, and the Greeks and the Romans, and I don't know what, and learned more than I could tell, nor he either, for he soon forgot a great deal of it. But they were not always learning. They had the merriest games that ever were played. They rode upon the river in summer, and skated on the ice in winter. They were active of foot and active on horseback, at cricket and all games at ball, at prisoner's base, hare and hounds, follow my leader, and more sports than I can think of. Nobody could beat them. They had holidays, too, and twelfth cakes, and parties where they danced till midnight and real theatres where they saw palaces of real gold and silver rise out of the real earth, and saw all the wonders of the world at once. As to friends, they had such dear friends, and so many of them, that I want the time to reckon them up. They were all young, like the handsome boy, and were never to be strange to one another all their lives through. Still, one day, in the midst of all these pleasures, the traveller lost the boy as he had lost the child, and after calling to him in vain, went on upon his journey. So he went on for a little while without seeing anything, until at last he came to a young man. So he said to the young man, What do you do here? And the young man said, I am always in love. Come and love with me. So he went away with that young man, and presently they came to one of the prettiest girls that ever was seen, just like Fanny in the corner there. And she had eyes like Fanny, and hair like Fanny, and dimples like Fanny's, and she laughed and coloured just as Fanny does while I am talking about her. 
so the young man fell in love directly just as somebody i won't mention the first time he came here did with fanny well he was teased sometimes just as somebody used to be by fanny and they quarrelled sometimes just as somebody and fanny used to quarrel and they made it up and sat in the dark and wrote letters every day and never were happy asunder and were always looking out for one another and pretending not to and were engaged at christmas time and sat close to one another by the fire and were going to be married very soon all exactly like somebody i won't mention and fanny but the traveller lost them one day as he had lost the rest of his friends after calling to them to come back which they never did went on upon his journey so he went on for a little while without seeing anything until at last he came to a middle-aged gentleman so he said to the gentleman what are you doing here and his answer was i am always busy come and be busy with me so he began to be very busy with that gentleman and they went on through the wood together the whole journey was through a wood only it had been open and green at first like a wood in spring and now began to be thick and dark like a wood in summer some of the little trees that had come out earliest were even turning brown the gentleman was not alone but had a lady of about the same age with him who was his wife and they had children who were with them too so they all went on together through the wood cutting down the trees and making a path through the branches and the fallen leaves and carrying burdens and working hard sometimes they came to a long green avenue that opened into deeper woods then they would hear a little distant voice crying father father i am another child stop for me and presently they would see a very little figure growing larger as it came along running to join them when it came up they all crowded round it and kissed and welcomed it and then they all went on together sometimes they came to several avenues at once and then they all stood still and one of the children said father i am going to sea and another said father i am going to india and another father i am going to seek my fortune where i can and another father i am going to heaven so with many tears at parting they went solitary down those avenues each child upon its way and the child who went to heaven rose into the garden air and vanished whenever these partings happened the traveller looked at the gentleman and saw him glance up at the sky above the trees where the day was beginning to decline and the sunset to come on he saw too that his hair was turning grey but they could never rest long for they had their journey to perform and it was necessary for them to be always busy at last there had been so many partings that there were no children left and only the traveller the gentleman and the lady went upon their way in company and now the wood was yellow and now brown and the leaves even of the forest trees began to fall so they came to an avenue that was darker than the rest and were pressing forward on their journey without looking down it when the lady stopped my husband said the lady i am cold they listened and they heard a voice a long way down the avenue say mother mother it was the voice of the first child who had said i am going to heaven and the father said i pray not yet the sunset is very near i pray not yet but the voice cried mother mother without minding him though his hair was now quite white and tears were on his face then the mother who was already drawn into the shade of the dark avenue and moving away with her arm still round his neck kissed him and said my dearest i am summoned and i go and she was gone 
and the traveller and he were left alone together. And they went on and on together, until they came to very near the end of the wood, so near that they could see the sunset shining red before them through the trees. Yet once more, while he broke his way among the branches, the traveller lost his friend. He called and called, but there was no reply, and when he passed out of the wood and saw the peaceful sun going down upon a wide purple prospect, he came to an old man sitting on a fallen tree. So he said to the old man, "'What do you do here?' And the old man said with a calm smile, "'I am always remembering. Come and remember with me.' So the traveller sat down by the side of that old man, face to face with a serene sunset, and all his friends came softly back and stood around him. The beautiful child, the handsome boy, the young man in love, the father, mother, and children, every one of them was there, and he had lost nothing. So he loved them all, and was kind and forbearing with them all and was always pleased to watch them all, and they all honoured and loved him. And I think the traveller must be yourself, dear grandfather, because this is what you do to us, and what we do to you. End of The Child's Story by Charles Dickens A Christmas Dinner Second part of the first chapter of A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man by James Joyce. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A great fire banked high and red flamed in the grate and under the ivy-twined branches of the chandelier the christmas table was spread they had come home a little late and still dinner was not ready but it would be ready in a jiffy his mother had said they were waiting for the door to open and for the servants to come in holding the big dishes covered with their heavy metal covers all were waiting. Uncle Charles, who sat far away in the shadow of the window, Dante and Mr. Casey, who sat in the easy chairs at either side of the hearth, Stephen, seated on a chair between them, his feet resting on the toasted bus. Mr. Dedalus looked at himself in the pier-glass above the mantelpiece, waxed out his moustache ends, and then, parting his coat-tails, stood with his back to the glowing fire, and still from time to time he withdrew a hand from his coat-tail to wax out one of his moustache ends. Mr. Casey leaned his head to one side, and, smiling, tapped at the glant of his neck with his fingers. And Stephen smiled too, for he knew now that it was not true that Mr. Casey had a purse of silver in his throat. He smiled to think how the silvery noise which Mr. Casey used to make had deceived him. And when he had tried to open Mr. Casey's hand to see if the purse of silver was hidden there, he had seen that the fingers could not be straightened out. And Mr. Casey had told him that he had got those three crumpled fingers, making a birthday present for Queen Victoria. Mr. Casey tapped the glant of his neck and smiled at Stephen with sleepy eyes, and Mr. Dedalus said to him, Yes, well now, that's all right. Oh, we had a good walk, hadn't we, John? Yes. I wonder if there's any likelihood of dinner this evening. Yes, oh, well, now we got a good bread of ozone round the head today. I be dead. He turned to Dante and said, You didn't stir out at all, Mrs. Riordan. 
Dante frowned and said shortly, No. Mr. Dedalus dropped his coat-tails and went over to the sideboard. He brought forth a great stone jar of whisky from the locker and filled the decanter slowly, bending now and then to see how much he had put in. Then, replacing the jar in the locker, he poured a little of the whisky into two glasses, added a little water and came back with them to the fireplace. A thimbleful, John, he said, just to whet your appetite. Mr. Casey took the glass, drank, and placed it near him on the mantelpiece. Then he said, Well, I can't help thinking of our friend Christopher manufacturing. He broke into a fit of laughter and coughing and added, Manufacturing that champagne for those fellows. Mr. Dedalus laughed loudly. Is it Christy, he said, there's more cunning in one of those warps on his bald head than in a pack of jack foxes. He inclined his head, closed his eyes, and clipping his lips profusely, began to speak with the voice of the hotel keeper. And he has such a soft mouth when he's speaking to you, don't you know? He's very moist and watery about the juleps. God bless him. Mr. Casey was still struggling through his fit of coughing and laughter. Stephen, seeing and hearing the hotel keeper through his father's face and voice, laughed. It. Mr. Dedalus put up his eyeglass and, staring down at him, said quietly and kindly, What are you laughing at, you little puppy, you? The servants entered and placed the dishes on the table. Mrs. Dedalus followed, and the places were arranged. Sit over, she said. Mr. Dedalus went to the end of the table and said, Now, Mrs. Riordan, sit over. John, sit you down, my hearty. He looked round to where Uncle Charles sat and said, Now then, sir, there's a bird here waiting for you. When all had taken their seats, he laid his hand on the cover and then said quickly, withdrawing it, Now, Stephen? Stephen stood up in his place to say the grace before meals. Bless us, O Lord, and these thy gifts which through thy bounty we are about to receive through Christ, O Lord. Amen. All blessed themselves, and Mr. Dedalus, with a sigh of pleasure, lifted from the dish the heavy cover, pearled around the edge with glistening drops. Stephen looked at the plum turkey which had slain, dressed and stewed on the kitchen table. He knew that his father had paid the guinea for it in Dunks of Dollier Street, and that the man had prodded it often at the breastbone to show how good it was, and he remembered the man's voice when he had said, Take that one, sir, that's the real Ali Daly. Why did Mr. Barrett in Clongoes call his spandy bat a turkey? But Clongoes was far away, and the warm, heavy smell of turkey and ham and celery rose from the plates and dishes and the great fire was banked high and red in the grate, and the green ivy and red holly made you feel so happy, and when dinner was ended, the big plum pudding would be carried in, studded with peeled almonds and sprigs of holly, with bluish fire running around it, and the little green flag flying from the top. It was his first Christmas dinner, and he thought of his little brothers and sisters who were waiting in the nursery, as he had often waited, till the pudding came. The deep blue colour and the eaten jacket made him feel queer and oldish, and that morning, when his mother had brought him down to the parlour, dressed for mass, his father had cried. That was because he was thinking of his own father, and Uncle Charles, had said so too. 
Mr. Dedalus covered the dish and began to eat hungrily. Then he said, Poor old Christy, he is nearly lopsided to now with roguery. Simon, said Mrs. Dedalus, you haven't given Mrs. Riordan any sauce. Mr. Dedalus says to Sauce Boat, Haven't I, he cried, Mrs. Riordan pitied the poor blind. Then he covered her plate with her hands and said, No, thanks. Mr. Dedalus turned to Uncle Charles. How are you off, sir? Right as the mail, Simon. You, John. I'm all right. Go on yourself. Mary? Here, Stephen, here's something to make your hair curl. He put so freely over Stephen's plate and set the boat again on the table. Then he asked Uncle Charles, was it tender? Uncle Charles could not speak because his mouth was full, but he nodded that it was. That was a good answer our friend made to the cannon. What? said Mr. Dedalus. I didn't think he had that much in him, said Mr. Casey. I'll pay your dues, father, when you cease turning the house of God into a polling booth. A nice answer, said Dante, for any man calling himself a Catholic to give to his priests. They have only themselves to blame, said Mr. Dedalus suavely. If they took the fool's advice, they would confine their attention to religion. It is religion, Dante said. They are doing their duty in warning the people. We go to the house of God. Mr. Casey said, in all humility, to pray to our Maker, and not to hear election addresses. It is religion, Dante said again. They are right. They must direct their flocks. And preach politics from the altar, is it? asked Mr. Dedalus. Certainly, said Dante. It is a question of public morality. A priest would not be a priest if he did not tell his flock what is right and what is wrong. Mrs. Dedalus let down her knife and fork, saying, For pity's sake, and for pity's sake, let us have no political discussion on this day of all days in the year. Quite right, ma'am, said Uncle Charles. Now, Simon, that's quite enough now. Not another word now. Yes, yes, said Mr. Dedalus quickly. He uncovered the dish boldly and said, Now then, who's for more turkey? Nobody answered. Dante said, Nice language for any Catholic to use. Mrs. Riordan, I appeal to you, said Mrs. Dedalus, to let the matter drop now. Dante turned on her and said, and I am to sit here and listen to the pastors of my church being flouted. Nobody is saying a word against them, said Mr. Dedalus, so long as they don't meddle in politics. The bishops and priests of Ireland have spoken, said Dante, and they must be obeyed. Let them leave politics alone, said Mr. Casey, or the people may leave their church alone. You hear? said Dante, turning to Mrs. Dedalus. Mr. Casey, Simon, said Mrs. Dedalus, let it end now. Too bad, too bad, said Uncle Charles. What? cried Mr. Dedalus. Were we to desert him at the bidding of the English people? He was no longer worthy to lead, said Dante. He was a public sinner. We are all sinners. And black sinners, said Mr. Casey coldly. Woe be to the man by whom the scandal cometh, said Mrs. Riordan. It would be better for him that a millstone were tied about his neck, and that he were cast into the depths of the sea, rather than that he should scandalize one of these, my least little ones. That is the language of the Holy Ghost. A very bad language, if you ask me, said Mr. Dedalus coolly. 
Simon, Simon, said Uncle Charles, the boy. Yes, yes, said Mr. Dedalus. I meant about the... I was thinking about the bad language of the railway porter. Well, now, that's all right. Here, Stephen, show me your plate, old chap. Eat away now, here. He hipped up the food on Stephen's plate and served Uncle Charles and Mr. Casey to large pieces of turkey and splashes of sauce. Mrs. Dedalus was eating little, and Dante sat with her hands in her lap. She was red in the face. Mr. Dedalus rooted with the calves at the end of the dish and said, There's a tasty bit here. We calls the Pope's nose. If any lady or gentleman, he held the piece of foam up on the prong of the carving fork. Nobody spoke. He put it on his own plate, saying, Well, you can't say, but you were asked. I think I had better eat it myself, because I'm not well in my health lately. He winked at Stephen, and, replacing the dish cover, began to eat again. There was a silence while he ate. Then he said, Well now, the day kept up fine after all. There were plenty of strangers down too. Nobody spoke. He said again, I think there were more strangers down than last Christmas. He looked round at the others, whose faces were bent towards their plates, and, receiving no reply, waited for a moment, and said bitterly, Well, my Christmas dinner has been spoiled anyhow. There could be neither luck nor grace, Dante said, in a house where there is no respect for the pastors of the church. Mr. Dedalus threw his knife and fork noisily on his plate. Respect, he said, is it for Billy with a lip, or for the top of guts up in Armag? Respect, princes of the church, said Mr. Casey in slow scorn. Lord Latrim's coachman, yes, said Mr. Dedalus. They are the Lord's anointed, then they said. They are an honour to their country. Tub of guts, said Mr. Dedalus coarsely. He has a handsome face, mind you, in repose. You should see that fellow lapping up his bacon and cabbage of a cold winter's day. Oh, Johnny, he twisted his features into a grimace of heavy bestiality and made a lapping noise with his lips. Really, Simon, you should not speak that before Stephen. It's not right. Oh, he'll remember all this when he grows up, said Dante hotly, the language he heard against God and religion and priest in his own home. Let him remember too, cried Mr. Casey to her from across the table, the language with which the priest and the priest's pounds broke Parnell's heart and hounded him into his grave. Let him remember that too when he grows up. Sons of bitches, cried Mr. Dedalus, when he was down, they turned on him to betray him, and rent him like rats in the sewer. Long live dogs! And they look it, by Christ, they look it! They behaved rightly. They obeyed their bishops and their priests. Honour to them! Well, it is perfectly dreadful to say that not even for one day in the year said Mrs. Zedalus. Can we be free from these dreadful disputes? Uncle Charles raised his hand mildly and said, Come now, come now, come now. Can we not have our opinions, whatever they are, without this bad temper and this bad language? It is too bad, surely. Mrs. Zedalus spoke to Dante in a low voice, but Dante said loudly, I will not say nothing. I will defend my church and my religion when it is insulted and spit on by renegade Catholics. 
Mr. Casey pushed his plate rudely into the middle of the table and, resting his elbows before him, said in a hoarse voice to his host, Tell me, did I tell you that story about a famous spit? You did not, John, said Mr. Dedalus. Why then, said Mr. Casey, it is a most instructive story. It happened not long ago in the Count Wicklow, where we are now. He broke off and, turning towards Dante, said with quiet indignation, And I may tell you, ma'am, that I, if you mean me, am not a renegade Catholic. I am a Catholic, as my father was, and his father before him, and his father before him again, when we gave up our lives rather than to sell our faith. The more shame to you now, Dante said, to speak as you do. The story, John, said Mr. Dedalus, smiling. Let us have the story anyhow. Catholic indeed, repeated Dante ironically. The blackest Protestant in the land would not speak the language I have heard this evening. Mr. Dedalus began to sway his head to and fro, crooning like a country singer. I am no Protestant, I tell you again, said Mr. Casey, flushing. Mr. Dedalus, still crooning and swaying his head, began to sing in a grunting nasal voice. O oh, come all you Roman Catholics that never went to Mass. He took up his knife and fork again in good humor and set to eating, saying to Mr. Casey, Let us have the story, John. It will help us to digest. Stephen looked with affection at Mr. Casey's face, which stared across the table over his joined hands. He liked to sit near him at the fire, looking at his dark, fierce face. But his dark eyes were never fierce, and his slow voice was good to listen to. But why was he then against the priests? Because Dante must be right then. But he heard his father say that she was a spoiled nun, and that she had come out of the convent in the Alleghenies, where her brother had got the money from the savages, from the trinkets and the chainies. Perhaps that made her severe, against Pamel, and she did not like him to play with Aileen, because Aileen was a Protestant, and when she was young she knew children that used to play with Protestants, and the Protestants used to make fun of the litany of the Blessed Virgin. Tower of Ivory, they used to say, House of Gold! How could the woman be a Tower of Ivory? or a house of gold. Who was right then? And he remembered the evening in the infirmary in Clongos, the dark waters, the light at the pierhead, and the moan of sorrow from the people when they had heard. Aileen had long white hands. One evening when playing Tig, she had put her hands over his eyes, long and wide and thin and cold and soft. That was ivory, a cold white thing. That was the meaning of Tower of Ivory. The story is very short and sweet, Mr. Casey said. It was one day down in Arklow, a cold bitter day, not long before the chief died. May God have mercy on him. He closed his eyes, wearily, and posed. Mr. Dedalus took a bone from his plate and tore some meat from it with his teeth, saying, Before he was killed, you mean. Mr. Casey opened his eyes, sighed, and went on. It was down in Arklow one day. We were down there at the meeting, and after the meeting was over we had to make our way to the railway station, through the crowd. 
such booing and boring man you never heard. They called us all the names in the world. Well, there was one old lady, and a drunken old harridan she was surely, that paid all her attention to me. She kept dancing along me in the mud, bawling and screaming into my face. Priest, hunter, the Paris fans, Mr. Fox, Kitty O'Shee. And what did you do, John? asked Mr. Dedalus. I let her bawl away, said Mr. Casey. It was a cold day, and to keep up my heart, I had, saving your presence, ma'am, a quid of tullamore in my mouth, and sure, I couldn't say a word in any case, because my mouth was full of tobacco juice. Well, John, well, I let her bawl away to her heart's content, Kitty or she, and the rest of it till, at last, she called that lady a name that I won't sully this Christmas board, nor your ears, ma'am, nor my own lips by repeating. He paused. Mr. Dedalus, lifting his head from the bone, asked, And what did you do, John? Do, said Mr. Casey. She stuck her ugly old face up at me when she said it, and I had my mouth full of tobacco juice. I bent down to her and psh, says I to her, like that. He turned aside and made the act of spitting. Psh, says I to her, like that, right into her eye. He clapped his hand to his eye and gave a hoarse scream of pain. Oh, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, says she. I'm blinded, I'm blinded and drowned. He stopped in a fit of coughing and laughter, repeating, I'm blinded entirely. Mr. Dedderus laughed loudly and lay back in his chair while Uncle Charles swayed his head to and fro. Then he looked terribly angry, and repeated while they lost it. Very nice, ha, very nice. It was not nice about the spit in the woman's eye. But what was the name the woman had called Kitty O'Shee that Mr. Casey would not repeat? He thought of Mr. Casey walking through the crowds of people and making speeches from a wagonette. That was what he had been imprisoned for, and he remembered that one night Sergeant O'Neill had come to the house and had stood in the hall, talking in a low voice with his father and chewing nervously at the chin strap of his cap. And that night Mr. Casey had not gone to Dublin by train, but the car had come to the door, and he had heard his father say something about the Cabinetili road. He was for Ireland and Parnell, and so was his father, and so was Dante too, for one night at a band on the Esplanade she had hit the gentleman on the head with her umbrella because he had taken off his hat when the band played God Save the Queen at the end. Mr. Dedderus gave a snort of content. Ah, John, he said, it's true for them. We are an unfortunate priest-ridden race, and always were, and always will be, till the end of the chapter. Uncle Charles shook his head, saying, A bad business, a bad business. Mr. Dedderus repeated, A priest-ridden, God-forsaken race. He pointed to the portrait of his grandfather on the wall to his right. Do you see that old chap up there, John, he said. He was a good Irishman, when there was no money in the job. He was condemned to death as a white boy. But he had a saying about our clerical friends, that he would never let one of them put his two feet under his mahogany. Then they broke in angrily. If we are a priest-ridden race, we ought to be proud of it. They are the apple of God's eye. Touch them not, say Christ, 
for them are the apple of my eye. And can we not love our country, then? asked Mr. Casey. Are we not to follow the man that was born to lead us? A traitor to his country, replied Dante. A traitor, an adulterer. The priests were right to abandon him. The priests were always the true friends of Ireland. Were they fate? said Mr. Casey. He threw his fist on the table and, frowning, angrily protruded one finger after another. Didn't the bishops of Ireland betray us in the time of the Union when Bishop Lanigan presented an address of loyalty to the Marquises Cornwallis? Didn't the bishops and priests sell the aspirations of their country in 1829 in return for Catholic emancipation? Didn't they denounce the Fenian movement from the pulpit and in the confession box? And didn't they dishonor the ashes of Terence Bellew McManus? His face was glowing with anger, and Stephen felt the glow rise to his own cheek as the spoken words thrilled him. Mr. Dedalus uttered a guffaw of coarse scorn. Oh, by God! he cried. I forgot little old Paul Cullen. Another apple of God's eye. Dante bent across the table and cried to Mr. Casey. Right, right, they were always right. God and morality and religion come first. Mrs. Dedalus, seeing her excitement, said to her, Mrs. Riordan, don't excite yourself answering them. God and religion before anything, Dante cried. God and religion before the world. Mr. Casey raised his clenched fist and brought it down on the table with a crash. Very well, then, he shouted hoarsely. If it comes to that, no God for Ireland. John, John, cried Mr. Dedalus, seizing his guest by the coat sleeve. Then they stared across the table, her cheeks shaking. Mr. Casey struggled up from his chair and bent across the table towards her, scraping the air before his eyes with one hand as though he were tearing aside a cobweb. No God for Ireland, he cried. We have had too much God in Ireland. Away with God. Blasphemer! Devil! screamed Dante, starting to her feet and almost spitting in his face. Uncle Charles and Mrs. Dedalus pulled Mr. Casey back into his chair again, talking to him from both sides reasonably. He stared before him out of his dark, flaming eyes, repeating, Away we got, I say. Dante shoved her chair violently aside and left the table, upsetting her napkin ring which rolled slowly along the carpet and came to rest against the foot of an easy chair. Mrs. Dedalus rose quickly and followed her towards the door. At the door, Dante turned round violently down the room, her cheeks flushed and quivering with rage. Devil out of hell! We won! We crushed him to death! Fiend! door slammed behind her. Mr. Casey, freeing his arms from his shoulders, suddenly bowed his head on his hands with a sob of pain. Poor Parnell, he cried loudly, my dead king. He sobbed loudly and bitterly. Stephen, Raising his terror-stricken face, saw that his father's eyes were full of tears. End of A Christmas Dinner by James Joyce Read by Herman Hoskans A Christmas Eve in the Far South Seas by Lewis Beck, read in English. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Donald McBride and myself were the only Britishers living on one of the North Pacific Island lagoons when Christmas of 1880 drew near, and we determined to celebrate it in a manner that would fill our German and American trading rivals throughout the group with envy. McBride was a bony, red-headed Scotsman, with a large heart and a small, jealous, half-caste wife. The latter acquisition ruled him with a rod of iron, much to his financial and moral benefit, but nevertheless agreed with me that we, Donald, she, and myself, ought to show the Americans and the Dutchmen how an English Christmas should be celebrated. But as Sarah was a half-caste native of the Pelus, and had never been to a civilized country, she also concurred with me that Donald and myself should run the show, which, although I was not a married man, was to take place in my house on account of the greater space available. Donald, she said, wanted to have a hackies, so we bought a nanny goat from Ludwig Wolfen, the German trader at Moloch, and one evening, the 23rd of December, I helped Sarah to drive and drag the unsuspecting creature home to her husband's place to the slaughter. I may as well say at once that McBride's nanny goat haggis was a hideous failure, and my boat's crew, to whom it was handed over with many strong expressions about McBride's beastly provincial taste, said that it smelt good like shark's liver, but was not at all so juicy. Meanwhile, Wolfen, a fat, good-hearted Teuton, with a face like a full moon in a fog, called upon me and remarked in a squashy tone of voice, superinduced by too many years of lager beer and its resultant adipose tissue, that he and Peter Hoismans, his neighbor, would feel very much hurt if we did not invite them to participate in the festivities. I said that Blazyhead, for so we called dear old McBride, and myself would be delighted, whereupon Wolfen, who had once, when he was a sailor on an English ship, spent a Christmas in a public house somewhere in the vicinity of the East India docks, said that the correct thing for us to do would be to have a Christmas cake. Also, he suggested we should invite Tom Devine and Charlie de Bui, the two American traders who lived across the lagoon, to join the party. Being aware of the fact that, from trade jealousies, there had hitherto been a somewhat notorious bitterness of feeling between my German fellow traders and the two Americans, I shook his hand warmly said that I was delighted to see that he could forgive and forget, and that I should that moment send my boat across the lagoon to Devine and Charlie de Bui with a written invitation, and ask them to favor us with their company. Also, that as Mrs. Charlie, who was a Samoan half-caste girl, was skilled in baking bread, perhaps she would lend Mesdames McBride, Wolfen, and Hoismans her assistance in making a Christmas cake, the size of which should cause the native population to sit up and respect us as men of more than ordinary intelligence and patriotism. On the evening of the 24th, three whaleboats, attended by a flotilla of small native canoes, sailed into the little sandy-beached nook upon the shores of which the trading station was situated. The three boats were steered by the Messrs. Peter Huysmans, Charles de Bui, and Thomas Devine, who were accompanied by their wives, children, and numerous female relatives, all the latter being clad in their holiday attire of new mats, and with their hair excessively anointed with scented coconut oil, scarlet hibiscus flowers behind their ears, and necklaces of sweet-smelling pieces of pandanus drupes. McBride, Mrs. McBride, and I received them the moment they stepped out of the boats, and then Ludwig Wolfen, who was disposed in the background with an accordion, and seated on a gin case, played the Star-Spangled Banner 
to the accompaniment of several native drums beaten by his wife and her sister and brothers. Then my boatman, a stalwart Maori half-caste, advanced from out the thronging crowd of natives which surrounded us, and planted in the sand a British red ensign attached to a tall bamboo pole, and called for three cheers for the Queen of England, and three for the President of the United States. This at once gave offence to Ludwig Wolfen, who asked what was the matter with the Emperor of Germany, whereupon Bill Gray, the Maori, took off his coat and asked him what he meant, and a fierce encounter was only avoided by half a dozen strapping natives seizing Billy and making him sit down on the sand, while the wrathful Ludwig was hustled by Donald McBride and Mrs. Ludwig, and threatened with a hammering if he insulted the gathering by his ill-timed and injudicious remarks about a foreign potentate. Ludwig, I regret to say, had begun his Christmas on the previous evening. But we were all too merry, and too filled with right good down companionship, to let such a trifle as this disturb the harmony of our first Christmas foregathering. And presently Bill Gray, his dark, handsome face wreathed in a sunny smile, came up to the sulky and rightly indignant trader with outstretched hand, and said he was sorry. And Wolfen, good-hearted German that he was, grasped it warmly, and said he was sorry too. And then we all trooped up to the house and sat down, only to rise up again with our glasses clinking together, as we drank to our wives and ourselves and the coming Christmas and to the brown smiling faces of the people around us, who wondered why we grew merry so suddenly. For sometimes, as they knew, we had all quarrelled with one another, and bitter words had passed. For so it ever is, and ever shall be, even in the far south seas, when questions of trade and money come between good fellowship and old-time camaraderie. And then, sweet, dark-eyed Sarah, McBride's young wife, took up her guitar and sang us love-songs in the old Lusitanian tongue of her father. And Tom Devine, the ex-boat steerer, and Charlie Dubuis, the reckless, and Peter Huysmans, the red-faced, white-haired old Dutchman, all joined hands and danced around the rough table, while Billy Gray and Ludwig Wolfen stood on the top of it and sang, or tried to sing, Home Sweet Home. And the writer of this memory of those old Pacific days sat in a chair in a doorway and wondered where we should all be the next year. For as we sang and danced and the twang-twang of Sarah's guitar sounded through the silent night without, Tom Devine, the American, held up his hand to McBride and silence fell. Boys, he said, let us drink to the memory of the far-off faces of those dear ones whom we never may see again. He paused a moment, and then caught sight of Sarah as she bent over her guitar with downcast eyes. And to those who are with us now, our wives and our children and our friends, drink, my boys, and the first man who, either to-night or to-morrow, talks about business and dirty, filthy dollars, shall get fired out right away before he knows where he is, for this is Christmas time, and Sarah McBride, why the devil don't you play something and keep me from making a fool of myself? So Sarah, with a twist of her lithe body and a merry gleam in her full big eyes, sang another song, and then long bony McBride came over to her and kissed her on her fair, smooth forehead, whispered something that we did not hear, and pointed to Charlie de Bouy, who stood, glass in hand, at the farthest corner of the big room, his thin, sun-tanned face as grave and sober as that of an English judge. Gentlemen, then sotto voce to the chairman in the doorway, just fancy us South Sea loafers calling ourselves gentlemen. Gentlemen, we are here to spend a good time, and I move that we quit speech-making and start the women on that cake. Tom Devine and myself are, as you know, 
members of two of the first families in America, and only came to the South Seas to wear out our old clothes. Oh, shut up, said the vine. We don't want to hear anything about the first American families. This is an English Christmas, with full-blooded South Sea trimmings. Off you go, you women, and start on the cake. So Charlie Dubuis shut up, and then the women, headed by Sarah and Mary Devine, trooped off to the cookhouse to beat up eggs for the cake, and left us to ourselves. When it drew near midnight they returned, and Peter Huysman arose, and twisting his grizzled moustaches, said, "'Mine boys, will you let me tell you dot now is coming der morn when Jesus Christ was born? And will you please, Mary Devine, tell those natives outside to stop those damned drums while I speaks. And come here, you, McBride, mit your red head, and you, Ludwig Wolfen, and you, Tom Devine, and you, Charlie de Bui, you wicked damned devil, and you, Tom Dennison, you saucy Australian boy, mit your curled moustache and your svelte vile tucked suit, and let us join our hands together and agree to have no more quarrelings and no more angry boats for why should we quarrel as our good friends say over dirty dollars when there is room enough for us all in this lagoon to get a decent livings and then we should try and remember dot we none of us is going to live for ever and when we is dead we is dead a damned long time but now mine friends i will say no more for i am dry so here's to all our good healths and let us promise one another not to have no more angry votes. And so we all gathered around the big table, and, grasping each other's hands, raised our glasses and drank together without speaking, for there was something, we knew not what, that lay behind Dutch Peter's little speech, which made us think. Presently, when a big and gaudy German-made cuckoo clock in the room struck twelve, even reckless Charlie de Bui forgot his old joke about Tom Dennison's damned old squawking British duck, as he called the little painted bird, and we all went outside and sat smoking our pipes on the wide veranda, and watching the flashing torchlights of the fishing canoes as they paddled slowly to and fro over the smooth waters of the sleeping lagoon. Then, almost ere we knew it, the quick red sun had turned the long black line of palms on Caroline to purple, and then to shining green, and Christmas Day had come. Tonight, as a chill December wind wails through the leafless elms and chestnuts of this quiet Kentish village, I think of that far away Christmas Eve, and the rough, honest, sun-browned faces of the men who were around me, and pressed my hand when Peter Huysman spoke of home and Christmas, and Tom Devine of the dear faces whom we never might see again. For only one with the writer is left. McBride and his gentle, sweet-voiced Sarah went to their death a year or two later in The Savage and Murderous Solomons. Wolfen and his wife and children perished at sea when the Sadie Foster schooner turned turtle off the marshals, and Devine and Charlie de Bui, comrades to the last, sailed away to the Moluccas in a ten-ton boat and were never heard of again. Their fate is one of the many mysteries of the deep. Peter Huysman's is alive and well, and only a year ago I grasped his now trembling hand in mighty London and spoke of our meeting on Millie Lagoon and then again, in a garish and tinseled city bar, we raised our glasses and drank to the memory of those who had gone before. End of A Christmas Eve in the Far South Seas by Lewis Beck Read by David Wales A Christmas Fairy by John Strange Winter Read in English this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Christmas Fairy It was getting very near to Christmas time, and all the boys at Miss Ware's school were talking about going home for the holidays. 
i shall go to the christmas festival said bertie fellows and my mother will have a party and my aunt will give another oh i shall have a splendid time at home my uncle bob is going to give me a pair of skates remarked harry wadham my father is going to give me a bicycle put in george alderson will you bring it back to school with you asked harry oh yes if miss ware doesn't say no well tom cried bertie where are you going to spend your holidays i am going to stay here answered tom in a very forlorn voice here at school oh dear why can't you go home i can't go home to india answered tom nobody said you could but haven't you any relatives anywhere tom shook his head only in india he said sadly poor fellow that's hard luck for you i'll tell you what it is boys if i couldn't go home for the holidays especially at christmas i think i would just sit down and die oh no you wouldn't said tom you would get ever so homesick but you wouldn't die you would just get through somehow and hope something would happen before next year or that some kind of fairy would there are no fairies nowadays said bertie see here tom i'll write and ask my mother to invite you to go home with me for the holidays will you really yes i will and if she says yes we shall have such a splendid time we live in london you know and have lots of parties and fun perhaps she will say no suggested poor little tom my mother isn't the kind that says no bertie declared loudly in a few days time a letter arrived from bertie's mother the boy opened it eagerly it said my own dear bertie i am very sorry to tell you that little alice is ill with scarlet fever and so you cannot come for your holidays i would have been glad to have you bring your little friend with you if all had been well here your father and i have decided that the best thing that you can do is to stay at miss ware's we shall send your christmas to you as well as we can it will not be like coming home but i am sure you will try to be happy and make me feel that you are helping me in this sad time dear little alice is very ill very ill indeed tell tom that i am sending you a box for both of you with two of everything and tell him that it makes me so much happier to know that you will not be alone your own mother when bertie fellows received this letter which ended all his christmas hopes and joys he hid his face upon his desk and sobbed aloud the lonely boy from india who sat next to him tried to comfort his friend in every way he could think of he patted his shoulder and whispered many kind words to him at last bertie put the letter into tom's hands read it he sobbed so then tom understood the cause of bertie's grief don't fret over it he said at last it might be worse why your father and mother might be thousands of miles away like mine are when alice is better you will be able to go home and it will help your mother if she thinks you are almost as happy as if you could go now soon miss ware came to tell bertie how sorry she was for him after all she said smiling down on the two boys it is an ill wind that blows nobody good poor tom has been expecting to spend his holidays alone and now he will have a friend with him try to look on the bright side bertie and to remember how much worse it would have been if there had been no boy to stay with you i can't help being disappointed miss ware said bertie his eyes filling with tears no you would be a strange boy if you were not but i want you to try to think of your poor mother and write her as cheerfully as you can yes answered bertie but his heart was too full to say more the last day of the term came and one by one or two by two the boys went away until only bertie and tom were left in the great house it had never seemed so large to either of them before it's miserable groaned poor bertie as they strolled into the schoolroom just think if we were on our way home now how different just think if i had been left here by myself said tom yes said bertie but you know when one wants to go home he never thinks of the boys that have no home to go to the evening passed and the two boys went to bed they told stories to each other for a long time before they could go to sleep that night they dreamed of their homes and felt very lonely yet each tried to be brave and so another day began this was the day before christmas quite early in the morning came the great box of which bertie's mother had spoken in her letter then just as dinner had come to an end there was a peal at the bell and a voice was heard asking for tom egerton tom sprang to his feet and flew to greet a tall handsome lady crying aunt laura aunt laura 
and Laura explained that she and her husband had arrived in London only the day before. I was so afraid, Tom, she said, that we should not get here until Christmas Day was over and that you would be disappointed, so I would not let your mother write you that we were on our way home. You must get your things packed up at once and go back with me to London. Then Uncle and I will give you a splendid time. For a minute or two, Tom's face shone with delight. Then he caught sight of Bertie and turned to his aunt. Dear Aunt Laura, he said, I am very sorry, but I can't go. Can't go? And why not? Because I can't go and leave Bertie here all alone, he said stoutly. When I was going to be alone, he wrote and asked his mother to let me go home with him. She could not have either of us because Bertie's sister has scarlet fever. He has to stay here, and he has never been away from home at Christmas time before, and I can't go away and leave him by myself, Aunt Laura. For a minute, Aunt Laura looked at the boy as if she could not believe him. Then she caught him in her arms and kissed him. You dear little boy, you shall not leave him. You shall bring him along, and we shall all enjoy ourselves together. Bertie, my boy, you are not very old yet, but I am going to teach you a lesson as well as I can. It is that kindness is never wasted in this world. And so Bertie and Tom found that there was such a thing as a fairy after all. End of A Christmas Fairy by John Strange Winter Read by Ginger Kukula Christmas in a Dugout From Tales from a Dugout by Arthur Guy MP Read in English This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Christmas in a Dugout As told by a Yank while on a working party to a squad of Royal Engineers in their dugout. You say you fellows have just come out and want to know how I enjoyed last Christmas. Well, I'll tell you the circumstances and let you judge for yourself about the enjoyment part of it. I guess nearly all of you met our guns crew at that show we gave at S, so it will be unnecessary to introduce them. As well as I remember, this is what happened. It was Christmas Eve and cold. Not the kind of cold which sends the red blood tingling through your veins and makes you want to be up and at em, but that miserable, damp kind, that eats into the marrow of your bones, attacking you from the rear, and sending cold shivers up and down your spinal column. It gives you a feeling of dread and loneliness. The three of us, Curly, Happy and myself, were standing at the corner of Yankee Avenue and Yiddish Street, waiting for the word STAND TO, upon which we were to mount our machine gun on the parapet, and go on watch for two hours, with our heads sticking over the top. Yankee Avenue was the name of the fire trench, while Yiddish Street was the communication trench leading to the rear. You see, we were occupying Y sector of the front line of our brigade. The trench was muddy, and in some places a thin crust of ice was beginning to form around the edges of the puddles. We had wrapped our feet and legs with empty sandbags, and looked like snow shovelers on Fifth Avenue. My teeth were chattering with the cold. Happy was slapping his hands on his thighs, while Curly had unbuttoned one of the buttons on his overcoat, and with his left hand was desperately trying to reach under his right armpit. No doubt a cootie had gone marketing for its Christmas dinner. Then came the unwelcome stand to, and it was up on the fire step for us, to get our gun mounted. This took about five minutes. Curly, while working away, was muttering, Blimey! Christmas Eve, and here I am somewheres in France, half starved with the cold. Happy was humming, keep the home fires burning. Right then, any kind of a home fire would have been very welcome. It was black as pitch in no man's land. Curly stopped muttering to himself, and Happy's humming ceased. There was serious work in front of us. For two hours we had to penetrate that blackness with our straining eyes to see that Fritz did not surprise us with some German culter Christmas stunt. Suddenly Happy, who was standing on the fire step next to me, gripped my arm and in a low excited whisper asked, Did you see that out in front, Yank? A little to the right of that black patch in the barbed wire. Turning my eyes in the direction indicated, with my heart pounding against my ribs, I waited for something to develop. Sure enough, I could make out a slight movement. Happy must have seen it at the same time, because he carefully eased his rifle over the top 
ready for instant use. My rifle was already in position. Curly was fumbling with the flare pistol. Suddenly a loud plop as he pulled the trigger, and a red streak shot up into the air as the star shell described an arc out in front. It hit the ground and burst, throwing out a white ghostly light. A frightened meow and a cat, with speed clutch open, darted from the wire in front of us, jumped over our gun, and disappeared into the blackness of the trench. Curly ducked his head, and Happy let out a weak, squeaky laugh. I was frozen stiff with fear. Pretty soon the pump action of my heart was resumed, and once more I looked out into no man's land. For the remainder of our two hours on guard, nothing happened. Then we turned over to the second relief, and, half-frozen, waded through the icy mud to the entrance of our dugout. From the depths of the earth came the notes of a harmonica playing, pack up your troubles in your old kit bag, and smile, smile, smile. Stumbling down the muddy steps, we entered the dugout. This was a regular dugout, not like the two-by-four one we generally had wished on us. Eight boys of our machine-gun section, sitting on their packs, had formed a circle around a wooden box. In an old ammunition tin, six candles were burning. I inwardly shuddered at this extravagance, but suddenly remembered that it was Christmas Eve. Sailor Bill was making cocoa over the flames of a Tommy cooker, while Ikey was toasting bread in front of a fire bucket, the fumes from which nearly choked us. As soon as we made our appearance in the dugout, the circle stood up, and, as is usual with you English, unselfishly made room for us to get around the fire bucket to thaw out our stiffened joints. In about twenty minutes or so, the cold of the trench was forgotten, and we joined in the merriment. The musician put his harmonica away, which action was greatly appreciated by the rest of us. It was Ikey. Bursting with importance, Sailor Bill addressed us. Gentlemen, it is now time for the ship's company to report progress as to what they have done for the Christmas feed, which is to be held tomorrow at eight bells. Yank, let's hear yours. I reported one dozen eggs, two bottles of white wine, one bottle of red wine, eight packets of gold flake fags, and one quart bottle of champagne, which had cost me five francs, my last and lonely note on the Banque de France, at a French estaminet. This report was received with a cheer. Ikey was next in order. He proudly stated that he had saved his rum ration for the last eleven days, and consequently was able to donate to the feast his water bottle, three-fourths full of rum. We knew he had swiped the rum, but said nothing, because this would help out in making brandy sauce for the plum pudding. Sailor Bill informed us that he had a fruit cake, a bottle of pickled walnuts, and two tins of deviled ham, which had been sent out to him from London. Each man had something to report. I carefully made a list of the articles opposite the name of the person donating them, and turned the list over to Bill, who was to act as cook on the following day. Just then Lance Corporal Hall came into the dugout, and, warming his hands over the fire bucket, said, "'If you blokes want to hear something that will take you home to Blighty, come up into the fire trench a minute.' None of us moved. That fire bucket was too comfortable. After much coaxing, Sailor Bill, Ikey and myself followed Hall out of the dugout up into the fire trench. A dead silence reigned, and we started to return. Hall blocked our way and whispered, "'Just a minute, boys, and listen.' Pretty soon, from the darkness out in front, we heard the strains of a cornet playing, It's a long, long trail we're winding. We stood entranced till the last note died out. After about a four or five minute wait, the strains were repeated, and then silence. I felt lonely and homesick. Out of the fire bay on our left, a Welsh voice started singing the song. The German cornet player must have heard it, because he picked up the tune and accompanied the singer on his cornet. I had never heard anything so beautiful in my life before. The music from the German trench suddenly ceased, and in the air overhead came the sharp crack-crack of machine-gun bullets as some Bosch gunner butted in on our concert. We ducked and returned to our dugout. The men were all tired out, and soon rasping snores could be heard from under the cover of blankets and overcoats. The next day was Christmas, and we eagerly awaited the mail, which was to be brought up by the ration party at noon. Not a shot or shell had been fired all morning. The sun had come out, and although the trenches were slippery with mud, still it was warm, and we felt the Christmas spirit running through our veins. We all turned in and cleaned up the dugout. Making reflectors out of ammunition tins, sticking them into the walls of the dugout, 
we placed a lighted candle in each. Sailor Bill was hustling about, preparing the Christmas spread. He placed a waterproof sheet on the floor, and adding three blankets, spread another waterproof over the top for a tablecloth, and arranged the men's packs around the edge for chairs. Presently the welcome voice of our sergeant came from the entrance of the dugout. "'Come on, me lads, lend a hand with the post.' There was a mad rush for the entrance. In a couple of minutes or so the boys returned, staggering under a load of parcels. As each name was read off, a parcel was thrown over to the expectant Tommy. My heart was beating with eagerness as the sergeant picked up each parcel, then a pang of disappointment as the name was read off. Each of the others received from one to four parcels. There were none left. I could feel their eyes sympathising with me. Sailor Bill whispered something to the sergeant that I could not get. The sergeant turned to me and said, "'Why, blimey, Yank, I must be going balmy. I left your parcel up in the trench. I'll be right back.' He returned in a few minutes, with a large parcel addressed to me. I eagerly took the parcel and looked for the postmark. It was from London. Another pang of disappointment passed through me. I knew no one in London. My mail had to come from America. Then it all flashed over me in an instant. About two weeks before I had noticed a collection being taken up in the section, and at the time thought it very strange that I was not asked to donate. The boys had all chipped in to make sure that I would not be forgotten on Christmas. They eagerly crowded around me as I opened the parcel. It contained nearly everything under the sun, including some American cigarettes. Tears of gratitude came to my eyes, but some way or other I managed not to betray myself. Those Tommies certainly were tickled at my exclamations of delight as I removed each article. Out of the corner of my eye I could see them nudging each other. A man named Smith in our section had been detailed as runner to our captain, and was not present at the distribution of the mail. Three parcels and five letters were placed on his pack, so he would receive them on his return to the dugout. In about ten minutes a man came from the trench, loaded down with small oblong boxes. Each Tommy, including myself, received one. They were presents from the Queen of England, and each box contained a small plum pudding, cigarettes, a couple of cigars, matches and chocolate. Every soldier of the British Army in the trenches received one of those boxes on Christmas Day, as most of you know. At last Sailor Bill announced that Christmas dinner was ready, and we each lost no time in getting to our respective packs, sitting around in a circle. Smith was the only absentee, and his parcels and letters, still unopened, were on his pack. He was now a half-hour overdue. Sailor Bill, noting our eagerness to begin, held up his hand and said, "'Now, boys, we're all shipmates together. Don't you think it would be better to wait a few minutes more for Smith?' We all assented, but, soldier-like, cussed him for his delay. Ten minutes passed, fifteen, then twenty. All eyes were turned in Sailor Bill's direction. He answered our looks with, "'Go to it, boys. We can't wait for Smith. I don't know what's keeping him, but you know his name is in orders for leave.' and perhaps he is so tickled that he is going to see his wife and three little nippers in Blighty that he's lost his bearings and has run aground. We started in and waxed merry for a few minutes. Then there'd be an uncomfortable pause, and all eyes would turn in the direction of the vacant place. Uneasiness prevailed. Suddenly, the entrance to the dugout was darkened, and a form came stumbling down. With one accord we all shouted, "'Come on, Smith, you're missing one of the best Christmas dinners of your life.' Our sergeant entered the dugout. One look at his face was enough. We knew he was the bearer of ill tidings. With tears in his eyes and a catch in his voice, he asked, "'Which is Smith's pack?' We all solemnly nodded our heads in the direction of the vacant place. Without a word, the sergeant picked up the letters, parcels and pack, and started to leave the dugout. Sailor Bill could stand it no longer, and just as the sergeant was about to leave, he asked, "'Out with it, sergeant. What's happened?' The sergeant turned around, and, in a choking voice, said, "'Boys, Smith's gone west. Some bloody German sniper got him through the napper as he was passing that bashed-in part in Yiddish Street.' Sailor Bill ejaculated, "'Poor old Smith, gone west.' Then he paused and sobbed out, "'My God!' Think of his wife and three little nippers waiting in Blighty for him to come home for the Christmas holidays. I believe that right at that moment a solid vow of vengeance registered itself in every heart around that festive circle. 
The next day we buried poor Smith in a little cemetery behind the lines. While standing around his grave, our artillery suddenly opened up with an intense bombardment on the German lines, and, as every shell passed screaming overhead, we sent a prayer of vengeance with it. As the grave was filled in, I imagined a huge rainbow embracing the graves in that cemetery, on which in letters of fire was written sarcastically in German, Peace on earth, good will toward men. But such is war. So, boys, that was my last Christmas. Where I'll be next Christmas, God only knows. Next day my mail came in from America, and didn't cheer me much, because I was thinking of Smith's wife and nippers. So long, boys. I've got to go. End of Christmas in a Dugout by Arthur Guy M.P. Read by Lucy Perry in Bath on November 10th, 2011. Christmas in India by Rudyard Kipling. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Christmas in India by Rudyard Kipling. Dim dawn the tamarisks. The sky is saffron yellow as the women in the village grind the corn, and the parrots seek the riverside each calling to his fellow that the day the staring eastern day is born oh the white dust of the highway oh the stenches in the byway oh the clammy fog that hovers over earth and at home they're making merry neat the white and scarlet berry what part have india's exiles in their mirth full day behind the tamarisks the sky is blue and staring as the cattle crawl afield beneath the yoke and they bear one o'er the field path who is past all hope or caring to the gap below the curling wreaths of smoke call on rama going slowly as ye bear a brother lowly call on rama he may hear perhaps your voice with our hymn books and our psalters we appeal to other altars and to-day we bid good christian men rejoice high noon above the tamarisks the sun is hot above us as at home the christmas day is breaking wan they will drink our healths at dinner those who tell us how they love us and forget us till another year be gone oh the toil that knows no breaking oh the haima ceaseless aching oh the black dividing sea and alien plain youth was cheap wherefore we sold it gold was good we hoped to hold it and to-day we know the fullness of our gain Grey dusk behind the tamarisks, the parrots fly together, as the sun is sinking slowly over home. And his last ray seems to mock us, shackled in a lifelong tether, that drags us back, however so far we roam. Hard her service, poor her payment, she in ancient, tattered raiment. India, she the grim, stepmother of our kind. If a year of life be lent her, if her temple's shrine we enter, the door is shut, we may not look behind. Black night behind the tamarisks, the owls begin their chorus, as the conks from the temple scream and bray. With the fruitless years behind us, and the hopeless years before us, let us honor, O oh my brothers, Christmas Day. Call a truce then to our labors, let us feast with friends and neighbors, and be merry as the custom of our caste. For if faint and forced the laughter, and if sadness follow after, we are richer by one mocking Christmas past. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Christmas in the Olden Time by Sir Walter Scott Read in English This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The damsel donned her kirtle sheen, the hall was dressed with holly green. Forth to the wood did merry men go, to gather in the mistletoe. Then opened wide the baron's hall, to vassal, tenant, serf and all. Power laid his rod of rule aside, and ceremony doffed his pride. The heir, with roses in his shoes, that night might village partner choose. 
the lord under a gating share the vulgar game of post and pair all hailed with uncontrolled delight and general voice the happy night that to the cottage as the crown brought tidings of salvation down the fire with well-dried logs supplied went roaring up the chimney wide the huge hall table's oaken face scrubbed till it shone the day to grace bore then upon its massive board no mark to part the squire and lord then was brought in the lusty brawn by an old blue-coated serving-man then the grim boar's head frowned on high crested with bay and rosemary well can the green-garbed ranger tell how when and where the monster fell what dogs before his death he tore and all the baiting of the boar the wassail round in good brown bowls garnished with ribbon blithely trolls there the huge sirloin reeked hard by plum porridge stood and christmas pie nor failed old scotland to produce at such high tide her savoury goose then came the merry maskers in and carols roared with blithesome din if unmelodious was the song it was a hearty note and strong who lists may in their mumming see traces of ancient mystery while shirts supplied the masquerade and smutted cheeks the visors made but oh what maskers richly dight can boast of bosoms half so light england was merry england when old christmas brought his sports again twas christmas broached the mightiest ale twas christmas told the merriest tale a christmas gamble oft would cheer the poor man's heart through half the year end of christmas in the olden time by sir walter scott read by lucy perry in bath on november sixth two thousand and eleven Christmas Scene at Camelot from Sir Gawain and the Green Knight by the anonymous Pearl Poet Read in Middle English This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org This king lie at Camelot upon Christmas with mony luflich lord ladies of the best reckonly of the runde table alle the rich brother with rich revel or richt and rechless mirthes there turnied dulcus bitimus full mony justed full jollily these gentil knichtes seethen kyred to the court carols to mac for there the fest was silige full fifteen dies with all the met and the mirth that men cousa vise such glaum and glee glorious to hear der din upon die dancing on nichtes all was hap upon high in halles and chambres with lordes and ladies as levest him thought with all the well of the world thy wonned there salmon the most keed knichtes under christe selven and the lovelockest ladies that ever leaf hadden and he the cumlockest king that the court haldes for all was this firefolk in her first age on sill the happnest under heaven king heest man of will it were no great near to neven so hardy a hair on hill will no year was so yep that it was no a common that die double on the des was the doth served for the king was common with knichts into the hall the chantry of the chapel chaved to an end lewd cria was their cast of clerkes and other no well knighted or newe neven at full oft and seethen reach a forth run and to wretch hondesel yea at yeres yiftes on he yeldem behont debated busily about the giftes ladies lachet for lewd doch thy lost hadden and he that one was not wroth that my ye well trowe 
all this mirsta thy maden to the met team when thy had washen worthily thy went to set the best born eye above as it best seemed when gwenor full guy grised in the midis dressed on the dear days dubbed all about small sendal besides a cellure her or of triet to los of tars tapitus inoch that were embrowded and beaten with the best gems that misht be preved of priests with pennies to be in die the cumlocust to discree there glent with eon gry a same locker that e'er he see so mocht no man say but arthur would not eat till all were served he was so jolly of his joyfness and somewhat chilled gared his leaf licked him licht he loved the lass other to lenge lee or to longe sit so busy at him his young blood and his brine wild and also another manner mevet him eck that he thurg nobelai had nomen o wald never eat upon such a dare die ere him devised were of some aventurous thing and uncouth a tal of some mine mervail that he might trow of alderes of armes of other aventurous other some sech him besocht of some sicker knicht to join with him in justing in jopardy to lie led a leaf for leaf leve uch on other as fortune would fulsen him the firer to have this was the king's countenance where he in court were at which far and fest among his frae men in hall therefore of bas so fair he stichtless stiff in stall full yep in that new year much mirth he mas with all thus there stond us in stall the stiff king his selven talkent before the he table of trifles full hend there go the gawan was grised gwenor besid and agravain a la dure mine on that other seed sittes both the king's sister sonnes and full sicker knichtes bishop bowdoin above beginnes the table and iwan urien's son ette with himselven these were dicht on the days and dare wordly served and season money sicker sedge at the seed borders then the fierce course come with cracking of trumpets with money banner full bricht that there be hanged no lacry noise with the noble peepus wield a werbless and wicht wakned lot that money hurtful he hef at her touches dainties driven therewith of full dare metes foison of the fresh and on so fail a dishes that pin to find the place the peple before for to set the silvener that ser seus halden on close each laid as he loved himself there lacht without an loth i two had dishes twelve god bear and bricht wien both end of christmas scene at camelot from sir gawain and the green knight by the anonymous pearl poet read by martin geeson Christmas time by John Clare. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
glad Christmas comes, and every hearth makes room to give him welcome now, e'en want will dry its tears in mirth and crown him with a holly bough. Though tramping neath a winter sky o'er snowy paths and rimy styles, the housewife sets her spinning by to bid him welcome with her smiles. Each house is swept the day before, and windows stuck with evergreens. The snow is besomed from the door, and comfort crowns the cottage scenes. Gilt holly with its thorny pricks, and yew and box with berries small, these deck the unused candlesticks and pictures hanging by the wall. Neighbours resume their annual cheer, wishing with smiles and spirits high, glad Christmas and a happy year to every morning passer-by. Milkmaids their Christmas journeys go, accompanied by a favoured swain, and children pace the crumpling snow to taste their granny's cake again. The shepherd, now no more afraid, since custom doth the chance bestow, starts up to kiss the giggling maid beneath the branch of mistletoe that neath each cottage beam is seen, with pearl-like berries shining gay. The shadow still of what hath been, which fashion yearly fades away. The singing waits, a merry throng, at early morn with simple skill, yet imitate the angel's song, and chaunt their Christmas ditty still. And mid the storm that dies and swells by fits, in hummings softly steals the music of the village bells, ringing around their merry peals. When this is past, a merry crew, bedecked in masks and ribbons gay, the Morris dance their sports renew, and act their winter evening play. The clown turned king for penny praise storms with the actors strut and swell, and Harlequin, a laugh to raise, wears his hunchback and tinkling bell. And oft for pence and spicy ale, with winter nosegays pinned before, the wassail singer tells her tale and draws her Christmas carols o'er, while Prentice Boy, with ruddy face and rhyme bepowdered dancing locks, from door to door with happy face, runs round to claim his Christmas box. The block upon the fire is put to sanction custom's old desires, and many a faggot's bands are cut for the old farmer's Christmas fires, where loud-tongued gladness joins the throng, and winter meets the warmth of May, till, feeling soon the heat too strong, he rubs his shins and draws away. While snows the window panes bedim, the fire curls up a sunny charm, where, creaming o'er the pitcher's rim, the flowering ale is set to warm. Mirth, full of joy as summer bees, sits there its pleasures to impart, and children, tween their parents' knees, sing scraps of carols off by heart, and some, to view the winter weathers, climb up the window seat with glee likening the snow to falling feathers in fancy's infant ecstasy, laughing with superstitious love o'er visions wild that youth supplies, of people pulling geese above and keeping Christmas in the skies. As though the homestead trees were dressed in lieu of snow with dancing leaves, as though the sun-dried martin's nest instead of icicles hung the eaves, the children hail the happy day, as if the snow were April's grass, and pleased, as neath the warmth of May, sport o'er the water froze to glass. Thou day of happy sound and mirth, that long with childish memory stays, how blessed around the cottage hearth I met thee in my younger days! Harping with rapture's dreaming joys on presents which thy coming found, the welcome sight of little toys, the Christmas gift of cousins round. About the glowing hearth at night, the harmless laugh and winter tale go round, while parting friends delight to toast each other o'er their ale. 
the cotter oft with quiet zeal will musing o'er his bible lean while in the dark the lovers steal to kiss and toy behind the screen old customs oh i love the sound however simple they may be whate'er with time hath sanction found is welcome and is dear to me pride grows above simplicity and spurns them from her haughty mind and soon the poet's song will be the only refuge they can find end of christmas time by john clare read by ruth golding christmas 2011「Guy de Maupassant」read in French. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Herman Roskamps. Le docteur bon enfant cherchait dans sa mémoire, répétant à mi-voix, « Un souvenir de Noël. » Un souvenir de Noël Et tout à coup, il s'écria, « Mais si J'en ai un, et un bien étrange encore. » C'est une histoire fantastique. J'ai vu un miracle, oui, mesdames, un miracle, la nuit de Noël. Cela vous étonne de m'entendre parler ainsi, moi qui ne crois guère à rien. Et pourtant, j'ai vu un miracle. Je l'ai vu, dis-je, vu de mes propres yeux, vu, ce qui s'appelle vu. En ai-je été fort surpris Non pas, car si je ne crois point à vos croyances, je crois à la foi, et je sais qu'elle transporte les montagnes. Je pourrais citer bien des exemples, mais je vous indignerais, et je m'exposerais aussi à amoindrir les faits de mon histoire. Je vous avouerai d'abord que, si je n'ai pas été convaincu et converti par ce que j'ai vu, j'ai été du moins fort ému, et je vais tâcher de vous dire la chose naïvement, comme si j'avais une crédulité d'Auvergnat. J'étais alors médecin de campagne, habitant le bourg de Rolleville, en pleine Normandie. L'hiver, cette année-là, fut terrible Dès la fin de novembre, les neiges arrivèrent après une semaine de gelée. On voyait de loin les gros nuages venir du nord, et la blanche descente des flocons commença. En une nuit, toute la plaine fut ensevelie. Les fermes, isolées dans leurs cours carrés, derrière leurs rideaux de grands arbres poudrés de frima, semblaient s'endormir sous l'accumulation de cette mousse, épaisse et légère. Aucun bruit ne traversait plus la campagne immobile. Seuls les corbeaux, par bandes, décrivaient de longs festons dans le ciel, cherchant leur vie inutilement, s'abattant tous ensemble sur les champs livides et piquant la neige de leurs grands becs. On n'entendait rien que le glissement vague et contenu de cette poussière gelée tombant toujours. Cela dura huit jours pleins, puis l'avalanche s'arrêta. La terre avait sur le dos un manteau épais de cinq pieds. Et pendant trois semaines ensuite, un ciel, clair comme un cristal bleu le jour, et la nuit tout semé d'étoiles qu'on aurait cru de givre, tant le vaste espace était rigoureux, s'étendit sur la nappe unie, dure et luisante des neiges. La plaine, les haies, les ormes des clôtures, tout semblait mort, tué par le froid. Ni homme, ni bête ne sortait plus. Seules les cheminées des chaumières en chemise blanche révélaient la vie cachée par les minces filets de fumée qui montaient droit dans l'air glacial. De temps en temps, on entendait craquer les arbres, comme si leurs membres de bois se furent brisés sous l'écorce, et parfois, une grosse branche se détachait et tombait, l'invincible gelée pétrifiant la sève et cassant les fibres. Les habitations se messaient là par les champs, 
semblaient éloignées de cent lieues les unes des autres. On vivait comme on pouvait. Seul, j'essayais d'aller voir mes clients les plus proches, m'exposant sans cesse à rester enseveli dans quelque creux. Je m'aperçus bientôt qu'une terreur mystérieuse planait sur le pays. Un tel fléau, pensait-on, n'était point naturel. On prétendit qu'on entendait des voix la nuit, des sifflements aigus, des cris qui passaient. Ces cris et ces sifflements venaient sans aucun doute des oiseaux émigrants qui voyagent au crépuscule et qui fuyaient en masse vers le sud. Mais allons donc faire entendre raison à des gens affolés. Une épouvante envahissait les esprits et on s'attendait à un événement extraordinaire. La forge du père Vatinel était située au bout du hameau des Pivans, sur la grande route, maintenant invisible et déserte. Or, comme les gens manquaient de pain, le forgeron résolut d'aller jusqu'au village. Il resta quelques heures à causer dans les six maisons qui forment le centre du pays, prit son pain et des nouvelles, et un peu de cette peur répandue sur la campagne. Et il se remit en route avant la nuit. Tout à coup, en longeant une haie, il crut voir un œuf sur la neige. Oui, un œuf, déposé là, tout blanc, comme le reste du monde. Il se pencha. C'était un œuf, en effet. D'où venait-il quelle poule avait pu sortir du poulailler et venir pondre à cet endroit Le forgeron s'étonna, ne comprit pas, mais il ramassa l'œuf et le porta à sa femme. « Tiens, la maîtresse, voilà un œuf que j'ai trouvé sur la route. » La femme mocha la tête. « Un œuf sur la route, par ces temps-ci, t'es sous, bien sûr. »« Mais non, mal la maîtresse, même qu'il est tout au pied du nez. » Et encore chaud, pas gelé. Le voilà. Je me suis mis sur l'estomac pour qu'il ne le refroidisse pas. Tu le remangeras pour ton dîner. L'œuf fut laissé dans la marmite où mijotait la soupe, et le forgeron se mit à raconter ce qu'on disait par la contrée. La femme écoutait, toute pâle. Pour sûr que j'en ai entendu ces sifflets l'autre nuit même s'il semblait venir de la cheminée. On se mit à table. On mangea la soupe d'abord, puis, pendant que le mari étendait du beurre sur son pain, la femme prit l'œuf et l'examina d'un œil méfiant. « S'il y avait quelque chose dans ce œuf, que veux-tu dire qui est ?»« Chéti, mais... »« Allons, mange-le et fais pas la bête !» Elle ouvrit l'œuf. Il était comme tous les œufs, et bien frais. Elle se mit à le manger en hésitant, le goûtant, le laissant, le reprenant. Le mari disait, « Eh bien, qu'est goût qu'il a, cet œuf ?» Elle ne répondait pas, et elle acheva de l'avaler. Puis, soudain, elle planta sur son homme des yeux fixes, hagards, affolés, Leva les bras, les tordit, et, convulsé de la tête aux pieds, roula par terre en poussant des cris horribles. Toute la nuit, elle se débattit en des spasmes épouvantables, secouée de tremblements, effrayants, déformés par de hideuses convulsions. Le forgeron, impuissant à la tenir, fut obligé de la lier, et elle hurlait sans repos d'une voix infatigable. « Je l'ai dans le corps Je l'ai dans le corps !» Je fus appelé le lendemain, j'ordonnai tous les calmants qu'on eût sans obtenir le moindre résultat. Elle était folle. Alors, avec une incroyable rapidité, malgré l'obstacle des hautes neiges, la nouvelle, une nouvelle étrange, courut de ferme en ferme. La femme au forgeron qu'est possédée. Et on venait de partout, sans oser pénétrer dans la maison. On écoutait de loin ces cris affreux, poussés d'une voix si forte qu'on ne les aurait pas crus d'une créature humaine. Le curé du village fut prévenu. C'était un vieux prêtre naïf. Il accourut en surplis, 
comme pour administrer un mourant, et il prononça, en étendant les mains, des formules d'exorcisme, pendant que quatre hommes maintenaient sur un lit la femme écumante et tordue. Mais l'esprit ne fut point chassé, et la Noël arriva sans que le temps eût changé. La veille au matin, le prêtre vint me trouver. « J'ai envie, dit-il, de faire assister à l'office de cette nuit, cette malheureuse. Peut-être Dieu fera-t-il un miracle en sa faveur, à l'heure même où il naquit d'une femme. » Je répondis au curé. « Je vous approuve absolument, monsieur l'abbé. Si elle a l'esprit frappé par la cérémonie sacrée, et rien n'est plus propre puisse à l'émouvoir, elle peut être sauvée sans autre remède. » Le vieux prêtre murmura. « Vous n'êtes pas croyant, docteur, mais aidez-moi, n'est-ce pas Vous vous chargez de l'amener ?» Et je lui promis mon aide. Le soir vint, puis la nuit, et la cloche de l'église se mit à sonner, jetant sa voix plaintive à travers l'espace morne sur l'étendue blanche et glacée des neiges. Des êtres noirs s'en venaient lentement par groupes, dociles aux cris d'airain du clocher. La pleine lune éclairait d'une lueur vive et blafarde tout l'horizon, rendait plus visible la pâle désolation des champs. J'avais pris quatre hommes robustes, et je me rendis à la forge. La possédée hurlait toujours, attachée à sa souche. On l'avait dit proprement, malgré sa résistance éperdue, et on l'emporta. L'église était maintenant pleine de monde, illuminée et froide. Les chantres poussaient leurs notes monotones. Le serpent ronflait, la petite sonnette de l'enfant de cœur tintait, réglant les mouvements des fidèles. J'enfermai la femme et ses gardiens dans la cuisine du presbytère, et j'attendis le moment que je croyais favorable. Je choisis l'instant qui suit la communion. Tous les paysans, hommes et femmes, avaient reçu leur Dieu pour fléchir sa rigueur. Un grand silence planait pendant que le prêtre achevait le mystère divin. Sur mon ordre, la porte fut ouverte et mes quatre aides apportèrent la folle. Dès qu'elle aperçut la lumière, la foule à genoux, le cœur en feu et le tabernacle doré, elle se débattit d'une telle vigueur qu'elle faillit nous échapper, et elle poussa des clameurs si aiguës qu'un frisson d'épouvante passa dans l'église. Toutes les têtes se relevèrent, des gens s'enfuirent. Elle n'avait plus la forme d'une femme, crispée et tordue en nos mains, le visage contourné, les yeux fous. On la traîna jusqu'aux marches du cœur, et puis on la tint fortement accroupie à terre. Le prêtre s'était levé. Il attendait. Dès qu'il la vit arrêtée, il prit en ses mains l'ostensoir sain des rayons d'or, avec l'hostie blanche au milieu, et, s'avançant de quelques pas, il l'éleva de ses deux bras tendus au-dessus de sa tête, le présentant au regard égaré de la démoniaque. Elle hurlait toujours, l'œil fixé, tendu sur cet objet rayonnant, et le prêtre demeurait tellement immobile que l'on aurait pris pour une statue. Et cela dura longtemps, longtemps. La femme semblait saisie de peur, fascinée. Elle contemplait fixement l'ostensoir, secouée encore de tremblements terribles, mais passager, et criant toujours, mais d'une voix main déchirante. Et cela dura encore longtemps. On eût dit qu'elle ne pouvait plus baisser les yeux, qu'ils étaient rivés sur l'hostie, et elle ne faisait plus que gémir, et son corps roidi s'amollissait, ça faisait. Toute la foule était prosternée, le front par terre. La possédée, maintenant, baissait rapidement les paupières, puis les relevait aussitôt, comme impuissante à supporter la vue de son Dieu. Elle s'était tue, et puis soudain, 
je m'aperçus que ses yeux demeuraient clos. Elle dormait du sommeil des somnambules, hypnotisée, pardon, vaincue par la contemplation persistante de l'ostensoir au rayon d'or, terrassée par le Christ victorieux. On l'emporta inerte pendant que le prêtre remontait vers l'autel. L'assistance bouleversée entonna un Tédéum d'action de grâce. Et la femme du forgeron dormit quarante heures de suite, puis se réveilla sans aucun souvenir de la possession ni de la délivrance. « Voilà, mesdames, le miracle que j'ai vu !» Le docteur Bonenfant se tut, puis ajouta d'une voix contrariée, « Je n'ai pu refuser de l'attester par écrit. » End of Conte de Noël by Guy de Maupassant The Cowboy's Christmas Ball by William Lawrence Chittenden, read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. THE COWBOY'S CHRISTMAS BALL TO THE RANCHMAN OF TEXAS Way out in western Texas, where the clear fork's waters flow, where the cattle are a-browsin' and the Spanish ponies grow, where the northers come a-whistlin' from beyond the neutral strip, and the prairie dogs are sneezin' as if they had the grip, where the coyotes come a-howlin' round the ranches after dark, and the mockin'-birds are singin' to the lovely meadow-lark, where the possum and the badger and rattlesnakes abound, and the monstrous stars are winkin' o'er a wilderness profound, where lonesome tawny prairies melt into airy streams, where the double mountains slumber in heavenly kinds of dreams, where the antelope is grazin' and the lonely plovers call, it was there that I attended the cowboy's Christmas ball. The town was Anson City, old Jones's county seat, where they raise polled Angus cattle and waven whiskered wheat, where the air is soft and balmy and dry and full of health, and the prairies is exploding with agricultural wealth, where they print the Texas Western that Heck McCann supplies with news and yarns and stories of most amazing size, where Frank Smith pulls the badger on knowing tender feet, and democracy's triumphant and mighty hard to beat, where lives that good old hunter John Millsap from Lamar, who used to be the sheriff back east in Paris, saw? T'was there I say at Anson, with the lively widder wall, that I went to that reception, the cowboy's Christmas ball. The boys had left the ranches and come to town in piles. The ladies, kind of scatterin', had gathered in for miles, and yet the place was crowded, as I remember well, t'was got for the occasion at the Morning Star Hotel. The music was a fiddle and a lively tambourine, and a viol come imported by the stage from Abilene. The room was togged out gorgeous, with mistletoe and shawls, and candles flickered frescoes around the airy walls. The women folks looked lovely, the boys looked kind of treed, till their leader commenced yelling, "'Whoa, fellas, let's stampede!' And the music started sighing and a-wailing through the hall as a kind of introduction to the cowboy's Christmas ball." The leader was a fellow that came from Swenson's ranch. They called him Windy Billy, from Little Dead Man's Branch. His rig was kind of careless, big spurs and high-heeled boots. He had the reputation that comes when fellers shoots. His voice was like a bugle upon the mountain's height. His feet were animated and a mighty moving sight. When he commenced to holler, "'Now, fellas, stake your pen!' Lock horns to all them heifers, and rustle em like men. Salute your lovely critters, now swing and let em go. Climb the grapevine round em, all hands do si do. You mavericks jine the round-up, just skipper waterfall. Huh, it was gettin' active, the cowboy's Christmas ball. The boys was tolerable skittish, the ladies powerful neat. That old bass vial's music just got there with both feet. That wailing, frisky fiddle I never shall forget, and Windy kept a-singin', I think I hear him yet. 
Oh, exes, chase their squirrels and cut them to one side. Spur Treadwell to the center with cross Pete Charlie's bride. Doc Hollis down the middle and twine the lay's chain. Varn Andrews pen the fillies in Big T Diamond's train. All pull your freight together, meow, swallow, fork, and change. Big Boston lead the trail herd through little pitchfork's range. Purr round your gentle pussies, meow, rope em, balance all. <laughs> it was getting active, the cowboy's Christmas ball. The dust riz fast and furious, we all just galloped round, till the scenery got so giddy that Z-Bar Dick was downed. We buckled to our partners and told them to hold on, then shook our hooves like lightning until the early dawn. Don't tell me about cotillions or Germans, no siree. That whirl at Anson City just takes the cake with me. I'm sick of lazy shufflings, of them I've had my fill. Give me a frontier breakdown, backed up by Windy Bill. McAllister ain't nowhere. When Windy leads the show, I've seen em both in harness, and so I sort of know. Oh, Bill, I shan't forget you, and I'll oftentimes recall that lively gated soiree, the Cowboy's Christmas Ball. End of the Cowboy's Christmas Ball by William Lawrence Chittenden Read by Winston Tharp The Golden Cobwebs by Robert Haven Schaffler, read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Golden Cobwebs, a tale for small children. I am going to tell you a story about something wonderful that happened to a Christmas tree like this, ever and ever so long ago, when it was once upon a time. It was before Christmas, and the tree was all trimmed with popcorn and silver nuts, and named the trimmings of the tree before you, and stood safely out of sight in a room where the doors were locked, so that the children should not see it before it was time. But ever so many other little house-people had seen it. The big black pussy saw it with her great green eyes. The little grey kitty saw it with her little blue eyes. The kind house-dog saw it with his steady brown eyes. The yellow canary saw it with his wise bright eyes. Even the wee, wee mice that were so afraid of the cat had peeped one peek when no one was by. But there was someone who hadn't seen the Christmas tree. It was the little grey spider. You see, the spiders lived in the corners, the warm corners of the sunny attic and the dark corners of the nice cellar and they were expecting to see the Christmas tree as much as anybody. But just before Christmas a great cleaning up began in the house. The house mother came sweeping and dusting and wiping and scrubbing to make everything grand and clean for the Christ child's birthday. Her broom went into all the corners, poke, poke, and of course the spiders had to run. Dear! dear how the spiders had to run not one could stay in the house while the christmas cleanness lasted so you see they couldn't see the christmas tree spiders like to know all about everything and see all there is to see and they were very sad so at last they went to the christ child and told him all about it all the others see the Christmas tree, dear Christ child, they said. But we, who are so domestic and so fond of beautiful things, we are cleaned up. We cannot see it at all. The Christ child was very sorry for the little spiders when he heard this, and he said they should see the Christmas tree. The day before Christmas, when nobody was noticing, he let them all go in to look as long as ever they liked. They came creepy, creepy down the attic stairs, creepy, creepy up the cellar stairs, creepy, 
creepy along the halls and into the beautiful room. The fat mother spiders and the old papa spiders were there, and all the little teenty tonty curly spiders, the baby ones, and then they looked. Round and round the tree they crawled, and looked and looked and looked. Oh, what a good time they had! They thought it was perfectly beautiful. And when they looked at everything they could see from the floor, they started up the tree to see some more. All over the tree they ran, creepy, crawly, looking at every single thing, up and down, in and out, over every branch and twig the little spiders ran, and saw every one of the pretty things right up close. They stayed until they had seen all there was to see, you may be sure, and then they went away at last, quite happy. Then, in the still dark night before Christmas Day, the dear Christ child came to bless the tree for the children. But when he looked at it, what do you suppose? It was covered with cobwebs. Everywhere the little spiders had been, they had left a spider web, and you know they had been just everywhere. So the tree was covered from its trunk to its tip with spider webs, all hanging from the branches and looped around the twigs. It was a strange sight. What could the Christ child do? He knew that house mothers do not like cobwebs. It would never, never do to have a Christmas tree covered with those. No, indeed. So the dear Christ child touched the spider's webs and turned them all to gold. Wasn't that a lovely trimming? They shone and shone all over the beautiful tree. And that is the way the Christmas tree came to have golden cobwebs on it. End of the Golden Cobwebs by Robert Haven Schaffler Read by Ruth Golding Christmas 2011Good King Wenceslas, translated into English from the Latin by J. M. Neal. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Good King Wenceslas looked out on the Feast of Stephen, when the snow lay round about, deep and crisp and even. Brightly shone the moon that night, though the frost was cruel, when a poor man came in sight, gathering winter fuel. Hither, page, and stand by me, if thou know'st it, telling. Yonder peasant, who is he, where, and what is dwelling? Sire, he lives a good league hence, underneath the mountain, right against the forest fence, by St. Agnes' fountain. Bring me flesh, and bring me wine, bring me pine logs hither. Thou and I will see him dine, when we bear them thither. Page and monarch, forth they went, forth they went together through the rude wind's wild lament, and the bitter weather. Sire, the night is darker now, and the wind blows stronger. Fails my heart, I know not how, I can go no longer. Mark my footsteps, good my page, tread thou in them boldly. Thou shalt find the winter's rage, freeze thy blood less coldly. In his master's steps he trod where the snow lay dented. Heat was in the very sod which the saint had printed. Therefore, Christian men, be sure, wealth or rank possessing, ye who now will bless the poor, shall yourselves find blessing. End of Good King Wenceslas Read by Laurie Ann Walden Aaron Walden And David Lawrence Is There a Santa Claus? By Mr. Frank P. Church From Christmas by Various Edited by Robert Haven Schaufler Read in English This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Is there a Santa Claus? The following, 
reprinted from the editorial page of the New York Sun, was written by the late Mr. Frank P. Church. We take pleasure in answering at once and thus prominently the communication below, expressing at the same time our great gratification that its faithful author is numbered among the friends of the Sun. Dear Editor, I am eight years old. Some of my little friends say there is no Santa Claus. Papa says, if you see it in the sun, it's so. Please tell me the truth. Is there a Santa Claus? Virginia O'Hanlon Virginia, your little friends are wrong. They have been affected by the scepticism of a sceptical age. They do not believe except they see. They think that nothing can be which is not comprehensible by their little minds. All minds, Virginia, whether they be men's or children's, are little. In this great universe of ours man is a mere insect, an ant in his intellect, as compared with the boundless world about him, as measured by the intelligence capable of grasping the whole of truth and knowledge. Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. He exists as certainly as love and generosity and devotion exist and you know that they abound and give to your life its highest beauty and joy. Alas! How dreary would be the world if there were no Santa Claus! It would be as dreary as if there were no Virginias. There would be no childlike faith then, no poetry, no romance to make tolerable this existence. We should have no enjoyment except in sense and sight. The eternal light with which childhood fills the world would be extinguished. Not believe in Santa Claus? You might as well not believe in fairies. You might get your papa to hire men to watch in all the chimneys on Christmas Eve to catch Santa Claus. But even if they did not see Santa Claus coming down, what would that prove? Nobody sees Santa Claus, but that is no sign that there is no Santa Claus. The most real things in the world are those that neither children nor men can see. Did you ever see fairies dancing on the lawn? Of course not, but that's no proof that they are not there. Nobody can conceive or imagine all the wonders there are unseen and unseeable in the world. You may tear apart the baby's rattle and see what makes the noise inside, but there is a veil covering the unseen world which not the strongest man nor even the united strength of all the strongest men that ever lived could tear apart. Only faith, fancy, poetry, love, romance, can push aside that curtain and view and picture the supernal beauty and glory beyond. Is it all real? Ah, Virginia, in all this world there is nothing else real and abiding. No Santa Claus. Thank God, he lives, and he lives forever. A thousand years from now, Virginia, nay, ten times ten thousand years from now, he will continue to make glad the heart of childhood. End of Is There a Santa Claus? by Frank P. Church Read by Carol Box Joy Born at Bethlehem by Charles Haddon Spurgeon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Luke 2, 10-12 We have no superstitious regard for times and seasons. Certainly we do not believe in the present ecclesiastical arrangement called Christmas. First, because we do not believe in the Mass at all, but abhor it, whether it be said or sung in Latin or in English and secondly, because we find no scriptural warrant whatever for observing any day as the birthday of the Saviour, 
and consequently its observance is a superstition because not of divine authority superstition has fixed most positively the day of our saviour's birth although there is no possibility of discovering when it occurred fabricius gives a catalogue of one hundred thirty six different learned opinions upon the matter and various divines invent weighty arguments for advocating a date in every month of the year it was not till the middle of the third century that any part of the church celebrated the nativity of our lord and it was not till very long after the western church had set the example that the eastern adopted it because the day is not known therefore superstition has fixed it while since the day of the death of our saviour might be determined with much certainty therefore superstition shifts the date of its observance every year where is the method in the madness of the superstitious probably the fact is that the holy days were arranged to fit in with heathen festivals we venture to assert that if there be any day in the year of which we may be pretty sure that it was not the day on which the saviour was born it is the twenty-fifth of december nevertheless since the current of men's thoughts is led this way just now and i see no evil in the current itself i shall launch the bark of our discourse upon that stream and make use of the fact which i shall neither justify nor condemn by endeavouring to lead your thoughts in the same direction since it is lawful and even laudable to meditate upon the incarnation of the lord upon any day in the year it cannot be in the power of other men's superstitions to render such a meditation improper for to-day regarding not the day let us nevertheless give god thanks for the gift of his dear son in our text we have before us the sermon of the first evangelist under the gospel dispensation the preacher was an angel and it was meet it should be so for the grandest and last of all evangels will be proclaimed by an angel when he shall sound the trumpet of the resurrection and the children of the regeneration shall rise into the fullness of their joy the keynote of this angelic gospel is joy i bring unto you good tidings of great joy nature fears in the presence of god the shepherds were sore afraid the law itself served to deepen this natural feeling of dismay seeing men were sinful and the law came into the world to reveal sin its tendency was to make men fear and tremble under any and every divine revelation the jews unanimously believed that if any man beheld supernatural appearances he would be sure to die so that what nature dictated the law and the general beliefs of those under it also abetted but the first word of the gospel ended all this for the angelic evangelist said fear not behold i bring you good tidings henceforth it is to be no dreadful thing for man to approach his maker redeemed man is not to fear when god unveils the splendour of his majesty since he appears no more a judge upon the throne of terror but a father unbending in sacred familiarity before his own beloved children the joy which this first gospel preacher spoke of was no mean one for he said i bring you good tidings that alone were joy and not good tidings of joy only but good tidings of great joy every word is emphatic as if to show that the gospel is above all things intended to promote and will most abundantly create the greatest possible joy in the human heart wherever it is received man is like a harp unstrung and the music of his soul's living strings is discordant his whole nature wails with sorrow but the son of david that mighty harper has come to restore the harmony of humanity and where his gracious fingers move among the strings the touch of the fingers of an incarnate god brings forth music sweet as that of the spheres and melody rich as a seraph's canticle would god that all men felt that divine hand in trying to open up this angelic discourse this morning we shall note three things the joy which is spoken of next the persons to whom this joy comes and then thirdly the sign which is to us a sign as well as to these shepherds the sign of the birth and source of joy one first then the joy which is mentioned in our text whence comes it and what is it 
we have already said it is a great joy good tidings of great joy earth's joy is small her mirth is trivial but heaven has sent us joy immeasurable fit for immortal minds inasmuch as no note of time is appended and no intimation is given that the message will ever be reversed we may say that it is a lasting joy a joy which will ring all down the ages the echoes of which shall be heard until the trumpet brings the resurrection ay and onward for ever and for ever for when god sent forth the angel in his brightness to say i bring you good tidings of great joy which be to all people he did as much as say from this time forth it will be joy to the sons of men there shall be peace to the human race and good will towards men for ever and for ever as long as there is glory to god in the highest o oh, blessed thought the star of bethlehem shall never set jesus the fairest among ten thousand the most lovely among the beautiful is a joy for ever since this joy is expressly associated with the glory of god by the words glory to god in the highest we may be quite clear that it is a pure and holy joy no other would an angel have proclaimed and indeed no other joy is joy the wine pressed from the grapes of sodom may sparkle and foam but it is bitterness in the end and the dregs thereof are death only that which comes from the clusters of eshcol is the true wine of the kingdom making glad the heart of god and man holy joy is the joy of heaven and that be ye sure is the very cream of joy the joy of sin is a fire fountain having its source in the burning soil of hell maddening and consuming those who drink its fire water of such delights we desire not to drink it were to be worse than damned to be happy in sin since it is the beginning of grace to be wretched in sin and the consummation of grace to be wholly escaped from sin and to shudder even at the thought of it it is hell to live in sin and misery it is a deep lower still when men could fashion a joy in sin god save us from unholy peace and from unholy joy the joy announced by the angel of the nativity is as pure as it is lasting as holy as it is great let us then always believe concerning the christian religion that it has its joy within itself and holds its feasts within its own pure precincts a feast whose viands all grow on holy ground there are those who to-morrow will pretend to exhibit joy in the remembrance of our saviour's birth but they will not seek their pleasure in the saviour they will need many additions to the feast before they can be satisfied joy in emmanuel would be a poor sort of mirth to them in this country too often if one were unaware of the name one might believe the christmas festival to be a feast of bacchus or of ceres certainly not a commemoration of the divine birth yet is there cause enough for holy joy in the lord himself and reasons for ecstasy in his birth among men it is to be feared that most men imagine that in christ there is only seriousness and solemnity and to them consequently weariness gloom and discontent therefore they look out of and beyond what christ allows to snatch from the tables of satan the delicacies with which to adorn the banquet held in honour of a saviour let it not be so among you the joy which the gospel brings is not borrowed but blooms in its own garden we may truly say in the language of one of our sweetest hymns i need not go abroad for joy i have a feast at home my sighs are turned into songs my heart has ceased to roam down from above the blessed dove has come into my breast to witness his eternal love and give my spirit rest let our joy be living water from those sacred wells which the lord himself has digged may his joy abide in us that our joy may be full of christ's joy we cannot have too much no fear of running to excess when his love is the wine we drink oh to be plunged in this pure stream of spiritual delights but why is it that the coming of christ into the world is the occasion of joy the answer is as follows first 
because it is evermore a joyous fact that god should be in alliance with man especially when the alliance is so near that god should in very deed take our manhood into union with his godhead so that god and man should constitute one divine mysterious person sin had separated between god and man but the incarnation bridges the separation it is a prelude to the atoning sacrifice but it is a prelude full of the richest hope from henceforth when god looks upon man he will remember that his own son is a man from this day forth when he beholds the sinner if his wrath should burn he will remember that his own son as man stood in the sinner's place and bore the sinner's doom as in the case of war the feud is ended when the opposing parties intermarry so there is no more war between god and man because god has taken man into intimate union with himself herein then there was cause for joy but there was more than that for the shepherds were aware that there had been promises made of old which had been the hope and comfort of believers in all ages and these were now to be fulfilled there was that ancient promise made on the threshold of eden to the first sinners of our race that the seed of the woman should bruise the serpent's head another promise made to the father of the faithful that in his seed should all the nations of the earth be blessed and promises uttered by the mouths of prophets and of saints since the world began now the announcement of the angel of the lord to the shepherds was a declaration that the covenant was fulfilled that now in the fullness of time god would redeem his word and the messiah who was to be israel's glory and the world's hope was now really come be glad ye heavens and be joyful o earth for the lord hath done it and in mercy hath he visited his people the lord hath not suffered his word to fail but hath fulfilled unto his people his promises the time to favour zion yea the set time is come now that the sceptre is departed from judah behold the shiloh comes the messenger of the covenant suddenly appears in his temple but the angel's song had in it yet fuller reason for joy for our lord who was born in bethlehem came as a saviour unto you is born this day a saviour god had come to earth before but not as a saviour remember that terrible coming when there went three angels into sodom at nightfall for the lord said i will go now and see whether it be altogether according to the cry thereof he had come as a spy to witness human sin and as an avenger to lift his hand to heaven and bid the red fire descend and burn up the accursed cities of the plain horror to the world when god thus descends if sinai smokes when the law is proclaimed the earth itself shall melt when the breaches of the law are punished but now not as an angel of vengeance but as a man in mercy god has come not to spy out our sin but to remove it not to punish guilt but to forgive it the lord might have come with thunderbolts in both his hands he might have come like elias to call fire from heaven but no his hands are full of gifts of love and his presence is the guarantee of grace the babe born in the manger might have been another prophet of tears or another son of thunder but he was not so he came in gentleness his glory and his thunder alike laid aside twas mercy filled the throne and wrath stood silent by when christ on the kind errand came to sinners doomed to die rejoice ye who feel that ye are lost your saviour comes to seek and save you be of good cheer ye who are in prison for he comes to set you free ye who are famished and ready to die rejoice that he has consecrated for you a bethlehem a house of bread and he has come to be the bread of life to your souls rejoice o sinners everywhere for the restorer of the castaways the saviour of the fallen is born join in the joy ye saints for he is the preserver of the saved ones delivering them from innumerable perils and he is the sure perfecter of such as he preserves jesus is no partial saviour beginning a work and not concluding it 
but restoring and upholding he also perfects and presents the saved ones without spot or wrinkle or any such thing before his father's throne rejoice aloud all ye people let your hills and valleys ring with joy for a saviour who is mighty to save is born among you nor was this all the holy mirth for the next word has also in it a fullness of joy a saviour who is christ or the anointed our lord is not an amateur saviour who has come down from heaven upon an unauthorized mission but he was chosen ordained and anointed of god he could truly say the spirit of the lord is upon me because the lord hath anointed me here is great comfort for all such as need a saviour it is to them no mean consolation that god has himself authorized christ to save there can be no fear of a jar between the mediator and the judge no peril of a non-acceptance of our saviour's work because god has commissioned christ to do what he has done and in saving sinners he is only executing his father's own will christ is here called the anointed all his people are anointed and there were priests after the order of aaron who were anointed but he is the anointed anointed with the oil of gladness above his fellows so plenteously anointed that like the unction upon aaron's head the sacred anointing of the head of the church distills in copious streams until we who are like the skirts of his garments are made sweet with the rich perfume he is the anointed in a threefold sense as prophet to preach the gospel with power as priest to offer sacrifice as king to rule and reign in each of these he is preeminent he is such a teacher priest and ruler as was never seen before in him was a rare conjunction of glorious offices for never did prophet priest and king meet in one person before among the sons of men nor shall it ever be so again triple is the anointing of him who is a priest after the order of melchizedek a prophet like unto moses and a king of whose dominion there is no end in the name of christ the holy ghost is glorified by being seen as anointing the incarnate god truly dear brethren if we did but understand all this and receive it into our hearts our souls would leap for joy on this sabbath day to think that there is born unto us a saviour who is anointed of the lord one more note and this the loudest let us sound it well and hear it well which is christ the lord now the word lord or curios here used is tantamount to jehovah we cannot doubt that because it is the same word used twice in the ninth verse and in the ninth verse none can question that it means jehovah hear it and lo the angel of the lord came upon them and the glory of the lord shone round about them and if this be not enough read the twenty-third verse as it is written in the law of the lord every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the lord now the word lord here assuredly refers to jehovah the one god and so it must do here our saviour is christ god jehovah no testimony to his divinity could be plainer it is indisputable and what joy there is in this for suppose an angel had been our saviour he would not have been able to bear the load of my sin or yours or if anything less than god had been set up as the ground of our salvation it might have been found too frail a foundation but if he who undertakes to save is none other than the infinite and the almighty then the load of our guilt can be carried upon such shoulders the stupendous labour of our salvation can be achieved by such a worker and that with ease for all things are possible with god and he is able to save to the uttermost them that come unto god by him ye sons of men perceive ye here the subject of your joy the god who made you and against whom you have offended has come down from heaven and taken upon himself your nature that he might save you he has come in the fullness of his glory and the infinity of his mercy that he might redeem you do you not welcome this news what will not your hearts be thankful for this 
does this matchless love awaken no gratitude were it not for this divine saviour your life here would have been wretchedness and your future existence would have been endless woe oh i pray you adore the incarnate god and trust in him then will you bless the lord for delivering you from the wrath to come and as you lay hold of jesus and find salvation in his name you will tune your songs to his praise and exult with sacred joy so much concerning this joy two follow me while i briefly speak of the people to whom this joy comes observe how the angel begins behold i bring you good tidings of great joy for unto you is born this day so then the joy began with the first who heard it the shepherds to you saith he for unto you is born beloved hearer shall the joy begin with you to-day for it little avails you that Christ was born, or that Christ died, unless unto you a child is born, and for you Jesus bled. A personal interest is the main point. But I am poor, saith one. So were the shepherds. O ye poor, to you this mysterious child is born. The poor have the gospel preached unto them. He shall judge the poor and needy, and break in pieces the oppressor but i am obscure and unknown saith one so were the watchers on the midnight plain who knew the men who endured hard toil and kept their flocks by night but you unknown of men are known to god shall it not be said that unto you a child is born the lord regardeth not the greatness of men but hath respect unto the lowly but you are illiterate you say you cannot understand much be it so but unto the shepherds christ was born and their simplicity did not hinder their receiving him but even helped them to it be it so with yourself receive gladly the simple truth as it is in jesus the lord hath exalted one chosen out of the people no aristocratic christ have i to preach to you but the saviour of the people the friend of publicans and sinners jesus is the true poor man's friend he is a covenant for the people given to be a leader and a commander to the people to you is jesus given o oh, that each heart might truly say to me is jesus born for it i truly believe in jesus unto me christ is born and i may be as sure of it as if an angel announced it since the scripture tells me that if i believe in jesus he is mine after the angel had said to you he went on to say it shall be to all people but our translation is not accurate the greek is and it shall be to all the people this refers most assuredly to the jewish nation there can be no question about that if any one looks at the original he will not find so large and wide an expression as that given by our translators it should be rendered to all the people and here let us speak a word for the jews how long and how sinfully has the christian church despised the most honourable amongst the nations how barbarously has israel been handled by the so-called church i felt my spirit burn indignantly within me in rome when i stood in the jews quarter and heard of the cruel indignities which popery has heaped upon the jews even until recently at this hour there stands in the jews quarter a church built right in front of the entrance to it and into this the unhappy jews were driven forcibly on certain occasions to this church they were compelled to subscribe subscribe mark you as worshippers of the one invisible god to the support of a system which is leprous with idolatry as were the canaanites whom the lord abhorred paganism is not more degrading than romanism over the door of this church is placed in their own tongue in the hebrew these words all day long have i stretched out my hands to a disobedient and gainsaying generation how by such an insult as that could they hope to convert the jew the jew saw everywhere idols which his soul abhorred and he loathed the name of christ because he associated it with idol worship and i do not wonder that he did 
i praise the jew that he could not give up his own simple theism and worship of the true god for such a base degrading superstition as that which rome presented to him instead of thinking it a wonder of unbelief that the jew is not a christian i honour him for his faith and his courageous resistance of a fascinating heathenism if romanism be christianity i am not neither could i be a christian it were a more manly thing to be a simple believer in one god or even an honest doubter upon all religion than worship such crowds of gods and goddesses as popery has set up and to bow as she does before rotten bones and dead men's winding sheets let the true christian church think lovingly of the jew and with respectful earnestness tell him the true gospel let her sweep away superstition and set before him the one gracious god in the trinity of his divine unity and the day shall yet come when the jews who were the first apostles to the gentiles the first missionaries to us who were afar off shall be gathered in again until that shall be the fulness of the church's glory can never come matchless benefits to the world are bound up with the restoration of israel their gathering in shall be as life from the dead jesus the saviour is the joy of all nations but let not the chosen race be denied their peculiar share of whatever promise holy writ has recorded with a special view to them the woes which their sins brought upon them have fallen thick and heavily and even so let the richest blessings distill upon them although our translation is not literally correct it nevertheless expresses a great truth taught plainly in the context and therefore we will advance another step the coming of christ is a joy to all people it is so for the fourteenth verse says on earth peace which is a wide and even unlimited expression. It adds, good will towards, not Jews, but men, all men. The word is the generic name of the entire race, and there is no doubt that the coming of Christ does bring joy to all sorts of people. It brings a measure of joy even to those who are not Christians. Christ does not bless them in the highest and truest sense, but the influence of his teaching imparts benefits of an inferior sort such as they are capable of receiving for wherever the gospel is proclaimed it is no small blessing to all the population note this fact there is no land beneath the sun where there is an open bible and a preached gospel where a tyrant long can hold his place it matters not who he be whether pope or king let the pulpit be used properly for the preaching of christ crucified let the bible be opened to be read by all men and no tyrant can long rule in peace england owes her freedom to the bible and france will never possess liberty lasting and well established till she comes to reverence the gospel which too long she has rejected there is joy to all mankind where christ comes the religion of jesus makes men think and to make men think is always dangerous to a despot's power the religion of jesus christ sets a man free from superstition when he believes in jesus what cares he for papal excommunications or whether priests give or withhold their absolution the man no longer cringes and bows down he is no more willing like a beast to be led by the nose but learning to think for himself and becoming a man he disdains the childish fears which once held him in slavery hence where jesus comes even if men do not receive him as the saviour and so miss the fullest joy yet they get a measure of benefit and i pray god that everywhere his gospel may be so proclaimed and that so many may be actuated by the spirit of it that it may be better for all mankind if men receive christ there will be no more oppression the true christian does to others as he would that they should do to him and there is no more contention of classes nor grinding of the faces of the poor slavery must go down where christianity rules and mark you if romanism be once destroyed and pure christianity shall govern all nations war itself must come to an end for if there be anything which this book denounces and counts the hugest of all crimes 
it is the crime of war put up thy sword into thy sheath for hath not he said thou shalt not kill and he meant not that it was a sin to kill one but a glory to kill a million but he meant that bloodshed on the smallest or largest scale was sinful let christ govern and men shall break the bow and cut the spear in sunder and burn the chariot in the fire it is joy to all nations that christ is born the prince of peace the king who rules in righteousness but beloved the greatest joy is to those who know christ as a saviour here the song rises to a higher and sublimer note unto us indeed a child is born if we can say that he is our saviour who is christ the lord let me ask each of you a few personal questions are your sins forgiven you for his name's sake is the head of the serpent bruised in your soul does the seed of the woman reign in sanctifying power over your nature oh then you have the joy that is to all the people in the truest form of it and dear brother dear sister the further you submit yourself to christ the lord the more completely you know him and are like him the fuller will your happiness become surface joy is to those who live where the saviour is preached but the great deeps the great fathomless deeps of solemn joy which glisten and sparkle with delight are for such as know the saviour obey the anointed one and have communion with the lord himself he is the most joyful man who is the most christly man i wish that some christians were more truly christians they are christians and something else it were much better if they were altogether christians perhaps you know the legend or perhaps true history of the awakening of saint augustine he dreamed that he died and went to the gates of heaven and the keeper of the gates said to him who are you and he answered christianus sum i am a christian but the porter replied no you are not a christian you are a ciceronian for your thoughts and studies were most of all directed to the works of cicero and the classics and you neglected the teaching of jesus we judge men here by that which most engrossed their thoughts and you are judged not to be a christian but a ciceronian when augustine awoke he put aside the classics which he had studied and the eloquence at which he had aimed and he said i will be a christian and a theologian and from that time he devoted his thoughts to the word of god and his pen and his tongue to the instruction of others in the truth oh i would not have it said of any of you well he may be somewhat christian but he is far more a keen money-getting tradesman i would not have it said well he may be a believer in christ but he is a good deal more a politician perhaps he is a christian but he is most at home when he is talking about science farming engineering horses mining navigation or pleasure-taking no no you will never know the fullness of the joy which jesus brings to the soul unless under the power of the holy spirit you take the lord your master to be your all in all and make him the fountain of your intensest delight he is my saviour my christ my lord be this your loudest boast then will you know the joy which the angel's song predicts for men three but i must pass on the last thing in the text is the sign the shepherds did not ask for a sign but one was graciously given sometimes it is sinful for us to require as an evidence what god's tenderness may nevertheless see fit to give us as an aid to faith wilful unbelief shall have no sign but weak faith shall have compassionate aid the sign that the joy of the world had come was this they were to go to the manger to find the christ in it and he was to be the sign every circumstance is therefore instructive the babe was found wrapped in swaddling clothes now observe as you look at this infant that there is not the remotest appearance of temporal power here mark the two little puny arms of a little babe that must be carried if it go alas the nations of the earth look for joy in military power by what means can we make a nation of soldiers 
the prussian method is admirable we must have thousands upon thousands of armed men and big cannon and ironclad vessels to kill and destroy by wholesale is it not a nation's pride to be gigantic in arms what pride flushes the patriot's cheek when he remembers that his nation can murder faster than any other people ah foolish generation ye are groping in the flames of hell to find your heaven raking amid blood and bones for the foul thing which ye call glory a nation's joy can never lie in the misery of others killing is not the path to prosperity huge armaments are a curse to the nation itself as well as to its neighbours the joy of a nation is a golden sand over which no stream of blood has ever rippled it is only found in that river the streams whereof make glad the city of god the weakness of submissive gentleness is true power jesus founds his eternal empire not on force but on love hear o ye people see your hope the mild pacific prince whose glory is his self-sacrifice is our true benefactor but look again and you shall observe no pomp to dazzle you is the child wrapped in purple and fine linen ah no sleeps he in a cradle of gold the manger alone is his shelter no crown is upon the babe's head neither does a coronet surround the mother's brow a simple maiden of galilee and a little child in ordinary swaddling bands it is all you see bask not in courtly bower or sunbright hall of power pass babel quick and seek the holy land from robes of tyrian dye turn with undazzled eye to bethlehem's glade and by the manger stand alas the nations are dazzled with a vain show the pomp of empires the pageants of kings are their delight how can they admire those gaudy courts in which too often glorious apparel decorations and rank stand in the stead of virtue chastity and truth when will the people cease to be children must they for ever crave for martial music which stimulates to violence and delight in a lavish expenditure which burdens them with taxation these make not a nation great or joyous bah how has the bubble burst across yon narrow sea a bubble empire has collapsed ten thousand bayonets and millions of gold proved but a sandy foundation for a babel throne vain are the men who look for joy and pomp it lies in truth and righteousness in peace and salvation of which yonder new-born prince in the garments of a peasant child is the true symbol neither was there wealth to be seen at bethlehem here in this quiet island the bulk of men are comfortably seeking to acquire their thousands by commerce and manufactures we are the sensible people who follow the main chance and are not to be deluded by ideas of glory we are making all the money we can and wondering that other nations waste so much in fight the main prop and pillar of england's joy is to be found as some tell us in the three per cents in the possession of colonies in the progress of machinery in steadily increasing our capital is not mammon a smiling deity but here in the cradle of the world's hope at bethlehem i see far more of poverty than wealth i perceive no glitter of gold or spangle of silver i perceive only a poor babe so poor so very poor that he is in a manger laid and his mother is a mechanic's wife a woman who wears neither silk nor gem not in your gold o britons will ever lie your joy but in the gospel enjoyed by all classes the gospel freely preached and joyfully received jesus by raising us to spiritual wealth redeems us from the chains of mammon and in that liberty gives us joy and here too i see no superstition i know the artist paints angels in the skies and surrounds the scene with a mysterious light of which tradition's tongue of falsehood has said that it made midnight as bright as noon this is fiction merely there was nothing more there than the stable the straw the oxen ate and perhaps the beasts themselves and the child in the plainest simplest manner wrapped as other children are the cherubs were invisible and of halos there were none 
around this birth of joy was no sign of superstition that demon dared not intrude its tricks and posturings into the sublime spectacle it would have been there as much out of place as a harlequin in the holy of holies a simple gospel a plain gospel as plain as that babe wrapped in the commonest garments is this day the only hope for men be ye wise and believe in jesus and abhor all the lies of rome and inventions of those who ape her detestable abominations nor does the joy of the world lie in philosophy you could not have made a schoolman's puzzle of bethlehem if you had tried to do so it is just a child in the manger and a jewish woman looking on and nursing it and a carpenter standing by there was no metaphysical difficulty there of which men could say a doctor of divinity is needed to explain it and an assembly of divines must expound it it is true the wise men came there but it was only to adore and offer gifts would that all the wise had been as wise as they alas human subtlety has disputed over the manger and logic has darkened counsel with its words but this is one of man's many inventions god's work was sublimely simple here was the word made flesh to dwell among us a mystery for faith but not a football for argument mysterious yet the greatest simplicity that was ever spoken to human ears and seen by mortal eyes and such is the gospel in the preaching of which our apostle said we use great plainness of speech away 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 with your learned sermons and your fine talk and your pretentious philosophies these never created a jot of happiness in this world fine spun theories are fair to gaze on and to bewilder fools but they are of no use to practical men they comfort not the sons of toil nor cheer the daughters of sorrow the man of common sense who feels the daily rub and tear of this poor world needs richer consolation than your novel theologies or neologies can give him in a simple christ and in a simple faith in that christ there is a peace deep and lasting in a plain poor man's gospel there is a joy and a bliss unspeakable of which thousands can speak and speak with confidence too for they declare what they do know and testify what they have seen i say then to you who would know the only true peace and lasting joy come ye to the babe of bethlehem in after days the man of sorrows the substitutionary sacrifice for sinners come ye little children ye boys and girls come ye for he also was a boy the holy child jesus is the children's saviour and saith still suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not come hither ye maidens ye who are still in the morning of your beauty and like mary rejoice in god your saviour the virgin bore him on her bosom so come ye and bear him in your hearts saying unto us a child is born unto us a son is given and you ye men in the plenitude of your strength remember how joseph cared for him and watched with reverent solicitude his tender years be you to his cause as a father and a helper sanctify your strength to his service and ye women advanced in years ye matrons and widows come like anna and bless the lord that you have seen the salvation of israel and ye whoreheads who like simeon are ready to depart come ye and take the saviour in your arms adoring him as your saviour and your all ye shepherds ye simple-hearted ye who toil for your daily bread come and adore your saviour and stand not back ye wise men ye who know by experience and who by meditation peer into deep truth come ye and like the sages of the east bow low before his presence and make it your honour to pay honour to christ the lord for my own part the incarnate god is all my hope and trust i have seen the world's religion at the fountain-head and my heart has sickened within me i come back to preach by god's help yet more earnestly the gospel the simple gospel of the son of man jesus master i take thee to be mine for ever may all in this house through the rich grace of god be led to do the same 
and may they all be thine great son of god in the day of thine appearing for thy love's sake amen end of joy born at bethlehem by charles spurgeon Julius Adolphus Jenkins' Christmas Alligator by Lewis Beck Read in English This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. When Mr. Julius Adolphus Jenkins arrived at the thriving little city of Townsville in North Queensland, he was, at first, greatly flattered at the amount of attention he attracted when he walked up Flinders Street to introduce himself to the manager of the Bank of North Australia, to which institution he had been appointed ledger-keeper. But when, in addition to being stared at by every passer-by, he found that people ran to their shop doors and either gazed at him in open-mouthed wonder or laughed outright he began to feel annoyed, and was glad to enter the bank to escape observation. The manager of the bank and his accountant were at that moment discussing the expected arrival of the new chum, ledger-keeper, who was due that morning by the English mail-steamer, and Mr. Jenkins thought it very strange, and somewhat rude, that they should stare at him as if he were some new species of animal. However, they were both very polite to him, inquired if he had had a pleasant voyage from London, and asked him what he would like to drink. This made Mr. Jenkins in turn stare at them, and wonder if these two disreputably clad young men were really the manager and accountant of a bank, or a couple of daring burglars who had taken possession of the building. I, uh, I, I thank you. I don't know, he stammered. Oh, but please do, Mr. Jenkins, said Alec McPherson, the manager, genially. Come into the dining-room. Shut the door, Jimmy. If any one comes, let him knock. And he led the way into the dining-room, where Mrs. Flaherty, cook and general, was laying the table for lunch. Without being told, she went to the deal dresser that did duty as a sideboard and dinner wagon, and brought a bottle of brandy, a bottle of whisky, some bottles of soda, and three large tumblers, and placed them on the table. Apologizing for the want of ice, a rare commodity in Townsville in those days, Mr. McPherson, on learning that Mr. Jenkins would take just a very little brandy, passed him the bottle, told him to help himself, and opened a bottle of soda water for him. Then he and the accountant, Jimmy Bathurst, locally known as Jimmy Bad Thirst, helped themselves to what Mr. Jenkins thought an appalling and disgraceful quantity of whiskey. "'Well, Mr. Jenkins,' said the manager, as he cocked one leg over the arm of his chair, and began cutting up a pipeful of black plug tobacco, "'we are glad to see you. Of course, you'll have lunch with us? That's right. Where are your traps?' Oh, at the Queen's Hotel. Well, it is about the decentest place in town to stay at. Bathurst and I live here, bank rule, you know, and we manage pretty well. Now then, Mrs. Flaherty, kindly hurry up and give us a good lunch, please. Hope you'll like Townsville, Mr. Jenkins. It's a beastly hot hole, but there are a lot of good fellows here, and you'll soon get into our ways." Mr. Julius Adolphus Jenkins murmured, in a dazed sort of way, that he hoped so, and then asked when he was to begin his duties. "'Oh, in about a week, if you like. There's no hurry, and I am not going to rush you into work at once. Don't you smoke? Of course your salary begins from today, but Jimmy here and the exchange clerk will attend to the ledgers for a week or so more with pleasure.' By the way, Jimmy, when is Fletcher coming back? Fletcher was the youthful exchange clerk. Bathurst grinned 
when he does you told him he could go fishing for an hour or two this morning dare sail he'll turn up to-morrow to call over at lunch mcpherson and his subordinate did their best to put their guest at his ease for they both saw that he was not at all happy in fact he really was miserable for he felt that he had come to live among savages excusing himself as soon as possible he went off to his hotel and once he was out of hearing the two young men burst out into irrepressible laughter in which mrs flaherty unchecked daringly joined swaying with her hands on her hips from side to side whilst tears rolled down her perspiring cheeks never did i see such a thing like it in all me loife she panted at last sure the whole town will be a for following him up and down the strait get away out of this mrs flaherty gasped bathurst as with the tears streaming down his own cheeks he pushed her out through the door just as a big bearded man in the uniform of an inspector of mounted police came in and looked at the two young men wondering what was the cause of their mirth closey my boy did you see it said bathurst in a choky sort of whisper as he sank back in his seat what is it asked the officer our new chum clerk from england just turned up oh closey he's glorious he's a wonderful sight a circus a panorama isn't in it with him you must bring your nigger troopers to look at him such a rig out for north queensland you never saw in your life top hat frock coat collar half a foot high monocle spats on his boots kid gloves and a beautiful cane when will he be on show inquired the hairy man as he helped himself to a drink now julius adolphus as he was henceforth to be known although a terribly conceited young man and an intense admirer of himself had a certain amount of common sense and when he found that his piccadilly costume attracted such widespread attention and amusement he began to feel uncomfortable it was not pleasant for instance when he showed himself in the street to hear a lot of rough diggers make such remarks as oh strike me dick just look at it or for a great hulking bushman to deliberately stand in front of him open-mouthed and then fall down in a pretended fit he stood it for a few days and then mcpherson came to his assistance and gave him advice you you see, Mr. Jenkins, your style of dress is so, so very unusual in this part of the world that it, well, it makes people stare. Now, I'm sure you won't mind my advising you to discard it for something more suitable and less striking. Do you wish me to discard wearing a coat? inquired Julius Adolphus hotly, adding with dignity that he would draw the line at that had messrs mcpherson and bathurst seen the very descriptive letter which the young man wrote home to his parents they would have at least been interested if not flattered at his remarks about the society of townsville in general and themselves in particular the people are the roughest and dirtiest imaginable one half of them are diggers who are swarming in from the interior on their way to the new gold fields on the palmer river they all have horses use the most frightful language and when not fighting or intoxicated are lying asleep in the shade on public-house verandas when i first entered the door of the disgraceful building called a bank i found therein two rough-looking young men clad in shirts trousers and boots socks i presume they had round each man's waist was a coarse leather belt on which was also a greasy leather watch pouch neither had collar nor tie and each was smoking a pipe imagine my disgust when i found that these two disreputable looking roughs were respectively the manager and accountant certainly they were civil and i presume have been gentlemen 
They addressed each other as Jimmy and Alec, and seemed to be on terms of the most shocking familiarity with their customers, and go out and have drinks with them at the low hotel opposite the bank at all times of the day, or invite them into their own dining-room. And this in banking hours! And they keep a pack of savage kangaroo dogs, which live in the bank. The exchange clerk is an unmitigated young ruffian of eighteen named Fletcher. He also smokes a pipe in the bank, and out of it, and addresses me as Jenkins, and is hail-fellow well met with the rough and dirty diggers and bushmen who come into the bank on business. I wonder what these three beautiful creatures would think of an English bank and its tone. Six months had passed and Julius Adolphus had become used to, and not entirely averse to, his surroundings. One reason for this was that, being very musical, his evenings were not dull, and although Townsville was a new town, there was no lack of ladies' society, for nearly all the government officials, merchants, doctors, and other professional men were married, and some had families, in which were some pretty girls and as Mr. Jenkins began to lose his provincial English stiffness, and wear white ducks and unbend himself generally, he actually found that he was beginning to like some of the people who were always so hospitable to him, and for a Miss Mary Brandon, the pretty daughter of a leading merchant, he had more than a liking. Like himself, she was very musical, and he visited her father's town-house on Melton Hill several evenings a week. Mary was at first much inclined to make fun of her admirer, and chaffed him a good deal, which only made him the more devoted to her, and, as time went on, he gradually lost much of his new chummishness, and mixed with young men of his own age, attended an occasional race-meeting, and even went so far as to join in a kangaroo hunt. But at the same time he always regarded himself as an infinitely superior person, and he hated Jimmy bad thirst, first because that irresponsible young man openly expressed his admiration for Mary Brandon, and secondly because he was noisy in the bank, smoked incessantly, even when cashing checks over the counter, and always spoke of banking as merely a pawnbroking business, without the sign of the three balls over the door. Julius Adolphus had a holy reverence for banking as a dignified and gentlemanly pursuit, and it horrified him to hear loose talk like this. When the rainy season came in, there was a great wild-goose shooting party on some swamps a few hours' ride from the town and he was induced to take part in it, clad in a wonderful sporting get-up, which caused great hilarity. Everything he wore from head to foot was new, and as every article, except a huge green-lined solar topee, had been made by local tailors and outfitters, who had never made the like before in their lives, but had done their best, which was awful to look at, he presented such a curious spectacle that numbers of the townspeople cheered him, and almost every fourth person he met inquired if he was going far. Allusions to the solar tope were numerous as being just the thing to attract geese and ducks, and so on. But Julius Adolphus deigned no reply, and trotted along the street in dignified silence and chin in air. On his way to join the party, he called at Miss Brandon's house. She told him, out of pity, that he looked so nice and so different from the others, that he flushed with pleasure, and said he would leave a goose at the house on his way home. Arriving at the swamp at dusk, the party camped for the night in tents, intending to begin the shoot at dawn from three different sides of the great swamp, 
and Julius Adolphus was instructed as to the position he was to take up at a certain spot, and not to fire till his turn came, or he would, as young Fletcher observed, spoil the bloomin' show. But he was determined to get more geese than any one. So long before dawn he started alone, got to his appointed post under a clump of fi-trees, and waited impatiently, for all around him he could hear hundreds upon hundreds of geese, some on the banks, some on the water. And at the first break of day he saw on a little islet less than fifty yards away thirty or forty birds standing at the water's edge. In an instant he fired both barrels and uttered a shout of triumph as two birds dropped and, gun in hand, he dashed into the shallow water, and promptly sank up to his chin in mud, as some thousands of geese, with a noise of wings like a hurricane, rose in air from all parts of the swamp, and made off to another spot, two miles away, amid the curses of the rest of the shooting party. Julius Adolphus was rescued just in time from perishing miserably. Then his gun was found, and he was brought back to camp, given some coffee, threatened with murder if he left the tent again, and the two geese he had shot thrown at him, with much Queensland language. He waited till the party had gone, then burning with anger at his rude treatment, but proud of his skill, he caught and saddled his horse, and with the pair of geese made his way back to town to his hotel, changed his clothes, and at lunchtime carried the geese to his divinity. Her sweet words of praise filled his manly bosom with joy, and before an hour had passed inspired him to confess his love. And whilst Mary did not actually say yes, she did not say no, but at the same time frankly told him that he must try and be less English, especially in his assumption that colonials were an uncultivated lot of beings, and quite inferior in intelligence to the Englishman born. And Adolphus, she added, just show all these young fellows that you are as good a sportsman as any one of them. I know you can be, if you try. And Julius Adolphus Jenkins went home on air, blessing those two geese. For some weeks he preserved a distinctly haughty demeanor to Jimmy Bathurst and young Fletcher, especially when the latter made rude allusions to the awful sight he had presented when pulled up out of the mud. He now paid the fair Mary daily visits and promised her to learn to ride like a colonial, and not mind a little chaff. "'Every new chum gets teased at first, Julius,' she said. "'Now, Mr. Macpherson was such a dandified young Scotsman when we first knew him ten years ago, but look at him now. Anyone would think he had been born and bred in the bush, and lived among rough diggers and bushmen all his life. I don't want you to be careless or untidy in your dress, but would like you to be just a little more colonial in your ways. And I want you to go shooting and fishing and kangarooing as much as you can, like the other men here. And, oh, Julius, do try and shoot an alligator. There were five killed in Ross River last week by different people, and I should like you to shoot one. Could you not? It is not very dangerous, if you are careful." Julius bridled up. "'What they can do, I can do,' he said loftily. Mary's eyes sparkled. "'Oh, Julius, do try, and if you do, I will marry you whenever you ask me. The fact is, Julius, dear, father laughs at you and says you are an awful duffer and teases me terribly about you, and that horrid little beast of a Fletcher boy mimics you so terribly, and you know what father is, he laughs at every one. 
but he won't let me marry a duffer. No, not if he were a duke or a bishop. A mile or two from Townsville, near the mouth of the Ross River, there was a small, muddy-banked and low mangrove island, in the center of which was a ramshackle hut raised on four piles. It was used by the local Chinese shrimpers and fishermen, and also by alligator shooters, occasionally, as a good and safe spot to get an easy shot at close range at any saurian lying on the river bank a few yards distant. Here, one afternoon at four o'clock, two days before Christmas Day, Julius Adolphus found himself determined to kill an alligator before nine on the following morning. He was due at the bank at ten. For the purpose, he had borrowed a heavy Terry police rifle, had had its mechanism explained, provided himself with twenty cartridges, some rope, and also some refreshment in case he had to remain the night. He had reached the islet by a punt belonging to the Chinaman, who lent it to him for the night for half a crown, under promise of his not losing it. This he failed to do, for immediately he jumped out of it, the thing shot off stern first, and went whirling down the muddy river and out to sea. This was disconcerting, for there was not a soul about. It was raining, and there were millions of mosquitoes stinging his face and hands. However, he was not alarmed, rather exhilarated, in fact, at spending the night alone, though the loss of the punt and the rope, the latter to secure the alligator after it was shot, was annoying. The floor of the hut was six feet above the ground, and all around the four rough posts, and also hanging from the floor beams, were folds upon folds of a stout fishing net put there to dry by the Chinaman. Ascent to the hut was by means of a notched pole, slanting upwards from the ground. The interior was bare of any furniture, but there were plenty of Chinese smells. The hut, although such a rickety-looking affair, was really strongly built, and every part of it, including the posts, were lashed together with cane instead of being fastened by nails. For two hours, till darkness came on, Julius Adolphus, rifle in hand, scanned the muddy banks opposite, but saw no sign of any alligators, although he was several times inclined to fire at some logs, which he had been told very much resembled alligators when those reptiles were asleep. He passed a wretched night. It poured with rain continuously, and as it wore on towards morning, he became conscious of an alarming fact. The river was rising fast. Striking a match, he peered down through an opening in the roughly boarded floor, and his heart sank when he saw that the yellow rushing water was within two feet of the boards. Then he went to the door, or rather entrance hole, of the now trembling shanty, and peered out. He could see nothing for the blinding rain obscured everything. For a moment or two wild terror possessed him, and seizing his heavy rifle he fired shot after shot in quick succession through the doorway in the hope it would bring succor. No answer came. There was only the hum, the low droning hum of the rushing flood, as it swept through the mangroves and the heavy plashing of the rain upon the pine-boarded roof of the humpy. Then Julius Adolphus Jenkins, the dude, the howling new chum, and the rank duffer, pulled himself together and became a man. He lit his pipe, Mary's doings, for he had abhorred smoking a pipe, sat down on the quivering floor of the humpy, and waited for daybreak. Dawn at last, and Julius heaved a sigh of relief when he saw that the water was lower by several inches, but the ramshackle structure was canted over to an alarming degree, although the posts which upheld it 
had been planted several feet in the ground. Suddenly there arose a strange and violent commotion immediately beneath the floor of the hut, which presently began to sway to and fro, then came shakings, followed by a succession of thumps and bumps against the posts, and the hut canted over more than ever, and then began to move, and the occupant realized that he was adrift and being carried down to the mouth of the river. Most fortunately, the posts did not become detached, and dragging along the bottom, helped to keep the hut in a fairly steady position, although every now and then it would be shaken in a most violent and extraordinary manner, and occasionally turned completely round. Knocking off some of the roofing, Julius thrust his head through, and shouted with all his strength as he saw through the blinding rain a group of woodcutters' huts on the bank. But no one heard him, and on went the humpy, shaking and bumping and swaying to and fro. As Julius continued to look about him, the rain suddenly ceased, and his heart leapt with joy when he saw that right ahead was a long, low point of land, and beyond that, and stretching across the river, several mangrove islets close together, and towards these the hut was drifting fast, and he determined that if it did not ground upon one of them, he would swim to the nearest to avoid being taken out to sea. Ten anxious minutes passed, and then the floating hut crashed into the trees on one of the islands, and stuck fast, but, curiously enough, now began to shake and heave about more than ever. Satisfied that he was now safe, and that he would soon be seen, Julius clambered out on the roof and looked about him. No habitation was visible, but he could see some horses and cattle about a mile away on the left-hand bank of the river, and as the sudden flood was now subsiding very rapidly, he decided to wait a few hours where he was, instead of trying to swim across, whilst the current was so strong, and perhaps be carried out over the shallow bar, or be seized by an alligator. In an hour the water had fallen quite two feet and Julius was eating some sandwiches when he noticed that, although the hut did not shake as it did before, the net, some loose folds of which he could see beneath him, was every now and then agitated in a peculiar manner, and that the folds were being drawn in against, not flowing out with, the current. Clambering down the other side of the roof, he looked beneath the flooring which was now many feet above the water, and noticed, swathed round and round in the folds of the net, a huge something which certainly moved, and then a chill of horror passed through him as he saw the protruding forearm of an alligator. For a moment or two the sight unnerved him, and he trembled. Then, hardly knowing what he was doing, he climbed the roof again, got his rifle, and descended to the ground, fired shot after shot into the monster, and a savage delight filled his veins as he saw it writhe and quiver as each heavy bullet ploughed its way into his carcass. In a few minutes it lay quiet and dead. Half an hour later a party of Chinese fishermen appeared in a boat, and the exultant Julius Adolphus struck a bargain with them for a pound and ten shillings to bring the Saurian to Townsville. He accompanied them, and a little after noon they landed at the steamer wharf, and the giant reptile, one of the largest ever seen in North Queensland, was hoisted up by a steam winch amidst a scene of the greatest excitement, and amongst the first to offer their sincere congratulations were Macpherson and Jimmy Badthirst. Followed by a cheering crowd, they marched to the Queen's Hotel, and there Julius Adolphus became the hero of the day, when, leaning his rifle against the bar, he called out, Come in, gentlemen, every one of you, and have as many drinks as you like. I am good for five sovereigns. 
A burst of applause greeted this welcome announcement, and the news spread like wildfire. Then the dead alligator was dragged by a pair of horses up to the hotel for exhibition, and Julius Adolphus' cup of happiness was full. McPherson took him aside. Go and change your clothes, Jenkins, and added with a twinkle in his eye, and don't bother about the bank today. Julius Adolphus, inwardly blessing him, took himself off, and within an hour was with Mary Brandon. On the following morning, the local herald contained an interesting item of news. We are happy to be in a position to state that Mr. Julius Adolphus Jenkins, of the Bank of North Australia, the hero of a thrilling adventure with an alligator, narrated on page three, will shortly lead to the altar Miss Mary Brandon, daughter of W. S. Brandon, Esquire, J. P., of this city. End of Julius Adolphus Jenkins' Christmas Alligator by Lewis Beck Read by David Wales The Mistletoe by Brian Waller Proctor Read in English This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. When winter nights grow long, and winds without blow cold, we sit in a ring round the warm wood fire and listen to stories old. And we try to look grave, as maids should be, when the men bring in boughs of the laurel tree. Oh, the laurel, the evergreen tree! The poets have laurels, and why not we? How pleasant, when the night falls down and hides the wintry sun, to see them come in to the blazing fire and know that their work is done, whilst many bring in, with a laugh or rhyme, green branches of holly for Christmas time. Oh, the holly, the bright green holly, it tells, like a tongue, that the times are jolly. Sometimes, in our grave house, observe, this happeneth not, but at times the evergreen laurel boughs, and the holly are all forgot. And then, what then, why the men laugh low, and hang up a branch of the mistletoe? Oh, brave is the laurel, and brave is the holly, but the mistletoe banisheth melancholy. Ah, nobody knows, nor shall ever know, what is done under the mistletoe. End of the Mistletoe by Brian Waller Proctor Read by Lucy Perry in Bath on November 6, 2011"'An Old-Fashioned Christmas' by Richard Marsh. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander "'An Old-Fashioned Christmas' A lively family will accept a gentleman as paying guest to join them in spending an old-fashioned Christmas in the heart of the country. That was the advertisement. It had its points. I was not sure what in this case an old-fashioned Christmas might happen to mean. I imagine there were several kinds of old-fashioned Christmases, but it could hardly be worse than a chop in my chambers, or horror of horrors, at the club, or my cousin Lucy's notion of what she calls the festive season. Festive? Yes, she and her husband, who suffers from melancholia, and all the other complaints which flesh is heir to, and I dragging through what I call a patent medicine dinner, and talking of everybody who is dead and gone, or else going, and of nothing else. So I wrote to the advertiser. The reply was written in a sprawling feminine hand. It was a little vague. It appeared that the terms would be five guineas, but there was no mention of the length of time which that fee would cover. I might arrive, it seemed, on Christmas Eve, but there was no hint as to when I was to go, if ever. The whole thing was a trifle odd. There was nothing said about the sort of accommodation 
which would be provided, nothing about the kind of establishment which was maintained, or the table which was kept. No references were offered or asked for. It was merely stated that we're a very lively family, and that if you're lively yourself you'll get on uncommonly well. The letter was signed Madge Wilson. Now it is a remarkable thing that I have always had an extraordinary predilection for the name Madge. I do not know why. I have never known a Madge, and yet from my boyhood upward I have desired to meet one. Here was an opportunity offered. She was apparently the careworn mother of a lively family. Under such circumstances she was hardly likely to be lively herself. But her name was Madge, and it was the accident of her Christian name which decided me to go. I had no illusions. No doubt the five guineas were badly wanted. Even a lively family would be hardly likely to advertise for a perfect stranger to spend Christmas with them if they were not. I did not expect a princely entertainment. Still, I felt that it could hardly be worse than a chop or cousin Lucy. The subjects of her conversation I never cared about when they were alive, and I certainly do not want to talk about them now they are dead. As for the pills and drops with which her husband doses himself between the courses, it makes me ill even to think of them. On Christmas Eve the weather was abominable. All night it had been blowing and raining. In the morning it began to freeze. By the time the streets were like so many skating rinks, it commenced to snow. And it kept on snowing. That turned out to be quite a record in the way of snowstorms. Hardly the sort of weather to start for an unknown destination in the heart of the country. But at the last moment I did not like to back out. I said I would go, and I meant to go. I had been idiot enough to load myself with a lot of Christmas presents, without the faintest notion why. I had not given a Christmas present for years. There had been no one to give them to. Lucy cannot bear such trifling, and her husband's only notion of a present at any time was a gallon jar of somebody's stomach-stirrer. I am no dealer in poisons. I knew nothing of the people I was going to. The youngest member of the family might be twenty, or the oldest ten. No doubt the things I had bought would be laughed at. Probably I should never venture to offer them. Still, if you have not tried your hand at that kind of thing for ever so long, the mere act of purchasing is a pleasure. That is a fact. I had never enjoyed shopping so much since I was a boy. I felt quite lively myself as I mingled with the Christmas crowd, looking for things which might not turn out to be absolutely preposterous. I even bought something for Madge, I mean Mrs. Wilson. Of course I knew that I had no right to do anything of the kind, and was aware that the chances were a hundred to one against my ever presuming to hint at its existence. I was actually ass enough to buy something for her husband, two things indeed, alternatives as it were, a box of cigars if he turned out to be a smoker, and a case of whisky if he didn't. I hoped to goodness that he would not prove to be a hypochondriac like Lucy's husband. I would not give him pills. What the lively family would think of a perfect stranger arriving burdened with rubbish, as if he had known them all their lives, I did not dare to think. No doubt they would set him down as a lunatic, right away. It was a horrible journey. The trains were late, and, of course, overcrowded. There was enough luggage in our compartment to have filled it, and still there was one more passenger than there ought to have been an ill-conditioned old fellow who wanted my hat-box put into the van because it happened to tumble off the rack on to his head. 
i pointed out to him that the rack was specially constructed for light luggage that a hat-box was light luggage and that if the train jolted he ought to blame the company not me he was impervious to reason his wrangling and jangling so upset me that i went past the station at which i ought to have changed then i had to wait three quarters of an hour for a train to take me back again only to find that i had missed the one i intended to catch so i had to cool my heels for two hours and a half in a wretched cowshed amidst a bitter whirling snowstorm it is some satisfaction for me to be able to reflect that i made it warm for the officials however cold i might have been myself when the train did start some forty minutes after scheduled time it jolted along in a laborious fashion at the rate of about six miles an hour stopping at every roadside hovel i counted seven in a distance i am convinced of less than twenty miles when at last i reached crofton my journey's end it turned out that the station staff consisted of a half-witted individual who was station master porter and clerk combined and a hulking lad who did whatever else there was to do no one had come to meet me the village was about half a mile and hangar dean the house for which my steps were bent about four miles by the road how far it was across ploughed fields my informant did not mention there was a trap at the boy and blunderbuss but that required fetching finally the hulking lad was dispatched it took him some time considering the distance was only about half a mile when the trap did appear it looked to me uncommonly like an open spring cart in it i was deposited with my luggage the snow was still descending in whirling clouds never shall i forget the drive in that miserable cart through the storm and those pitch-black country lanes we had been jogging along some time before the driver opened his mouth be you going to stop with a wilson's i am ay there was something in the tone of his ay which whetted my curiosity near the end of my tether though i was why do you ask it be about time as someone were to stay with them as were a bit capable like i did not know what he meant i did not ask i was beyond it i was chilled to the bone wet tired hungry i had long been wishing that an old-fashioned christmas had been completely extinct before i had thought of adventuring in quest of one better cousin lucy's notion of the festive season we passed through a gate which i had to get down to open along some sort of avenue suddenly the cart pulled up here we be that might be so it was a pity he did not add where here was there was a great shadow which possibly did duty for a house but if so there was not a light in any of the windows and there was nothing visible in the shape of a door the whereabouts of this however the driver presently made clear there be a the door in front of you you go up three steps if you can find em there's a knocker if none of em haven't twisted it off if they have there's a bell on your right if it isn't broken there appeared to be no knocker though whether it had been twisted off was more than i could say but there was a bell which creaked with rust though it was not broken i heard it tinkle in the distance no answer though i allowed a more than decent interval better ring again suggested the driver hard maybe they're up to some of their games and wants rousing was there a chuckle in the fellow's voice i rang again and again with all the force i could the bell reverberated through what seemed like an empty house is there no one in the place they're there right enough where's another thing maybe on the roof or in the cellar 
if they know you're coming perhaps they hear and don't choose to answer better ring again i sounded another peal presently feet were heard advancing along the passage several pairs it seemed and a light gleamed through the window over the door a voice inquired who's there mr christopher from london the information was greeted with what sounded uncommonly like a chorus of laughter there was a rush of retreating feet an expostulating voice then darkness again and silence who lives here are the people mad while well, thereabouts once more i suspected the driver of a chuckle my temper was rising i had not come all that way and subjected myself to so much discomfort to be played tricks with i told the bell again after a few seconds interval the pit-pat of what was obviously one pair of feet came towards the door again a light gleamed through the pane a key was turned a chain unfastened bolts withdrawn it seemed as if some one had to drag a chair forward before one of these latter could be reached after a vast amount of unfastening the door was opened and on the threshold there stood a girl with a lighted candle in her hand the storm rushed in she put up her hand to shield the light from danger can i see mrs wilson i'm expected i'm mr christopher from london oh that was all she said i looked at her she at me the driver's voice came from the background i drove him over from the station miss there be a lot of luggage he do say he's come to stay with you is that you tidy i'm afraid i can offer you nothing to drink we've lost the key of the cellar and there's nothing out except water and i don't think you'd care for that i can't say rightly as how i should miss next time we'll do be it all right the girl continued to regard me perhaps you'd better come inside i think i had i went inside it was time have you any luggage i admitted that i had perhaps it had better be brought in perhaps it had do you think that you could manage tidy the mare she'll stand still enough i should think i could miss by degrees my belongings were borne into the hall hidden under an envelope of snow the girl seemed surprised at their number the driver was paid the cart disappeared the door was shut the girl and i were alone together we didn't expect that you would come not expect me but it was all arranged i wrote to say that i would come did you not receive my letter we thought that you were joking joking why should you imagine that we were joking you were then i am to gather that i have been made the subject of a practical joke and that i am an intruder here well it's quite true that we did not think you were in earnest you see it's this way we're alone alone who are we well it will take a good while to explain and you look tired and cold i am both perhaps you're hungry i am i don't know what you can have to eat unless it's tomorrow's dinner tomorrow's dinner i stared can i see mrs wilson mrs wilson that's mamma she's dead i beg your pardon can i see your father oh father's been dead for years then to whom have i the pleasure of speaking i'm madge i'm mother now you are mother now the trouble will be about where you are to sleep unless it is with the boys the rooms are all anyhow and i'm sure i don't know where the beds are i suppose there are servants in the house she shook her head no the boys thought that they were nuisances so we got rid of them the last went yesterday she wouldn't do any work so we thought she'd better go 
Under those circumstances I think it probable that you were right. Then am I to understand that there are children? Rather. As she spoke there came a burst of laughter from the other end of the passage. I spun round. No one was in sight. She explained. They are waiting round the corner. Perhaps we'd better have them here. You people, you'd better come and let me introduce you to Mr. Christopher. A procession began to appear from round the corner of boys and girls. In front was a girl of about sixteen. She advanced with outstretched hand and an air of self-possession, which took me at a disadvantage. I'm Bessie. I'm sorry we kept you waiting at the door, but the fact is that we thought it was Eliza's brother who had come to insult us again. Pray don't mention it. I'm glad that it was not Eliza's brother. So am I. He's a dreadful man. I shook hands with the rest of them. There were six more, four boys and two girls. They formed a considerable congregation as they stood eyeing me with inquiring glances. Madge was the first to speak. I wondered all along if he would take it as a joke or not. And you see, he hasn't. I thought all the time that it was a risky thing to do. I like that. You keep your thoughts to yourself then. It was you proposed it. You said you'd been reading about something of the kind in a story, and you voted for our advertising ourselves for a lark. The speaker was the biggest boy, a good-looking youngster, with sallow cheeks and shrewd black eyes. But, Rupert, I never meant it to go so far as this. How far did you mean it to go, then? It was your idea all through. You sent in the advertisement, you wrote the letters, and now he's here. If you didn't mean it, why didn't you stop his coming? Rupert! The girl's cheeks were crimson. Bessie interposed. The thing is that, as he is here, it's no good worrying about whose fault it is. We shall simply have to make the best of it. Then to me. I suppose you really have come to stay? I confess that I had some notion of the kind to spend an old-fashioned Christmas. At this there was laughter, chiefly from the boys. Rupert exclaimed. A nice sort of old-fashioned Christmas you'll find it will be. You'll be sorry you came before it's through. I'm not so sure of that. There appeared to be something in my tone which caused a touch of silence to descend upon the group. They regarded each other doubtfully, as if in my words a reproof was implied. Bessie was again the spokeswoman. Of course, now that you have come, we mean to be nice to you, that is as nice as we can because the thing is that we are not in a condition to receive visitors do we look as if we were to be frank they did not even madge was a little unkempt while the boys were in what i believe is the average state of the average boy and murmured madge where is mr christopher to sleep what is he to eat inquired bessie she glanced at my packages. I suppose you have brought nothing with you? I am afraid I haven't. I had hoped to have found something ready for me on my arrival. Again they peeped at each other as if ashamed. Madge repeated her former suggestion. There's tomorrow's dinner. Oh, hang it! exclaimed Rupert. It's not so bad as that. There's a ham uncooked you can cut the steak off or whatever you call it and have it broiled a meal was got ready in the preparation of which every member of the family took a hand and a room was found for me in which was a blazing fire and traces of recent feminine occupation i suspected that madge had yielded her own apartment as a shelter for the stranger by the time i had washed and changed my clothes the impromptu dinner or supper or whatever it was was ready a curious repast it proved to be composed of oddly contrasted dishes cooked and sometimes uncooked in original fashion but hunger 
that piquant sauce gave it a relish of its own at first no one seemed disposed to join me by degrees however one after another found a knife and fork until all the eight were seated with me round the board eating some of them as if for dear life the fact is explained rupert we're a rum lot we hardly ever sit down together we don't have regular meals but whenever anyone feels peckish he goes and gets what there is and cooks it and eats it on his own it's not quite so bad as that protested madge though it's pretty bad it did seem pretty bad from the conventional point of view from their conversation which was candor itself i gleaned details which threw light upon the peculiar position of affairs it seemed that their father had been dead some seven years their mother who had been always delicate had allowed them to run nearly wild since she died some ten months back they appeared to have run quite wild the house with some six hundred acres of land was theirs and an income as to whose exact amount no one seemed quite clear it's about eight hundred a year said rupert i don't think it's quite so much doubted madge i'm sure it's more declared bessie i believe we're being robbed i thought it extremely probable they must have had peculiar parents their father had left everything absolutely to their mother and the mother in her turn everything in trust to madge to be shared equally among them all madge was an odd trustee in her hands the household had become a republic in which every one did exactly as he or she pleased the result was chaos no one wanted to go to school so no one went the servants finding themselves provided with eight masters and mistresses followed their example and did as they liked consequently after sundry battles royal lively episodes some of them had evidently been one after the other had been got rid of until now not one remained plainly the house must be going to rack and ruin but have you no relations i inquired rupert answered we've got some cousins or uncles or something of the kind in australia where so far as i'm concerned i hope they'll stop when i was in my room which i feared was madge's i told myself that it was a queer establishment on which i had lighted yet i could not honestly affirm that i was sorry i had come i had lived such an uneventful and such a solitary life and had so often longed for some one in whom to take an interest who would not talk medicine chest that to be plunged all at once into the centre of this troop of boys and girls was an accident which if only because of its novelty i found amusing and then it was so odd that i should have come across a match at last in the morning i was roused by noises the cause of which at first i could not understand by degrees the explanation dawned on me the family was putting the house to rights a somewhat noisy process it seemed some one was singing someone else was shouting and two or three others were engaged in a heated argument in such loud tones was it conducted that the gist of the matter travelled up to me how do you think i'm going to get this fire to burn if you beastly kids keep messing it about it's no good banging at it with a poker till it's alight the voice was unmistakably rupert's there was the sound of a scuffle cries of indignation then a girlish voice pouring oil upon the troubled waters presently there was a rattle and clatter as if some one had fallen from the top of the house to the bottom i rushed to my bedroom door what on earth has happened a small boy was outside peter he explained oh it's only the broom and dustpan gone to bogganing down the stairs it's bessie's fault she shouldn't leave them on the landing bessie appearing from a room opposite disclaimed responsibility i told you to look out where you were going but you never do 
I'd only put them down for a second while I went in to empty a jug of water on to Jack, who won't get out of bed, and there are all the boots for him to clean. Injured tones came through the open portal. You wait, that's all. I'll soak your bed tonight. I'll drown it. I don't want to clean your dirty boots. I'm not a shoe black. The breakfast was a failure. To begin with, it was inordinately late. It seemed that a bath was not obtainable. I had been promised some hot water, but as I waited and waited, and none arrived, I proceeded to break the ice in my jug. It was a bitterly cold morning, nice old-fashioned weather, and to wash in the half-frozen contents. As I am not accustomed to perform my ablutions in partially dissolved ice, I fear that the process did not improve my temper. It was past eleven when I got down, feeling not exactly in a Christmassy frame of mind. Everything and everyone seemed at sixes and sevens. It was afternoon when the breakfast appeared. The principal dish consisted of eggs and bacon, but as the bacon was fried to cinders, and the eggs all broken, it was not so popular as it might have been. Madge was moved to melancholy. "'Something will have to be done.' We can't go on like this. We must have someone in to help us. Bessie was sarcastic. You might give Eliza another trial. She told you if you didn't like the way she burnt the bacon, to burn it yourself, and as you followed her advice, she might be able to give you other useful hints on similar lines. Rupert indulged himself in the same vein. Then there's Eliza's brother. He threatened to knock your blooming head off for saying Eliza was dishonest, just because she collared everything she laid her hands on. He might turn out a useful sort of creature to have about the place. It's all very well for you to laugh, but it's beyond a jest. I don't know how we're going to cook the dinner. Can I be of any assistance? I inquired. First of all, what is there to cook? It seemed that there were a good many things to cook. A turkey, a goose, beef, plum pudding, mince pies, custard, sardines. It seemed that Molly, the third girl, as she phrased it, could live on sardines. And esteemed no dinner, a decent dinner at which they did not appear, together with a list of etc. half as long as my arm. One thing is clear. You can't cook all those things today. We can't cook anything. This was Rupert. He was tilting his chair back, and had his face turned towards the ceiling. Why not? Because there's no coal. No coal? There's about half a scuttle full of dust. If you can make it burn, you'll be clever. What Rupert said was correct. Madge confessed with crimson cheeks that she had meant, over and over again, to order some coal, but had continually forgotten it, until finally Christmas Day had found them with an empty cellar. There was plenty of wood, but it was not so dry as it might have been, and anyhow the grate was not constructed to burn wood. "'You might try smoked beef,' suggested Rupert. When that wood goes at all, it smokes like one o'clock. If you hung the beef up over it, it would be smoked enough for any one by the time that it was done. I began to rub my chin. Considering the breakfast we had had, from my point of view the situation commenced for the first time to look really grave. I wondered if it would not be possible to take the whole eight somewhere where something really eatable could be got but when I broached the subject I learned that the thing could not be done. The nearest hostelry was the boy and blunderbuss, and it was certain that nothing eatable could be had there, even if accommodation could be found for us all. Nothing in the shape of a possible house of public entertainment was to be found closer than the market town, eight miles off. It was unlikely that even there a Christmas dinner for nine could be provided at a moment's notice. Evidently the only thing to do was to make the best of things. 
When the meeting broke up, Madge came and said a few words to me alone. "'I really think you had better not stay.' "'Does that mean that you had rather I went?' "'No, not exactly that.' "'Then nearly that?' "'No, not a bit that. Only you must see for yourself how awfully uncomfortable you'll be here, and what a horrid house this is.' "'My dear Madge,' everybody called her Madge, so I did, even if I wanted to go, which I don't and I would remind you that you contracted to give me an old-fashioned Christmas. I don't see where there is that I could go. Of course, there's that. I don't see either. So I suppose you'll have to stay. But I hope you won't think that I meant you to come to a place like this. Really, you know. I'm sorry. I had hoped you had. That's not what I mean. I mean that if I had thought that you were coming, I would have seen that things were different. How different? I assure you that things as they are have a charm of their own. That's what you say. You don't suppose that I'm so silly as not to know you're laughing at me. But as I was the whole cause of your coming, I hope you won't hate the others because of me. She marched off, brushing back with an impatient gesture some rebellious locks which had strayed upon her forehead. That Christmas dinner was a success, positively, of a kind, let that be clearly understood. I am not inferring that it was a success from the point of view of a chef de cuisine. Not at all. How could it be? Quite the other way by dint of ransacking all the rooms and emptying all the scuttles, we collected a certain amount of coal, with which, after adding a fair proportion of wood, we managed. Not brilliantly, but after a fashion. I can only say, personally, I had not enjoyed myself so much for years. I really felt as if I were young again. I'm not sure that I'm not younger than I thought I was. I must look the matter up. And after all, even if one be, say, forty, one need not be absolutely an ancient. Madge herself said that I had been like a right hand to her. She did not know what she would have done without me. Looking back, I cannot but think that if we had attempted to prepare fewer dishes, something might have been properly cooked. It was a mistake to stuff the turkey with sage and onions, but, as Bessie did not discover, that she had been manipulating the wrong bird until the process of stuffing had been completed, it was felt that it might be just as well to let it rest. Unfortunately, it turned out that some thyme, parsley, mint, and other things had got mixed up with the sage, which gave the creature quite a peculiar flavour. But as it came to table nearly raw, and as tough as hickory, it really did not matter. My experience of that day teaches me that it is not easy to roast a large goose on a small oil stove. The dropping fat caused the flame to give out a strong smelling and a most unpleasant smoke. Rupert, who had charge of the operation, affirmed that it would be all right in the end. But by the time the thing was served, it was as black as my hat. Rupert said that it was merely brown, but the brown was of a sooty hue, and it reeked of paraffin. We had to have it deposited in the ash bin. I dare say that the beef would not have been bad if someone had occasionally turned it, and if the fire would have burned clear. As it was, it was charred on one side, and raw on the other, and smoked all over. The way in which the odour and taste of smoke permeated everything was amazing. The plum pudding came to the table in the form of soup, and the mince pies were nauseous. Something had got into the crust, or mincemeat or something, which there, at any rate, was out of place. Luckily we came upon a tin of corned beef in a cupboard, and with the aid of some bread and cheese, and other odds and ends, we made a sort of picnic. 
incredible though it may seem, I enjoyed it. If there was anywhere a merrier party than we were, I should like to know where it was to be found. It must have been a merry one. When I produced the presence in which a happy inspiration had urged me to invest, the enthusiasm reached a climax. I believe that is the proper form of words which I ought to use. As I watched the pleasure of those youngsters, I felt as if I were myself a boy again. That was my first introduction to a lively family. They came up to the description they had given of themselves. I speak from knowledge, for they have been my acquaintances now some time. More than acquaintances, friends, the dearest friends I have. At their request I took their affairs in hand, Madge informally passing her trusteeship on to me. Things are very different with them now. The house is spick and span. There is an excellent staff of servants. Hanger Dean is as comfortable a home as there is in England. I have spent many a happy Christmas under its hospitable roof since then. The boys are out in the world, after passing with honour through school and college. The girls are going out into the world also. Bessie is actually married. Madge is married too. She is Mrs. Christopher. That is the part of it all which I find is hardest to understand, to have told myself my whole life long that the name of my ideal woman would be Madge, and to have won that woman for my own at last. That is greater fortune than falls to the lot of most men. I thought that I was beyond that kind of thing, that I was too old. But Madge seemed to think that I was young enough, and she thinks so still. And now there is a little Madge, who is big enough to play havoc with the sheets of paper on which I have been scribbling, to whom one day this tale will have to be told. End of an Old Fashioned Christmas by Richard Marsh Read by Lars Rolander A Picture of the Nativity by Fra Filippo Lippi by Vernon Lee Read in English This is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Picture of the Nativity by Fra Filippo Lippi by Vernon Lee As explained by a pious Florentine gossip of his day. Quote, now I cannot confirm that things did really take place in this manner, but it greatly pleases me to think that they did. Unquote. Fra Domenico Cavalca, Life of the Magdalene. The silly folks do not at all understand about the birth of our Lord. They say that our Lord was born at Bethlehem, and because the inns were all full, owing to certain feasts kept by those Jews, in a stable. But I tell you this is an error, and due to little sense, for our Lord was indeed placed in a manger, because none of the hostelries would receive Joseph and the Blessed Virgin but it took place differently. For you must know that beyond Bethlehem, which is a big village, walled and moated, of those parts lies a hilly country, exceeding wild, and covered with dense woods of firs, pines, larches, beeches, and similar trees, which the people of Bethlehem cut down at times, going in bands, and burned charcoal, packing it on mules, to sell in the valley, or tie together whole trunks, such as serve for beams, rafters, and masts, and float them down the rivers, which are many and very rapid. In these mountains, then, in the thickest part of the woods, a certain man of the woodcutting trade bethought him to build a house wherein to store the timber and live, himself and his family, when it so pleased him, and to keep his beasts. And for this purpose he employed certain pillars and pieces of masonry that stood in the forest, being remains of a temple of the heathen, the which had long ceased to exist. And he cleared the wood around about, 
leaving only tree stumps and bushes and close by in a ravine between high fir trees ran a river always full to the brim even in midsummer owing to the melting snows and of greenish waters cold and rapid exceedingly and around uphill and down dale stretched the wood of firs larches pines and other noble and useful trees emitting a very pleasant and virtuous fragrance the man thought to enjoy his house and came with his family and servants and horses and mules and oxen which he had employed to carry down the timber and charcoal but scarcely were they settled than an earthquake rent the place tearing wall from wall and pillar from pillar and a voice was heard in the air crying ecce domus domini dei whereupon they fled astonished and in terror and returned into the town and no one of that man's family ventured henceforth to return to that wood or to that house save one called hilarion a poor lad and a servant but of upright heart and faith in the lord which offered to go back and take his abode there and cut down the trees and burn the charcoal for his master so he went being a poor lad and poorly clad in a leather tunic and coarse serge hood and hilarion took with him an ox and an ass to load with charcoal and drive down to bethlehem to his master and the first night that hilarion slept in that house which was fallen to ruin only a piece of roof remaining which he thatched with pine branches he heard voices singing in the air as of children both boys and maidens but he closed his eyes and repeated a paternoster and turned over and slept and again another night he heard voices and knew the house to be haunted and trembled but being clear of heart he said two aves and went to sleep and once more did he hear voices and they were passing sweet and with them came a fragrance as of crushed herbs and many kinds of flowers and frankincense and orris root and hilarion shook for he feared lest it be the heathen gods mercury or macomet or apollonus but he said his prayer and slept but at length one night as hilarion heard those songs as usual he opened his eyes and behold the place was light and a great staircase of light like golden cobwebs stretched up to heaven and there were angels going about in numbers coming and going with locks like honeycomb and dresses pink and green and sky blue and white thickly embroidered with purest pearls and wings as of butterflies and peacock's tails with glories of solid gold about their head and they went to and fro carrying garlands and strewing flowers so that although midwinter it was like a garden in june so sweet of roses and lilies and gillyflowers and the angels sang and when they had finished their work they said it is well and departed holding hands and flying into the sky above the fir trees and hilarion wondered greatly and said five potters and six aves and the next day as he was cutting a fir tree in the wood there met him among the rocks a man old venerable with a long gray beard and a solemn air and he was clad in crimson and under his arm he carried written books and a scourge and hilarion said who art thou for this forest is haunted by spirits and i would know whether thou be of them or of men and the ancient made answer my name is hieronymus i am a wise man and a king i have spent all my days learning the secrets of things i know how the trees grow and waters run and where treasure lies and i can teach thee what the stars sing and in what manner the ruby and the emeralds are smelted in the bowels of the earth and i can chain the winds and stop the sun for i am wise above all men but i seek one wiser than myself and go through the woods in search of him my master and hilarion said tarry thou here and thou shalt see if i mistake not him whom thou seekest so the old man whose name was hieronymus tarried in the forest and built himself a hut of stones and the day after that as hilarion went forth to catch fish in the river he met on the bank a lady beautiful beyond compare the which for all clothing wore only her own hair golden and exceeding long and hilarion asked who art thou 
for this forest is haunted by spirits and i would know whether thou art one of such and of evil intent as the demon venus or a woman like the mother who bore me and the lady answered my name is magdalen i am a princess and a courtesan and the fairest woman that ever be all day the princes and kings of the earth have brought gifts to my house and hung wreaths on my roof and strewn flowers in my yard and the poets all day have sung to their lutes and have all lain groaning at my gates at night for i am beautiful beyond all creatures but i seek one more beautiful than myself and go searching my master by the lakes and the rivers and hilarion made answer tarry thou here and thou shalt see if i mistake not him whom thou seekest and the lady whose name was magdalen tarried by the river and built herself a cabin of reeds and leaves and that night was the longest and coldest of the winter and hilarion made for himself a bed of fern and hay in the stable of the ox and the ass and lay close to them for warmth and lo in the middle of the night the ass brayed and the ox bellowed and hilarion started up and he saw the heavens open with a great brightness as of beaten and fretted gold and angels coming and going and holding each other by the hand and wreathed in roses and singing gloria in excelsis deo and a terra pax hominibus boni voluntatis and hilarion wondered and said ten potters and ten aves and that day towards noon there came through the wood one bearing a staff and leading a mule on which was seated a woman that was near unto her hour and moaning piteously and they were poor folk and travel-stained and the man said to hilarion my name is joseph I am a carpenter from the city of Nazareth, and my wife is called Mary, and she is in travail. Suffer thou us to rest, and my wife to lie on the straw of the stable. And Hilarion said, You are welcome. Benedictus qui venit in nomine domini. And Hilarion laid down more fern and hay, and gave provender to the mule. And the woman's hour came, and she was delivered of a male child. And Hilarion took it, and laid it in the manger and he went forth into the woods and found the ancient wizard hieronymus and the lady magdalen and said come with me to the ruined house for truly there is he whom you be seeking and they followed him to the ruined house where the fir trees were cleared above the river and they saw the babe lying in the manger and hieronymus and magdalen kneeled down saying surely this is he that is our master for he is wiser and more fair than either. And the skies opened, and there came forth angels, such as Hilarion had seen, with glories of solid gold round their heads, and garlands of roses about their necks. And they took hands, and danced, and sang, flying up, Gloria in excelsis Deo. End of A Picture of the Nativity by Fra Filippo Lippi by Vernon Lee Reginald on Christmas Presents by Saki, read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I wish it to be distinctly understood, said Reginald, that I don't want a George, Prince of Wales, prayer book as a Christmas present. The fact cannot be too widely known. There ought, he continued, to be technical education classes on the science of present giving. No one seems to have the faintest notion of what anyone else wants, and the prevalent ideas on the subject are not creditable to a civilized community. There is, for instance, the female relative in the country who knows a tie is always useful, and sends you some spotted horror that you could only wear in secret or in Tottingham Court Road. It might have been useful had she kept it to tie up currant bushes with, when it would have served the double purpose of supporting the branches and frightening away the birds. For it is an admitted fact that the ordinary tomtit of commerce has a sounder aesthetic taste than the average female relative in the country. Then there are aunts. 
They are always a difficult class to deal with in the matter of presents. The trouble is that one never catches them really young enough. By the time one has educated them to an appreciation of the fact that one does not wear red woollen mittens in the West End, they die, or quarrel with the family, or do something equally inconsiderate. That is why the supply of trained aunts is always so precarious. There is my Aunt Agatha, par example, who sent me a pair of gloves last Christmas, and even got so far as to choose a kind that was being worn and had the correct number of buttons. But they were nines. I sent them to a boy whom I hated intimately. He didn't wear them, of course, but he could have. That was where the bitterness of death came in. It was nearly as consoling as sending white flowers to his funeral. Of course I wrote and told my aunt that they were the one thing that had been wanting to make existence blossom like a rose. I'm afraid she thought me frivolous. She comes from the north, where they live in the fear of heaven and the Earl of Durham. Reginald affects an exhaustive knowledge of things political, which furnishes an excellent excuse for not discussing them. Aunts with a dash of foreign extraction in them are the most satisfactory in the way of understanding these things, but if you can't choose your aunt, it is wisest in the long run to choose the present and send her the bill. Even friends of one's own set, who might be expected to know better, have curious delusions on the subject. I am not collecting copies of the cheaper editions of Omar Khayyam. I gave the last four that I received to the lift boy, and I like to think of him reading them, with Fitzgerald's notes, to his aged mother. Lift boys always have aged mothers. Shows such nice feelings on their part, I think. Personally, I can't see where the difficulty in choosing suitable presents lies. No boy who had brought himself up properly could fail to appreciate one of those decorative bottles of liqueurs that are so reverently staged in Morrill's window, and it wouldn't in the least matter if one did get duplicates. And there would always be the supreme moment of dreadful uncertainty whether it was creme de menthe or chartreuse, like the expectant thrill on seeing your partner's hand turned up at bridge. People may say what they like about the decay of Christianity— the religious system that produced green chartreuse can never really die. And then, of course, there are liqueur glasses, and crystallized fruits, and tapestry curtains, and heaps of other necessaries of life that make really sensible presents, not to speak of luxuries, such as having one's bills paid, or getting something quite sweet in the way of jewellery. Unlike the alleged good woman of the Bible, I am not above rubies, when found, by the way, she must have been rather a problem at Christmas time. Nothing short of a blank check would have fitted the situation. Perhaps it's as well that she's died out. The great charm about me, concluded Reginald, is that I am so easily pleased. But I draw the line at a Prince of Wales prayer book. End of Reginald on Christmas Presents by Saki Recording by Bob Gonzalez Reginald's Christmas Revel by Saki Read in English This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org They say, said Reginald, that there's nothing sadder than victory except defeat. If you've ever stayed with dull people during what is alleged to be the festive season, you can probably revise that saying. I shall never forget putting in a Christmas at the Babwolds. Mrs. Babwold is some relation of my father's, a sort of to-be-left-till-called-for cousin, and that was considered sufficient reason for my having to accept her invitation at about the sixth time of asking though why the sins of the father should be visited by the children you won't find any note-paper in that drawer that's where i keep old menus and first night programmes mrs babwold wears a rather solemn personality and has never been known to smile even when saying disagreeable things to her friends or making out the stores list she takes her pleasures sadly a state elephant at durbar gives one a very similar impression 
her husband gardens in all weathers when a man goes out in the pouring rain to brush caterpillars off rose trees i generally imagine his life indoors leaves something to be desired anyway it must be very unsettling for the caterpillars of course there were some other people there there was a major somebody who had shot things in lapland or somewhere of that sort i forget what they were but it wasn't for want of reminding we had them cold with every meal almost and he was continually giving us details of what they measured from tip to tip as though he thought we were going to make them warm under things for the winter i used to listen to him with a rapt attention that i thought rather suited me and then one day i quite modestly gave the dimensions of an okapi i had shot in the lincolnshire fens the major turned a beautiful tyrian scarlet i remember thinking at the time that i should like my bathroom hung in that colour and i think that at that moment he almost found it in his heart to dislike me mrs babwold put on a first aid to the injured expression and asked him why he didn't publish a book of his sporting reminiscences it would be so interesting she didn't remember till afterwards that he had given her two fat volumes on the subject with his portrait and autograph as a frontispiece and an appendix on the habits of the arctic muscle it was in the evening that we cast aside the cares and distractions of the day and really lived cards were thought to be too frivolous and empty a way of passing the time so most of them played what they called a book game you went out into the hall to get an inspiration i suppose then you came in again with a muffler tied round your neck and looked silly and the others were supposed to guess that you were wee macgregor i held out against the inanity as long as i decently could but at last in a lapse of good nature i consented to masquerade as a book only i warned them that it would take some time to carry out they waited for the best part of forty minutes while i went and played wine-glass skittles with the page-boy in the pantry you play it with a champagne cork you know and the one who knocks down the most glasses without breaking them wins i won with four unbroken out of seven i think william suffered from over-anxiousness they were rather mad in the drawing-room at my not having come back and they weren't a bit pacified when i told them afterwards that i was at the end of the passage i never did like kipling was mrs babwold's comment when the situation dawned upon her i couldn't see anything clever in earthworms out of tuscany or is that by darwin of course these games are very educational but personally i prefer bridge on christmas evening we were supposed to be specially festive in the old english fashion the hall was horribly draughty but it seemed to be the proper place to revel in and it was decorated with japanese fans and chinese lanterns which gave it a very old english effect a young lady with a confidential voice favoured us with a long recitation about a little girl who died or did something equally hackneyed and then the major gave us a graphic account of a struggle he had with a wounded bear i privately wished that the bears would win sometimes on these occasions at least they wouldn't go vapouring about it afterwards before we had time to recover our spirits we were indulged with some thought-reading by a young man whom one knew instinctively had a good mother and an indifferent tailor the sort of young man who talks unflaggingly through the thickest soup and smooths his hair dubiously as though he thought it might hit back the thought-reading was rather a success he announced that the hostess was thinking about poetry and she admitted that her mind was dwelling on one of austin's odes which was near enough i fancy she had been really wondering whether a scrag end of mutton and some cold plum pudding would do for the kitchen dinner next day as a crowning dissipation they all sat down to play progressive halma with milk chocolate for prizes i've been carefully brought up and i don't like to play games of skill for milk chocolate so i invented a headache and retired from the scene i had been preceded a few minutes earlier by miss langshan smith a rather formidable lady who always got up at some uncomfortable hour in the morning and gave you the impression that she had been in communication with most of the european governments before breakfast there was a paper pinned on her door with a signed request that she might be called particularly early on the morrow 
such an opportunity does not come twice in a lifetime i covered up everything except the signature with another notice to the effect that before these words should meet the eye she would have ended a misspent life was sorry for the trouble she was giving and would like a military funeral a few minutes later i violently exploded an air-filled paper bag on the landing and gave a stage moan that could have been heard in the cellars then i pursued my original intention and went to bed the noise those people made in forcing open the good lady's door was positively indecorous she resisted gallantly but i believe they searched her for bullets for about a quarter of an hour as if she had been an historic battlefield i hate travelling on boxing day but one must occasionally do things that one dislikes end of reginald's christmas revel by saki recording by bob gonzales Santa Claus Anonymous. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. He comes in the night, he comes in the night, he softly, silently comes, while the little brown heads on the pillows so white are dreaming of bugles and drums. He cuts through the snow like a ship through the foam, while the white flakes around him whirl. Who tells him I know not, but he findeth the home of each good little boy and girl. His sleigh it is long and deep and wide. It will carry a host of things, while dozens of drums hang over the side with the sticks sticking under the strings. And yet, not the sound of a drum is heard not a bugle blast is blown as he mounts to the chimney top like a bird and drops to the hearth like a stone the little red stockings he silently fills till the stockings will hold no more the bright little sleds for the great snow hills are quickly set down on the floor then santa claus mounts to the roof like a bird and glides to his seat in the sleigh not the sound of a bugle or drum is heard as he noiselessly gallops away he rides to the east and he rides to the west of his goodies he touches not one he eateth the crumbs of the christmas feast when the dear little folks are done Old Santa Claus doeth all that he can. This beautiful mission is his. Then, children, be good to the little old man when you find who the little man is. End of Santa Claus by an anonymous author. Read by Ruth Golding, Christmas 2011. Santa Claus at Simpson's Bar by Bret Hart Read in English This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It was nearly midnight when the festivities were interrupted. Hush, said Dick Bullen, holding up his hand. It was the querulous voice of Johnny from his adjacent closet. Oh, Dad! The old man rose hurriedly and disappeared in the closet. Presently he reappeared. His rheumatiz is come on again bad, he explained, and he wants rubbin'. He lifted the demijohn of whiskey from the table and shook it. It was empty. Dick Bullen put down his tin cup with an embarrassed laugh. So did the others. The old man examined their contents and said, hopefully, I reckon that's enough. He don't need much. You hold on, all of you, for a spell, and I'll be back. And vanished in the closet with an old flannel shirt and the whiskey. The door closed but imperfectly, and the following dialogue was distinctly audible. Now, sonny, where does she ache worst? 
sometimes over yar and sometimes under yer but it's most powerful from year to year rub yer dad a silence seemed to indicate a brisk rubbing then johnny having a good time out yer dad yes sonny tomorrow's christmas ain't it yes sonny how does she feel now better rub a little further down what's christmas anyway what's it all about oh it's a day this exhaustive definition was apparently satisfactory for there was a silent interval of rubbing presently johnny again mare says that everywhere else but here everybody gives things to everybody christmas and then she just waded into you she says there's a man they call sandy claus not a white man you know but a kind of chinaman comes down the chimbley night afore christmas and gives things to chillern boys like me puts em in their boots that's what she tried to play upon me easy now pop where are you rubbin to that's a mile from the place she just made that up didn't she just to aggravate me and you don't rub thar why dad in the great quiet that seemed to have fallen upon the house the sigh of the near pines and the drip of leaves without was very distinct johnny's voice too was lowered as he went on don't you take on now for i'm getting all right fast what's the boys doing out there the old man partly opened the door and peered through his guests were sitting there sociably enough and there were a few silver coins and a lean buckskin purse on the table bettin on suthin some little game or nother they're all right he replied to johnny and recommenced his rubbing i'd like to take a hand and win some money said johnny reflectively after a pause the old man repeated what was evidently a familiar formula that if johnny would wait until he struck it rich in the tunnel he'd have lots of money etc etc yes said johnny but you don't and whether you strike it or i win it it's about the same it's all luck but it's mighty curious about christmas ain't it why do they call it christmas perhaps from some instinctive deference to the overhearing of his guests or from some vague sense of incongruity the old man's reply was so low as to be inaudible beyond the room yes said johnny with some slight abatement of interest i've heard of him before thar that'll do dad i don't ache near so bad as i did now wrap me tight in this yer blanket so now he added in a muffled whisper sit down here by me till i go to sleep to assure himself of obedience he disengaged one hand from the blanket and grasping his father's sleeve again composed himself to rest for some moments the old man waited patiently then the unwonted stillness of the house excited his curiosity and without moving from the bed he cautiously opened the door with his disengaged hand and looked into the main room to his infinite surprise it was dark and deserted but even then a smouldering log on the hearth broke and by the upspringing blaze he saw the figure of dick bullen sitting by the dying embers hello dick started rose and came somewhat unsteadily towards him where's the boys said the old man gone up the canyon on a little passier they're coming back for me in a minute i'm waiting around for them what are you staring at old man he added with a forced laugh do you think i'm drunk the old man had been pardoned the supposition for dick's eyes were humid and his face flushed he loitered and lounged back to the chimney yawned shook himself buttoned up his coat and laughed liquor ain't so plenty as that old man now don't you get up he continued as the old man made a movement to release his sleeve from johnny's hand don't you mind manners sit just where you are i'm goin in a jiffy lar that's them now there was a low tap at the door dick bullen opened it quickly nodded good night to his host and disappeared the old man would have followed him but for the hand that still unconsciously grasped his sleeve he could have easily disengaged it it was small weak and emaciated 
but perhaps because it was small weak and emaciated he changed his mind and drawing his chair closer to the bed rested his head upon it in this defenceless attitude the potency of his earlier potations surprised him the room flickered and faded before his eyes reappeared faded again went out and left him asleep meanwhile dick bullen closing the door confronted his companions are you ready said staples ready said dick what's the time past twelve was the reply can you make it it's nigh on fifty miles the round trip hither and yon i reckon returned dick shortly where's the mare bill and jack's holdin her at the crossing let em hold on a minute longer said dick he turned and re-entered the house softly by the light of the guttering candle and dying fire he saw that the door of the little room was open he stepped toward it on tiptoe and looked in the old man had fallen back in his chair snoring his helpless feet thrust out in a line with his collapsed shoulders and his hat pulled over his eyes beside him on a narrow wooden bedstead lay johnny muffled tightly in a blanket that hid all save a strip of forehead and a few curls damp with perspiration dick bullen made a step forward hesitated and glanced over his shoulder into the deserted room everything was quiet with a sudden resolution he parted his huge moustaches with both hands and stooped over the sleeping boy but even as he did so a mischievous blast lying in wait swooped down the chimney rekindled the hearth and lit up the room with a shameless glow from which dick fled in bashful terror his companions were already waiting for him at the crossing two of them were struggling in the darkness with some strange misshapen bulk which as dick came nearer took the semblance of a great yellow horse it was the mare she was not a pretty picture from her roman nose to her rising haunches from her arched spine hidden by the stiff machilas of a mexican saddle to her thick straight bony legs there was not a line of equine grace in her half-blind but wholly vicious white eyes in her protruding underlip in her monstrous colour there was nothing but ugliness and vice now then said staples stand clear of her heels boy and up with you don't miss your first bolt of her mane and mind you get your off stirrup quick ready there was a leap a scrambling a bound a wild retreat of the crowd a circle of flying hooves two springless leaps that jarred the earth a rapid play and jingle of spurs a plunge and then the voice of dick somewhere in the darkness all right don't take the lower road back unless you're pushed hard for time don't hold her in downhill we'll be at the ford at five clang hoopa mula go a splash a spark struck from the ledge in the road a clatter in the rocky cut beyond and dick was gone sing o muse the ride of richard bullen sing o muse of chivalrous men the sacred quest the doughty deeds the battery of low churls the fearsome ride and gruesome perils of the flower of simpson's bar alack she is dainty this muse she will have none of this bucking brute and swaggering ragged rider and i must fain follow him in prose afoot it was one o'clock and yet he had only gained rattlesnake hill for in that time hovita had rehearsed to him all her imperfections and practised all her vices thrice had she stumbled twice had she thrown up her roman nose in a straight line with the reins and resisting bit and spur struck out madly across country twice had she reared and rearing fallen backward and twice had the agile dick unharmed regained his seat before she found her vicious legs again and a mile beyond them at the foot of a long hill was rattlesnake creek dick knew that here was the crucial test of his ability to perform his enterprise set his teeth grimly put his knees well into her flanks and changed his defensive tactics to brisk aggression bullied and maddened hovita began the descent of the hill here the artful richard pretended to hold her in with ostentatious objurgation and well-feigned cries of alarm it is unnecessary to add that hovita instantly ran away nor need i state the time made in the descent it is written in the chronicles of simpson's bar 
enough that in another moment as it seemed to dick she was splashing on the overflowed banks of rattlesnake creek as dick expected the momentum she had acquired carried her beyond the point of balking and holding her well together for a mighty leap they dashed into the middle of the swiftly flowing current a few moments of kicking wading and swimming and dick drew a long breath on the opposite bank the road from rattlesnake creek to red mountain was tolerably level either the plunge into rattlesnake creek had dampened her baleful fire or the art which led to it had shown her the superior wickedness of her rider for hovita no longer wasted her surplus energy in wanton conceits once she bucked but it was from force of habit once she shied but it was from a new freshly painted meeting-house at the crossing of the country road hollows ditches gravelly deposits patches of freshly springing grasses flew from beneath her rattling hoofs she began to smell unpleasantly once or twice she coughed slightly but there was no abatement of her strength or speed by two o'clock she had passed red mountain and begun the descent to the plain ten minutes later the driver of the fast pioneer coach was overtaken and passed by a man on a pinto hoss an event sufficiently notable for remark at half past two dick rose in his stirrups with a great shout stars were glittering through the rifted clouds and beyond him out of the plain rose two spires a flagstaff and a straggling line of black objects dick jingled his spurs and swung his riata hovita bounded forward and in another moment they swept into tuttleville and drew up before the wooden piazza of the hotel of all nations what transpired that night at tuttleville is not strictly a part of this record briefly i may state however that after hovita had been handed over to a sleepy ostler whom she at once kicked into unpleasant consciousness dick sallied out with the barkeeper for a tour of the sleeping town lights still gleamed from a few saloons and gambling houses but avoiding these they stopped before several closed shops and by persistent tapping and judicious outcry roused the proprietors from their beds and made them unbar the doors of their magazines and expose their wares sometimes they were met by curses but oftener by interest and some concern in their needs it was three o'clock before this pleasantry was given over and with a small waterproof bag of india rubber strapped on his shoulders dick returned to the hotel and then he sprang to the saddle and dashed down the lonely street and out into the lonelier plain where presently the lights the black line of houses the spires and the flagstaff sank into the earth behind him again and were lost in the distance the storm had cleared away the air was brisk and cold the outlines of adjacent landmarks were distinct but it was half past four before dick reached the meeting-house and the crossing of the country road to avoid the rising grade he had taken a longer and more circuitous road in whose viscid mud hovita sank fetlock deep at every bound it was a poor preparation for a steady ascent of five miles more but hovita gathering her legs under her took it with her usual blind unreasoning fury and a half hour later reached the long level that led to rattlesnake creek another half hour would bring him to the creek he threw the reins lightly upon the neck of the mare chirruped to her and began to sing suddenly hovita shied with a bound that would have unseated a less practised rider hanging to her rein was a figure that had leaped from the bank and at the same time from the road before her arose a shadowy horse and rider throw up your hands commanded the second apparition with an oath dick felt the mare tremble quiver and apparently sink under him he knew what it meant and was prepared stand aside jack simpson i know you you damned thief let me pass or he did not finish the sentence hovita rose straight in the air and with a terrific bound throwing the figure from her bit with a single shake of her vicious head and charged with deadly malevolence down on the impediment before her an oath a pistol shot horse and highwaymen rolled over in the road and the next moment hovita was a hundred yards away but the good right arm of her rider shattered by a bullet dropped helplessly at his side without slacking his speed he lifted the reins to his left hand but a few moments later he was obliged to halt and tighten the saddle girths that had slipped in the onset this in his crippled condition took some time 
he had no fear of pursuit but looking up he saw that the eastern stars were already paling and that the distant peaks had lost their ghostly whiteness and now stood out blackly against the lighter sky day was upon him then completely absorbed in a single idea he forgot the pain of his wound and mounting again dashed on towards rattlesnake creek but now jovita's breath came broken by gasps dick reeled in his saddle and brighter and brighter grew the sky ride richard run jovita linger o oh day for the last few rods there was a roaring in his ears was it exhaustion from a loss of blood or what he was dazed and giddy as he swept down the hill and did not recognize his surroundings had he taken the wrong road or was this rattlesnake creek it was but the brawling creek he had swum a few hours before had risen more than doubled its volume and now rolled a swift and resistless river between him and rattlesnake hill for the first time that night richard's heart sank within him the river the mountain the quickening east swam before his eyes he shut them to recover his self-control in that brief interval by some fantastic mental process the little room at simpson's bar and the figures of the sleeping father and son rose upon him he opened his eyes wildly cast off his coat pistol boots and saddle bound his precious pack tightly to his shoulders grasped the bare flanks of jovita with his bared knees and with a shout dashed into the yellow water a cry arose from the opposite bank as the head of a man and horse struggled for a few moments against the battling current and then were swept away amidst uprooted trees and whirling driftwood the old man started and woke the fire on the hearth was dead the candle in the outer room flickering in its socket and somebody was rapping at the door he opened it but fell back with a cry before the dripping half-naked figure that reeled against the doorpost dick hush is he awake yet no but dick dry up you old fool get me some whiskey quick the old man flew and returned with an empty bottle dick would have sworn but his strength was not equal to the occasion he staggered caught at the handle of the door and motioned to the old man there's something in the pack here for johnny take it off i can't the old man unstrapped the pack and laid it before the exhausted man open it quick he did so with trembling fingers it contained only a few poor toys cheap and barbaric enough goodness knows but bright with paint and tinsel one of them was broken another i fear was irretrievably ruined by water and the third ah me there was a cruel spot it don't look like much that's a fact said dick ruefully but that's the best we could do take him old man and put him in his stocking and tell him tell him you know hold me old man the old man caught at his sinking figure tell him said dick with a weak little laugh tell him sandy claus has come and even so bedraggled ragged unshaven and unshorn with one arm hanging helplessly at his side santa claus came to simpson's bar and fell fainting on the first threshold the christmas dawn came slowly after touching the remoter peaks with the rosy warmth of ineffable love and it looked so tenderly on simpson's bar that the whole mountain as if caught in a generous action blushed to the skies end of santa claus at simpson's bar by bret hart read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com A Visit from St. Nicholas, or The Night Before Christmas, read by Sean Linet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Twas the night before Christmas, when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care, in the hopes that St. Nicholas would soon be there. The children were nestled all snug in their beds, while visions of sugar-plums danced in their heads. 
and Mama in her kerchief, and I in my cap, had just settled our brains for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters, and threw out the sash. The moon on the breast of the new-fallen snow gave the luster of midday to objects below. When what to my wondering eye should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer, with a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be St. Nick. More rapid than eagles his coursers they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donder and Blitzen, to the top of the porch, to the top of the wall, now dash away, dash away, dash away all. Ha, ha, ha. As dry leaves that before the wild hurricane fly, when they meet with an obstacle mount to the sky, so up to the housetop the courses they flew, with a sleigh full of toys and St. Nicholas too. And then, in a twinkling, I heard on the roof the prancing and pawing of each little hoof. As I drew in my head and was turning around, down the chimney St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flown on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry. His cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard of his chin was as white as the snow. He had a broad face and a round little belly that shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf, and I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work, and filled all the stockings, then turned with a jerk, and laying his finger aside of his nose, and giving a nod, up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle, and away they all flew, like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim, ere he drove out of sight, Happy Christmas to all, and to all a good night. End of A Visit from St. Nicholas, or The Night Before Christmas, read by Sean Linet. Uncle Noah's Christmas Inspiration by Leona Dalrymple, read in English. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 1 Christmas Cheer The twilight of a Christmas Eve, gray with the portent of coming snow, crept slowly over the old plantation of Briarwood softening the outlines of a decrepit house still rearing its roof in massive dignity and a tumble-down barn flanked by barren fields a quiet melancholy hovered about the old house as if it brooded over a host of bygone yuletides alive with the shouts of merry negroes and the jingle of visiting sleighs yuletides when the snowy dusk had been ushered in to the lowing of cattle and the neighing of horses safely housed in the old barn there were no negroes now no blooded stock, no fluttering fowl save one belligerent old turkey gobbler fleeing from a white-haired darkey who tried in vain to drive him to his roost in the barn. In the library of the old house a man, tall and eagle-eyed, peered out beneath bushy white eyebrows at the fading landscape, blurred by the dancing forms of the negro and the recalcitrant turkey. He watched the chase end with an impertinent gobble from the turkey, and, at the sound of a closing door in the rear of the house, tapped a bell at his side. Footsteps shuffled along the hallway, and breathless from his chase the old negro entered. 
Colonel Fairfax wheeled with military precision. "'Uncle Noah,' he said sternly, "'tomorrow will be Christmas.' The darky nodded and hobbled hurriedly to the wood fire, bending over as he poked it to hide the look of anxiety in his face. "'Law's a massy, Massy Fairfax,' he grumbled in good-natured evasion. "'You'd most freeze to death, I reckons, without sending for me.' He coughed and amended hastily. "'Without sending for one of the servants to pile up this here fire.' The amendment was but one of Uncle Noah's many subterfuges to convince himself and his master that there had been no changes in the Fairfax fortunes since the old days. That he was the last of the colonel's retainers, a wageless, loyal old dependent, attending to the manifold tasks of a sole domestic, the negro never admitted, even to himself. That his quaint pretensions, however, were daily stimulants to the fierce old colonel, hungrily eating his heart out with memories, Uncle Noah was well aware. So the pitiful little subterfuges, revealing the subtle understanding of the two, peopled the old house with swarming negroes and the horn of plenty to the joy of both. But today Uncle Noah felt uneasily that the reference to the servants had not bolstered the colonel as it usually did, and the old darky groaned inwardly as he added wood to the fire. From the corner of his eye he saw that the colonel had drawn himself up to military rigidity, an evidence that the old soldier was on his mettle and would brook no opposition. "'Uncle Noah,' he said, fixing a stern eye on the old man, "'in the Fairfax family there has always been a turkey at Christmas.' There was no suggestion in the darky's affable tones of the erratic manner in which his heart was beating. "'Yes, sir,' he agreed, "'oft times more than one. "'Owing to circumstances understood by you and myself, but by no one else, there would be no turkey this year save that—' "'Yes, sir?' Uncle Noah laid a wrinkled brown hand upon the nearest chair for support. "'We have a live turkey in stock,' ended the colonel firmly, looking squarely into the trembling negro's eyes. Uncle Noah's heart gave a convulsive leap. The thunderbolt had fallen. The fierce old turkey gobbler, solitary tenant of the crazy outbuildings, the imperial tyrant upon whom Uncle Noah had bestowed the affection of his loyal old heart, had been sentenced to death by the highest earthly tribunal the old negro recognized. "'As—as as a fear'll be tough, Colonel Fairfax,' he quavered. "'Ah, ah. "'Gord, a massy, massy, Dick, you wouldn't kill old Joe. He's too smart for a bird, and he's done a most powerful side of running, sir. I reckons he's most all muscle.' There was an agonized appeal in the darky's voice that cut straight to the colonel's heart. "'Uncle Noah,' he said kindly, "'it can't be helped. Job goes for the sake of someone else.' "'Old Missus?' "'Yes. Thank God, Uncle Noah.' The colonel laid a gentle hand on the negro's shoulder. "'That she doesn't know of our, uh, financial crisis.' His halting utterance showed how distasteful the words were to him. "'Save, of course, that we must live with economy as we have for years. "'Of the catastrophe of last fall she is ignorant, "'and a Fairfax Christmas without a turkey would... "'She must not know,' he finished abruptly. "'The colonel had spoken with a simple dignity and confidence "'that brought the old negro back from the field of sentiment "'to the barren desert of reality. "'Dimly in his mental chaos stood forth three pitiless facts— Old Mrs. was grieving her heart out for the son with whom the colonel had quarrelled three years before. Of this money trouble from which Colonel Fairfax had shielded her, she must as yet know nothing, and there was no turkey for the Christmas dinner. Verily, things looked dark for the ill-fated Job, roosting in unsuspecting security in the desolate old barn. With bowed head, the darky walked slowly toward the door. "'Uncle Noah?' the colonel's tones were incisive. You will kill Job to-night. "'I most forgot, Massa Dick,' faltered Uncle Noah, "'that supper's ready, sir. Oh, Mrs. Dunn, come downstairs just for I chases Job to roost. Laws a massy, Massa Dick, can he live till after supper?' The colonel nodded, carefully avoiding the old man's troubled eyes, and went to join his wife at supper. "'Christmas Eve, my dear,' he announced cheerfully, as he bent to kiss the sweet, wistful face that turned to greet him. I beg your pardon for keeping you waiting. Uncle Noah and I were discussing tomorrow's turkey. He gazed calmly at the old negro nervously handling the tea things. He has selected a large bird, and I have been advising a smaller. 
the colonel opened his napkin and deftly tucked the hole in the end out of sight beneath the table. Now, Uncle Noah, what is there tonight for supper? To Uncle Noah, this nightly question had become a sacred institution, a stimulus to imaginative powers highly developed in his quaint dialogues with the colonel. He forgot the doomed Job. It was Christmas Eve, and his creative gift took festive wings. Well, sir, he beamed, we has a little chicken gumbo, some fried chicken just the right golden brown, sir, cream potatoes, hot biscuits with currant jelly, uh, sliced ham, and baked potatoes. Colonel Fairfax thoughtfully considered the appetizing prospect, in accordance with the rules of the game. What mattered it that the luscious edibles existed only in the brain of the loyal old darky? The little pretense gave to each a delightful thrill, surely an adequate extenuation of the harmless diversion. As usual, Colonel Fairfax found the key to the situation in the closing items of Uncle Noah's list. "'It all sounds delicious, Uncle Noah,' he observed graciously, "'but I have a touch of my old enemy the dyspepsia today. I think I shall have sliced ham and baked potatoes. That, I think, will do for us both.' Mrs. Fairfax agreed her kindly eyes fixed upon Uncle Noah's attentive face. "'And, sir,' Uncle Noah began, "'it was Christmas Eve, and this game must be perfectly played. "'Shall I attend to the distribution of gifts in a Negro's quarter, sir?' "'Yes,' agreed the Colonel. "'See that no one is slighted.' Mrs. Fairfax bowed her wistful face upon her hands to hide the blinding tears, and an odd, uncomfortable silence fell upon the little group. At length, the colonel pushed his chair back and rose. "'Uncle Noah,' he said sternly, a suspicious brightness gleaming in his eyes, "'that turkey of yours is making a terrible noise under the window. Make him quick gobbling. Patricia, I don't wonder he makes you nervous. He's an old renegade.' That the object of the colonel's wrath had long since retired to roost mattered not to his accuser. The turkey had developed a convenient habit of gobbling under the window whenever emotion forced the colonel to seek a vent in stern commands. Uncle Noah crossed to the window and commanded Job to be silent. Mrs. Fairfax, southern gentlewoman and thoroughbred from tip to toe, quivered proudly, and, as Uncle Noah returned, bade him serve the supper in tones as well controlled as they were gentle. CHAPTER Two: THE INSPIRATION In the great barren kitchen Uncle Noah wiped his steel-rimmed spectacles and glared angrily about him. Oh, Mrs. Grieven a hard out for young Massa Dick, he reflected, and the colonel say slat no one. God a massy, what am this year old world comin' to? Every time old Miss cry for young Massa Dick, colonel says Job gobbles. The old darky choked miserably at the thought of the destined check to Job's gobbling career, and replacing his spectacles, carefully carried in the supper, prolonging its simple service to the uttermost with the single idea of adding precious minutes to the doomed turkey's span of life. When at length he sought the barn, it was quite dark, and the velvet stillness of the night was dotted thickly with snowflakes. With trembling fingers he opened the great barn door, lit a queer old lantern hanging just within, and hung it high upon a projecting hook. The dim light revealed an antique carriage-house, in one corner of which, upon a rude, improvised roost of shingles, the tyrant Job slept the sleep of the just and the unjust rolled into one. As the lights flickered upon his ruffled feathers, the turkey emitted a throaty grunt of disapproval, and moved cumbrously around to avoid the light. Uncle Noah addressed him with great firmness. "'Now see here, Massa Job,' he said, "'tain't no use your puttin' on your high and mighty airs to-night. I's come to interview you, sir. Understand?' Job majestically tucked his head beneath his wing, as if to intimate his indifference to the proposed interview. Uncle Noah surveyed his ruffled back feathers with increased respect. So, he said, you refuse me an interview, Massa Job Fairfax. You're sleepy, sir. That's what's got into you. He stroked the turkey with a gentle hand, and Job, resenting the indignity, withdrew his head from the sheltering wing and pecked at the brown fingers, turning around with a stately movement and facing the light once more with a sleepy blink of his bright, bead-like eyes. Now, sir, we can talk exclaimed the negro in delight. Drawing up an old box, he seated himself before the roost, and beamed benevolently over his glasses. "'Colonel Dunn say yo gobble under the window about supper-time,' he began confidentially. "'When old Miss cry about young Massa Dick, the colonel he just got a scold about something, 
and as you is the most important person about, he just naturally selects you. The turkey held his head upon one side, apparently in critical admiration of the darkey's quaint old scarf-pin, which resembled a grain of corn mounted on a needle. Uncle Noah, who had always had a faint mistrust of Job's attitude toward this ancient Ethiopian heirloom, promptly removed it to a place of safety. Then, with a sudden resolve that no thought of the coming tragedy should mar his last visit with his old companion, he rose and sought a dim, cobwebby corner of the barn, whence he returned with a box. "'Dees year, Job,' he explained, "'is de flowers what young Massa Dick have sent to his mother every holiday since he done went away from here. Morning, I specs, when de colonel sees him at a plate, he'll declare your goblin something fierce under the window again. He always do.' The old negro broke the string of the box and removed a glowing mass of purple orchids, odd, transient tenants of the crazy old barn. Job suddenly reached over and pecked a blossom from its stem, ate the heart with the dainty air of an epicure, and discarded the remainder with a noise akin to a gobble of disgust. Uncle Noah rose in scandalized protest. "'You good-for-nothing, miserable, sassy turkey!' he scolded hastily removing the orchids. "'You certainly is the most scandalous, no-count bird I ever knowed. Eat one of old Mrs. Orchard's. Laws a massa, Job, you goes most too far. Now, sir, you be quiet and listen to this note I gets from young Massa Dick.' And he carefully deciphered the written lines for the listening Job. "'Dear Uncle Noah, I have written Foster and Company, as usual, to send Mother's orchids. They should get there Christmas Eve. Will you put them at her plate in the morning?' I find they are the only suggestion of me that the colonel will allow in the house. I tried another letter this week, but it came back unopened. Uncle Noah, give Mother a Merry Christmas for me. Dick Uncle Noah laid the letter on his knee and drew from a worn leather wallet several newspaper clippings. They were glowing reports, gleaned from a stray newspaper, of the success of a young architect in a distant northern city, one Richard Fairfax, Jr., Uncle Noah proudly read them aloud for the hundredth time, interpolating little explanatory remarks to the turkey, who gobbled threateningly but failed to intimidate his tormentor. "'Job, what do you think about dis here quarrel?' Uncle Noah said, as the turkey eyed him sternly. "'I say the colonel's too hot on the boy.' "'A quarrel's a quarrel, you say? Hm. Maybe you're right, but it's dis Fairfax pride of the colonel's that keep him from reading the boy's letters and nothing else, sir.' He's sorry for that quarrel, don't you forget it. But de colonel he prouder and Lucifer. Hm. You say you understand pride cause you're as proud yourself. Then, as the turkey relapsed into slumber, Now see ye, Massa Job, you ain't no more sleepier than I is. Uncle Noah poked the turkey with his finger, and Job arched his neck with a threatening flap of his wings, and descended from his perch. Fight me, will ye? demanded Uncle Noah in secret delight. You is the touchiest bird. Yeah, fight with these here crusts of bread. Job spread his tail magnificently and began an erratic consumption of the bread crusts, pertly taking them one by one from the old negro's hand and arranging them upon the barn floor for later and more personal inspection. Uncle Noah watched him with misty eyes. Presently his gaze furtively sought the rusty axe in the corner and a great tear rolled down his cheek. Caught in the wave of a sudden panic, he dropped upon his knees and clasped his trembling hands. The dusky barn, littered with odds and ends, was dimly visible in the glimmering light of the old-fashioned lantern, whose slanting rays fell upon the doomed bird and the praying negro. No thought of sacrilege marred the quaint, halting prayer. A terrible earnestness lined the negro's face with a holiness of purpose, and made it beautiful. "'O oh Lord!' he prayed. "'Save this here old turkey gobbler!' I knows, Lord, he's a powerful worthless bird, but he's all I's got. I's just an old slave, Massa, what's been free since the war. And Job, sir, he understands me. Lord, I don't want to live no more if I has to kill old Job. Send me an inspiration, Lord, and tell me how I can save his worthless old hide. Save him, and, and God bless the Colonel. Amen. For an interval, in which the only sound was that of Job's feet, as he strutted about seeking an edible successor to the bread. Uncle Noah remained upon his knees in the attitude of prayer, perhaps awaiting inspiration. At length he rose, and seating himself upon the box once more, 
buried his white head dejectedly in his hands. The snowflakes filtered slowly through a crevice at the side, heaping fantastically into a miniature drift. Absently, Uncle Noah watched them, his mind traveling back to many a snowy Christmas before the war. Suddenly his brown face glowed with radiance, and he drew a long breath of relief. Joe, he said, leaning forward and patting the turkey, I has it. You'd scarcely believe it, sir, but I's a-goin' to save you. He rose transformed, the despondent droop of his lean body replaced by an alert energy. Now, Joe, he coaxed, I just wants you for to come along with me peaceable, sir. I's after you to save your old hard from the Christmas platter. But Job, with a malicious enjoyment of the game, was prancing wildly about the barn, flapping his wings in hysterical derision of his breathless pursuer. Brought to bay, he squawked a protest, and struggled violently as Uncle Noah unceremoniously imprisoned him beneath one arm. "'There, sir,' exclaimed the negro triumphantly, "'I has you. You're certainly the most worthless turkey on this yer plantation.' Tightly clasping the outraged tyrant, Uncle Noah tiptoed to the lantern and blew it out. Then, stumbling across the floor, he stealthily left the barn and set out across the snowy fields to a tumble-down shanty sole survivor of a string of negro huts long since burned one by one in the library fireplace. Into its dilapidated interior he thrust the protesting turkey, pausing at the door as he struck a match to view the bird's temporary quarters. Now, Massa Job Fairfax, he began, I know you is just mad clean through. You just naturally objects to being toted out in the snow in the middle of the turkey night without being asked. You says your back is full of snow? Well, I just ask you, Massa Job Fairfax, ain't that better than being without a head? Now, sir, I ask you to be most terrible quiet this year night. I's a-goin' into Coatesville on a little trip, and I don't want the colonel to know you're here. He closed the rickety door, and hurrying back across the field, sought the kitchen, his eyes behind their spectacles shining with excitement. Muffling himself in a quaint red knitted scarf, a dingy overcoat, and a worn fur cap, plentifully ear-lapped, he left the house again, pausing only long enough to peer through the library window at the colonel, who was reading aloud to his wife, both drawn up in the cheery warmth of a blazing wood-fire. Then he hurried on along the road to town. With a prayer in his heart for the success of his mission, Uncle Noah trudged sturdily down the two miles to Coatesville, past Major Verney's old plantation, the cheery lights of the great house twinkling brightly through a curtain of snow and into the snow-laden air of the village streets alive with Christmas shoppers. Holly and mistletoe, Christmas trees filling the air with the odor of pine, dancing snowflakes and bright lights, wonderful windows wreathed and dotted in Christmas glitter, and cheery voices. Who could resist them? Uncle Noah felt his heart quiver with hope. Jubilantly he turned his steps toward the railroad station ahead. The northern express flashed through the snow and came to a stop with a clang and a roar, disgorging a chattering holiday crowd who paused for a change of cars at Coatesville on their southbound trips. Uncle Noah hastened his shuffling footsteps. The Northern Express, with its horde of transient visitors, had been a vital part of the inspiration. Upon the station platform people stamped up and down in the snow, or laughed and chatted, quite oblivious to the timid gaze of the old darky, who slowly made his way among them. One by one Uncle Noah left them all behind, a great disappointment in his face. In their laughing countenances he had found nothing of what he sought. CHAPTER Three, THE GRAY-EYED LADY Just ahead a girl appeared from the shadows and walked quickly toward the waiting-room. Uncle Noah looked into her fresh, sweet face, then his own lit up with renewed hope, and he followed her in and touched her timidly on the arm. The girl turned, revealing a face rosy with cold, and a pair of warm gray eyes fringed in lashes of black eyes that frankly offered a glimpse of a girl's impulsive heart brimming over with Christmas spirit. Uncle Noah removed the battered fur cap and bowed low with the deference of a cavalier. I I's just come in to, to ask you, miss, he said simply, if you'd like to buy an old nigger servant. As for sale. For sale? The girl took in the quaint figure with a glance of blank astonishment. Why, she gasped. Surely you— As old, miss, he interrupted timidly, but meeting her gaze with unwavering sincerity. I specs as most a hundred, but as powerful tough and full of work, 
and and miss i has to sell myself to-night cause cause uncle noah paused uncertainly seeking a fit expression of his dilemma and the girl readily intuitive glanced swiftly about to assure herself that the waiting-room was free from unsympathetic eavesdroppers then strangely drawn by this quaint old vendor of humanity and warmly eager to put him more at his ease she impulsively pushed a rocking-chair toward the old stove in the centre and motioned him to be seated but uncle noah had been reared in the fairfax family and a fairfax never sat when a lady was still upon her feet with a courtly gesture the old man bowed her to the chair she had drawn for him a quick gleam of approval flashed in the grey eyes and with a deepening flush of puzzled interest the girl instantly seated herself unfastening the silver fox at her throat as she felt the warm of the old country stove please i would so much rather you too would sit down she said impulsively and as uncle noah drew forward another of the rickety old rocking-chairs with which the coatsville waiting-room was dotted she bent toward him a light in the wonderful grey eyes that won uncle noah's heart tell me she said kindly tell me just why you want to sell yourself no she had not laughed at him uncle noah glowed to the tips of his fingers at the ready sympathy of her tone he beamed mildly at her over his spectacles, turning the old fur cap round and round in his hands as he sought to voice the words that struggled to his lips. O "'Old Massa's money, and, miss, he ain't had much since the war, just enough to live comfortable. I'll go in the Coatsville bank crash last fall, and he don't want old miss for to know. I's the only one of the niggers what's left, and there's only one old turkey gobbler left of the stock. He's my old pet, miss, most like a child, and—' and uncle noah choked the girl's eyes were misty velvet and he told you to kill your pet for the christmas dinner she finished gently uncle noah nodded massa done say we must have a turkey for the christmas dinner or old miss'll suspect de de financial crisis what we're in out in the barn i prays for an inspiration and i spect it come and so you decided to sell yourself began the girl yes'm Uncle Noah's voice had grown apologetic. "'You see, miss, I's the only thing what I really own, except this here old stick-pin, cause I's free now. But I reckons if I has a mind to sell myself, the North can't stop me. I's selling my own property.' There was a gentle defiance in the old negro's argument. "'And you—you wouldn't accept a—a a loan?' The girl flushed. The negro's hurt eyes were answer enough. Uncle Noah had not lived in an atmosphere permeated with Fairfax pride without feeling its influence. "'I's not asking for charity, miss,' he averred stubbornly. "'I's a-selling something. I reckons if you buy me, miss, and you'll let me go back and stay Christmas with the old master, I'll sell myself cheap. You see, I's a-planning first to buy a turkey, what'll take Job's place on a platter, and then to give the master a grand Christmas with the rest of the money what I gets for myself.' saving out just enough to buy my old turkey and come to your first day after christmas it'll be hard to leave old massa and miss but i reckons it's just got to be done uncle noah gulped and blinked and there was a glimmer of wet lashes about the warm gray eyes that had won his heart the girl was silent so long that uncle noah shifted uneasily but at last she spoke a little tremulously for what price will you sell yourself she asked and Uncle Noah never doubted but that she regarded the purchase in the same light in which he himself had viewed it. He turned about for his purchaser's thorough inspection, his bald head above the fringe of white wool about it glistening in the lamplight. "'Do you think I's worth, say, twenty-five dollars?' he queried, regarding her fixedly over his spectacles. The girl touched her throat with an unconscious gesture. "'Yes, you are,' she cried impulsively. "'You are indeed.' and before Uncle Noah had quite time to adjust himself to the joy of his unique sale, the girl thrust a roll of bills into his hands and disappeared through the station door. CHAPTER Four: CHRISTMAS INTRIGUE Uncle Noah hobbled after her. His new mistress had quite forgotten to tell him where to deliver himself when his Christmas with the colonel was over, but when he reached the door she was eagerly greeting a man who had just alighted from a waiting carriage. Uncle Noah could but dimly see, but as the genial voice reached his ears he halted in the shadow, quite content. It was Major Verney. 
the fact that the colonel's old friend and neighbor had driven him from fernlands to meet the radiant lady whose great gray eyes uncle noah now recalled had had the verney look which endeared the owner of fernlands to all who knew him seemed to the watching negro a direct interposition of providence a scant mile of cotton fields lay between the two plantations and christmas over uncle noah had but to trudge across the fields to deliver himself to the major's guest and ruth concluded major verney in laughing reprimand you've kept me waiting why child the northern express came in fifteen minutes ago uncle noah did not catch the girl's reply as major verney assisted her into the carriage and they drove rapidly away the old darky beamed happily after the retreating carriage then with his hand tightly clasped about the precious roll of greenbacks for which he had so willingly bartered his freedom he began a tour of the coatesville stores when at length he staggered into the big grocery store for his final purchases he was laden with a miscellaneous collection of christmas packages from which he was cheerfully disentangled by the bulky proprietor himself uncle noah made a critical pilgrimage about the store pausing at last before a counter where the proprietor had laid out a number of turkeys for the careful inspection of this beaming shopper about to select an understudy for the incomparable job a very respectable fowl was presently mantled in brown paper and laid beside the other bundles along with sundry bags of cranberries and apples oranges and nuts celery and raisins cigars for the colonel a box of candy for mrs fairfax huge bunches of holly and mistletoe christmas wreaths for the windows and a great bag of cracked corn for the reprieved tyrant gloomily roosting in the ruined hut as uncle noah carefully counted out the money required to purchase this astonishing outlay the bulky proprietor asked pleasantly uncle noah do you happen to know where i can get a good woman to scrub up my store every evening uncle noah fingered his scarf pin uncertainly how much do you pay for the work he queried fifty cents a day the negro leaned forward in tense expectancy do you expect i could do it he demanded excitedly the proprietor secretly astonished by the old man's manner nodded assuringly why yes you could easily it's nothing much but the colonel colonel don't have for to know exclaimed uncle noah i comes here mornings for he's up and i clare to goodness sir i needs the money most powerful the proprietor was easy-going and too phlegmatic to harbor curiosity so the bargain was straightway sealed under a pledge of deepest secrecy somewhat confused by the unusual series of events uncle noah his eyes shining with a strange excitement started for the door quite forgetting the countless packages on the counter the proprietor recalled him with a hearty laugh uncle noah he called you've forgotten one or two little bundles here with a smothered gasp the old negro hurried back but try as they would room for all the numerous bundles could not be found the proprietor energetically tucked bundles into all of uncle noah's pockets piled them tower fashion upon his arms and even hung a collection bound together with a string over his shoulder while uncle noah wheezed and groaned and struggled to find new and unsuspected storage space in his clothes but still there remained bundles and bundles at which uncle noah gazed over his spectacles in growing discomfiture what am i a goin to do he demanded i never can come all the way back here in the snow of these here old legs mine get one of them station cabs advised the grocer and so after considerable discussion the bundle problem was resolved ten minutes later uncle noah entered a hired carriage for the first time in his life at the town florist's he rapped a timid signal to the driver to stop and glowing with anticipation spryly shuffled into the warm scented air of the little shop here to the smiling clerk's astonishment he ordered a bunch of violets to be delivered christmas morning to the young lady with the gray eyes what's at major verney's surely smiled the clerk you don't want that on the card but uncle noah was stubborn more he insisted on writing the inscription himself his orthography quite as quaint as his penmanship and so the card went to be read by the wonderful gray eyes in the morning back through the snow in his rickety carriage rolled uncle noah rattling home along the snowy road down which he had trudged in the early evening chuckling now intermittently in a mental rehearsal of his new plan fifty cents a day he thought and to-morrow i's a-goin to slip over to fernlands in the mornin and ask her to let me buy myself back on the stallment plan most likely she'll take a dollar a week and with all the rest of that grocer money old miss don't have to know what the colonel and me is a-goin through in accordance with uncle noah's whispered directions the cab crept gently up the driveway at briarwood and paused at the kitchen door where the driver who had taken a great fancy to uncle noah became transformed into a benevolent stevedore 
tiptoeing in and out of the kitchen with the bundles, which the old darky drew from the cavernous pit of the cab. Job's understudy came last, and Uncle Noah, tightly pressing the precious fowl in his arms, watched the carriage drive slowly away. Then, after an interval in the kitchen, devoted to hiding his purchases, he sought the library, striving to simulate a decent depression over the assumed decapitation of Job. Colonel Fairfax looked up inquiringly as he entered. "'I's just come to tell you, sir,' said Uncle Noah, with a meaning glance at Mrs. Fairfax, "'that I has a turkey all ready for the oven.' A faint red crept through the Colonel's skin, but he met the darkey's eyes squarely. "'Thank you, Uncle Noah,' he said, and the negro shuffled hurriedly away. In his old rocking-chair by the kitchen fire, Uncle Noah, alert and excited, waited until he heard the Colonel and Mrs. Fairfax go up to bed. Then, chuckling to himself, he extinguished the kitchen lights, and carrying one of his Christmas bundles, plodded across the field to Job's nocturnal hermitage. The light of a match revealed the tyrant roosting glumly on the summit of a ruined ploughshare. "'I's brought you a Christmas surprise, Master Job Fairfax,' said Uncle Noah, and he sprinkled the floor of the hut with corn that the turkey might find it in the morning." With his heart full of thanksgiving, the negro plodded homeward through the snow. As he reached the old barn, the great clock in the library struck twelve, and faintly through the snowy air floated the distant silvery charms of the Coatesville bells, clear and sweet, ringing in a Christmas morning. Creeping to bed long after the first rooster had crowed, Uncle Noah had sought the kitchen again with the sunrise. His tired eyes opening jubilantly upon a snapping cold Christmas morning, radiant in gold and white. Downstairs, clusters of holly and mistletoe festooned doors and windows, dotted the old-fashioned hanging lamps with spots of crimson, and crowned the family portraits with royal diadems. And evergreen wreaths hung in the windows, all the work of a wrinkled pair of faithful brown hands, toiling while the world slept. In the library a blazing wood fire leaped and crackled, while in the dining-room the table was spread for breakfast. Certain long-needed articles of china, which had mysteriously disappeared from time to time since the autumn, dotted a tablecloth free from holes, a new one, subjected to a severe laundry process during the night, and the napkins no longer resembled Ku Klux masks. A great bowl of purple orchids glowed at Mrs. Fairfax's plate. CHAPTER V. FERNLANDS The Colonel greeted the Christmas festoons of holly in the library with a stare of astonished approval. A question had risen to his lips, but the warning look in Uncle Noah's eyes, as they rested on Mrs. Fairfax, had checked it. These two had had many financial and domestic secrets from the dear lady, and the Colonel promptly decided that Uncle Noah had sold some forgotten relic, and had once more made use of his highly developed faculty for expanding a small sum to incredible elasticity, and he praised the result accordingly. Mrs. Fairfax, too, brightened wonderfully yielding to the Christmas spirit with which the old darky had contrived to fill the house. Uncle Noah felt a glow of delight at their outspoken appreciation, and, bowing elaborately, he ushered his master and mistress to breakfast. Here again, as he seated himself, the Colonel was conscious of an agreeable flood of astonishment. There was quite an air about this Christmas breakfast. Fixing his keen eyes on the tablecloth and napkins, he stealthily fingered them with a searching look at the waiting negro. Fortunately, his interest was speedily diverted. He caught sight of the orchids and the tear-stained face of his wife bending over them. With a wrench of his chair, he arose. "'Patricia,' he said stormily, "'did I not say that nothing of his—did I not—' He paused and gulped. "'Uncle Noah,' he added unsteadily, "'that turkey of yours is gobbling like a fiend out of the window. You—he—' The colonel stopped abruptly, reddened as his eyes fell upon the negro. Uncle Noah had wisely turned away, and sternly reseated himself, somewhat confused by his thoughtless reference to the late lamented Job. Uncle Noah hobbled from the room, his brown face working convulsively. In the kitchen he shook with silent laughter, doubling over breathlessly, and clasping his hands over his stomach in aching distress. "'And what, Uncle Noah?' asked the Colonel kindly, as the old negro presently re-entered the dining-room. "'Have we for our Christmas breakfast?' "'Well, sir,' Uncle Noah began fluently, "'we has grapefruit, cereal with cream, quail on toast, fried oysters, uh, oatmeal, hot muffins, fried chicken, corn bread, and coffee.' The Colonel, appearing to be thoughtfully considering his choice, replied, as usual, 
It all sounds delicious, Uncle Noah, but I have a touch of my old enemy, dyspepsia, to-day. I think I shall have some cornbread and coffee, and so will Mrs. Fairfax. I don't think you quite understand me, sir, averred Uncle Noah, and, sir, I specs your dyspepsia ain't so bad this morning. We has for breakfast, sir, grapefruit, cereal with cream, quail on toast, fried oysters, er, uh, oatmeal, fried chicken, hot muffins, cornbread, and coffee. There was no mistaking the emphasis this time. Colonel Fairfax darted a lightning glance at the negro, and amended his selection with a question in his voice. "'Well, now I come to think of it, Uncle Noah,' he said. "'My dyspepsia isn't nearly so bad. I'll have, um, let me see. Oatmeal. That was in the list, I believe. Um, uh, fried chicken, am I right? Muffins. Cornbread and coffee.' There was a conviction in the colonel's deep voice that something extraordinary was afoot, and Uncle Noah, flurried by its ominous ring, hurried from the room. Dimly he had pictured his master's gracious astonishment and pleasure. Any queries relative to the financial source of the Christmas delicacies, however, had been lost entirely in the darkey's jubilant excitement. Now he groaned in dismay. "'Yo is in a mess for sure, Uncle Noah,' he apostrophized himself. "'What'll you do when it come time for dinner?' Here you has a Christmas dinner fit for a king, and a colonel, he know right well that we has only a little left from the money what we don't get when we sold a silver teapot. It was Christmas, however, and Uncle Noah felt convinced that the providence that had watched so well over his Christmas Eve would order a special dispensation for his new dilemma. While awaiting its manifestation he would studiously avoid the colonel, and would slip across to Fernlands, once the pseudo-Job was safe in the oven and begged the grey-eyed lady to accept a dollar a week of the grocer's money in his inspired scheme of self-redemption. With this in mind, Uncle Noah served the breakfast, hurried his preparations for the midday feast, and at five minutes of eleven, the turkey safely roasting, set out across the fields for Major Verney's. At Fernlands, the eleven strokes of the grandfather's clock in the great hall found the grey-eyed lady in the arms of a young fellow who had but that instant bounded lightly up the walk from the sleigh Major Verney had dispatched to Coatesville to meet the Northern Express. The Major, smilingly awaiting his opportunity to greet the newcomer, ran his eye approvingly over the lines of the well-knit figure and handsome face of the young man. "'Well, Dick,' said the Major, advancing with outstretched hand, as the girl flushed prettily and smoothed back the dark mist of hair from her forehead. "'How are you, my boy?' busy, of course. We read fine things of you in the papers at times. Then, as the young man took off his overcoat, "'What, sir,' the major inquired, "'do you mean by falling in love with my only niece? Here my brother writes me that his daughter is engaged to a man who knows me, and will I pack off a carload of testimonials by a special messenger, endorsing the little rascal who used to steal my apples? What, sir, do you mean?' "'Well, major,' Dick answered, as he was ushered into the big living-room, his laughing eyes alight with happiness. She had the verney eyes, and you remember, I always liked them. He sank into a chair by Ruth, with a smiling glance at the Major. It is unusually cold for down here. There's a real bracing northern sting in the air. And what a snow! It's packed down so that the runners fairly flew. Major, do sit down. The Major was still bustling about, urging Ruth into another chair by the fire that he himself might sit by Dick poking energetically at the blazing logs, and firing a volley of directions at Black Sam. "'There!' he exclaimed, finally seating himself. "'Now, sir, relative to this infatuated young person on my left, who has condescended to visit her uncle for the first time since she arrived on the planet, I met her last night according to telegraphed instructions, and she kept me waiting—let me see—' "'Uncle,' protested Ruth, "'you've added fifteen minutes to that wait every time you've mentioned it.' "'My dear child, politeness alone has kept me from naming the full extent of my weight. "'If you please, sir,' he turned to Dick, "'she was in the clutches of a beggar who obtained twenty-five dollars by a most extraordinary yarn.' Twenty-five dollars,' Dick whistled, smiling at the flush that crept up to the grey eyes. "'Was it an aged father this time, or a hungry brood of motherless waifs, Ruthie?' "'Dick, listen,' cried the girl. "'Uncle misjudges him. It was a dear old coloured man, and he told me the strangest story.' "'You don't often find a grateful beggar who sends you violets in the morning, purchased with some of your own shekels,' said the Major, pinching the flushed cheek. "'Tell him, Ruthie, it was odd, and I believe I'd have done the same thing myself.' The girl flashed a grateful look at him, and then told the story of her purchase of the night before so eloquently that the Major and Dick heard her through with sober faces, secretly touched by its pathos. 
and he must have recognized uncle she ended for the violets came this morning with the quaintest card for an instant she dreamily scanned the fire seeing in its glowing embers the brown wrinkled negro face with its honest eyes peering at her over his spectacles in troubled apprehension then she sprang to her feet uncle edward she cried did you tell uncle neb to wait with the sleigh those sleigh bells are beginning to sound hysterical merciful goodness cried the major i certainly did i had the strictest commands to drive into church for mother verney at eleven o'clock hi sam you black rascal tell uncle neb i'll be right out i'll tell him uncle called ruth flying swiftly up the long hall to the library window but no clear call went ringing over the snow to uncle neb instead there was silence broken at length by a voice that called softly in great excitement dick uncle edward do come here look she cried as they quickly joined her you see uncle he didn't forget smiling the two men looked from the window an old negro muffled in a threadbare coat was plodding up the walk his eyes scanning the house with evident curiosity the major uttered a quick exclamation and the girl wheeled about don't you see she cried he's come to-day honest old fellow that he is see dick she stopped abruptly looking from one to the other there was something in the two stern faces staring beyond her at the bent negro that struck a chill to her heart dick's face had gone white and the major's hand had stolen to the younger man's shoulder as if to steady him there was a startled incredulity in the major's face as he said brace up old man you didn't know neither did i ruth dick asked unsteadily is that the old colored man whose whose master yes cried the girl the sharp pain of premonition in her voice oh dick who is he dick's miserable eyes sought hers as he answered it's it's dad's uncle noah ruth i he turned and sought the hall ruth's face flamed at his words uncle noah's pathetic story came crowding over her again in the light of dick's revelation his father and mother the stern old colonel of whom dick always spoke with such respectful loyalty in spite of their quarrel and the dear mother whose tender eyes gazing from the old-fashioned daguerreotype dick always carried had made her choke with sudden tears these two were uncle noah's beloved old massa and old miss she turned the major had followed dick to the hallway a shuffling step sounded on the porch outside and the girl hurried towards the door a sudden light of daring in her eyes impulse had always ruled the verneys and ruth was a verney from the crown of her dark head to the tips of her small feet catching up grandmother verney's long cloak hanging over a chair she softly left the house dick struggling into his overcoat turned at the major's touch on his arm just a minute dick major verney's genial voice was sympathetic as a woman's remember that what the colonel refused in prosperity he's not likely to take in adversity sit down here by the fire until we talk it over but major there was a note of anguish in the boy's voice i must go to him think of uncle noah selling himself to help them and and i but the major had already removed the overcoat and gently pushed his guest into a chair by the fire yes yes he said as he seated himself we know all about that my boy but i'm afraid dick he added regretfully that the colonel wouldn't let you in he's very bitter dick groaned he was calmer now you're right major he said steadily it hurt so at first that I didn't think. I can't go now. He leaned forward anxiously. The Coatesville Bank, he questioned abruptly, crashed in the autumn, in September. Dick bit his lip, and the Major added, He was heavily interested. Dick stared at the fire. It was all he had, he said. I see. The Major's quiet voice gave no hint of his own emotion. I didn't know. Of course, I'd heard he lost something, but we all did. But I thought he had other money. No. Tell me, Major, you've been going to Briarwood this winter, just as usual? Of course, every Wednesday night. The Colonel and I are too old to alter the habit of a lifetime. And besides, we both love that long evening playing chess. There's always a roaring wood fire and a steaming pot of coffee, and your mother always plays Beethoven for us just before I go. A look of relief shone in Dick's eyes. Always a fire, he repeated. I'm glad of that. There was no suggestion of... of want? Heavens, no. The Major's deep voice was full of assurance. Last week, he added thoughtfully, 
the coffee was pretty weak but it never occurred to me that he stopped abruptly rose from his chair with sudden energy violently blew his nose and tramped down to the end of the hall and back damn the fairfax pride he exclaimed fiercely here uncle noah has been coming into the library wednesday nights and telling the colonel that the stock had all been bedded down for the night when all the time there's been nothing left but this confounded old turkey gobbler we've been hearing about he swore last week that somebody had stolen the silver teapot abominable old liar he must have sold it the major threw out his arms with a wrathful gesture all this comedy if you please for my benefit here i've been there every week and never suspected thanks to the infernal stratagems of that black fiend of an uncle noah damn the fairfax pride the major sat down as suddenly as he had risen and bending over attacked the fire with vicious energy tell me major dick presently asked have you ever mentioned me to the colonel since i went north once the major made a wry face i never tried again dick colored does he know about ruth no i dared not mention it the major looked at the other intently dick he said what was this quarrel all about anyway in the beginning major admitted the young man flushing it was so childish i'm ashamed to speak of it out with it commanded the major i won't be hoodwinked by a fairfax any longer well sir if you must know it was about the war the war exploded the major by gad sir what about the war dad and i were talking it over and well to be frank major i said i thought the north had been right and that if i had been in the world at the time i would have fought with them despite my kinsmen go on did you fight in any other post-mortem wars the revolution or the fall of rome dick ignored the sarcasm my sympathy for the north made him furious he went on we quarrelled terribly and both of us said things that i know we didn't mean it was the fairfax temper sir i damn the fairfax temper roared the major thank heavens the verneys are mild dick laughed in spite of himself i apologized he continued soberly but he wouldn't listen told me to get out said if i chose to change my opinions about the north we'd talk it over and i of course refused of course interpolated the major trimly i've written since suggesting that we forget it all and start anew but he won't listen sir the major stroked his beard ominously did it ever occur to you dick he demanded that enough families were estranged by that war without carrying it over into the twentieth century let me see how long after the war were you born twenty years wasn't it i remember your father and ruth's were married about the same time every man has a right to his opinions major dick asserted with spirit of course i've no personal knowledge of the war but stubbornly the north was right fairfax to the core thought the major in secret admiration the boy's his father all over again well dick he said mildly we older men of the south feel a little differently about this war but my boy these post-bellum disputes don't pay particularly when one participant was born long after the guns were quiet in my opinion you didn't know enough about the war to quarrel over it great scott quarrelling over the war dick you deserve to be spanked the jingle of sleigh bells rang blithely through the silence that followed and the major sprang to his feet merciful heavens he exclaimed staring at his watch it's twelve o'clock that must be uncle neb still waiting and grandmother verney's probably standing on the church porch yet mad as a hornet he was at the door now calling wildly to the negro uncle neb why under the canopy didn't you call me the darky scratched his head massa edward he confessed i ain't been here i just drove missy ruth over to briarwood with uncle noah to see colonel fairfax the major summoned dick in great excitement dick he exclaimed get into your overcoat as fast as you can and drive over to briarwood with uncle neb ruth's gone ahead of you and you couldn't have a better deputy short of an angel dick wrung the major's hand and fled to the waiting sleigh the color flooding his face and uncle neb called the major frantically hurry back or grandmother verney will be tramping home in the snow rheumatism or no rheumatism with a wild jingle of bells that seemed to dick the hysterical echo of his own heartbeats the sleigh was off Chapter Six: The Colonel's Christmas. At Briarwood, the Colonel, wrought to a high tension of excitement by the mysterious flood of Christmas prosperity, of which the latest manifestation had been a fresh newspaper dated the night before, surmounted by a cigar of no mean label, had been vainly searching for Uncle Noah. Bewildered by the darky's odd vagaries, which had culminated in the culprit's disappearance, just as the Colonel had returned to the library, drawn his favorite chair up to the cheerful blaze of the wood fire 
and opened his favorite volume. A door in the rear of the house shut softly, and convinced that Uncle Noah had returned, the colonel closed his book and adjusted his glasses, determined to have an immediate reckoning with the author of all this Christmas cheer. A light step sounded behind his chair, and the colonel turned, quite primed for an altercation. In an instant, however, the old man was on his feet, bowing grandly in spite of his astonishment. A girl stood in the doorway, her cloak falling loosely about her figure. Her cheeks were blazing scarlet from the cold, and the deep gray eyes, fringed in black, bore something in their warm depths that stirred familiar memories. "'Colonel,' she said, stretching out a slim white hand, "'I'm Ruth Verney, Major Edward's niece. I've just driven one of your servants.' Rare tact was but one of the Verney charms. "'Over from Fernland's, and I thought you wouldn't mind if I ran in for an instant to enjoy your fire.' "'Why, child,' the colonel cried, forgetting all else in his delight, "'you must be Walter Verney's daughter.' Ruth smilingly nodded. "'I knew it,' he went on. "'You have his eyes. "'Sit down here. I knew your father well. "'When we were boys, he and I were inseparable.' He paused and added simply, "'That was before the war.' The dark lashes veiled for an instant, a certain excitement in the grey eyes. "'I'm down for Christmas with Uncle Edward,' Ruth explained and before the colonel had fully realized that they were chatting happily together like old friends. Suddenly the girl exclaimed, "'Colonel Fairfax, I know you'll be glad to hear that Dad and the Major are friends again.' "'Indeed I am,' agreed the colonel heartily. "'In the old days we would have laughed at the man who could possibly have suggested a quarrel for the Verney twins.' "'Nothing but a cruel war could have done it,' said the girl quietly. "'What does it matter now,' she demanded impetuously, "'if Daddy did fight for the North and the Major for the South?' It's all so long ago that a quarrel about it is foolish. The colonel cleared his throat. <clears throat> yes, it is foolish, he admitted. You see, Ruth leaned eagerly forward, I met a man who knew the major, and he praised him so highly that I lay awake all one night thinking, what a pity it was that two such splendid men as Daddy and his brother should still be enemies over an old bygone war. You know, colonel, they would have been friends ages ago, only each was too proud to make the first advance. "'Wasn't it foolish?' The colonel nodded, carefully shading his eyes from the fire. "'They were just wasting precious years of companionship,' went on the girl. "'That thought came to me as I lay awake in bed, and the very next morning I wrote to the Major. "'You see, Colonel Fairfax, I feel this way,' she explained. "'There's no North and no South. Daddy and the Major are citizens of the United States.' The colonel rose and busied himself about the fire. When he put back the tongs and reseated himself, his cheeks were hot from its blazing warmth. "'And that's what I told Uncle Edward in the letter. And, Colonel, he wrote me such a glorious letter back that I had to show it to Daddy. He was delighted, and he said that any two men who fought over the battles of a dead war were old fools.' Colonel Fairfax winced. "'So,' finished the girl, with glowing eyes, "'Uncle Edward came rushing north in a great state of excitement, and that's how I came to be down here over Christmas.' In her impetuous criticism of the wartime quarrel that had separated the Verney twins for more than forty years, and the expression of her broad, impulsive patriotism, Colonel Fairfax had listened to certain truths which had long been subconsciously germinating in his own mind. Before he could recover from the surprise of finding that he agreed with her, Ruth, touched by the lines of care graven upon his fine old face, had caught her breath with a little sob, slipped from her place by the fire, and was kneeling beside his chair her eyes starry with light, her lovely face glorified with its tender appeal. "'Colonel,' she cried, a catch in her voice, "'I'm going to marry Dick. It was he who praised Uncle Edward so.' The colonel's face grew scarlet. Then he laid a trembling hand upon the girl's bowed head. "'Child,' he said, "'you—you—' you. Tears blinded his eyes, and he stopped. In the silence that followed came the sharp sound of a quick footfall. The colonel looked up. Dick Fairfax stood in the doorway, his eyes burning strangely in the white misery of his face. The father rose and straightened himself with something of his old, stern dignity, but at a warm, girlish touch he gulped. "'Dick,' he said queerly, holding out a trembling hand, "'we're—we're we're both citizens of the United States, and it's Christmas Day.' Almost before he had finished, the boy had bounded across the floor and wrung the outstretched hand, his face radiant with delight. By the fire Ruth cried softly, and the colonel gently patted her dark head, his eyes full of tenderness. 
Then, taking refuge from the sharp pain of his emotion, in austere command, Dick, he said sternly, go to your mother. When Uncle Noah, in a state of beatification impossible to describe, summoned the four to the wonderful Christmas dinner, Colonel Fairfax was eagerly listening to the tales of Dick's success, as told by Ruth, and Dick was gently patting his mother's gray hair, a halo of silver crowning a face radiant with happiness, a Christmas quartet whose reconciliation Uncle Noah could as yet but imperfectly comprehend. That he had been the unconscious instrument of it all, the gray-eyed lady had already told him, but Uncle Noah, busy with numberless culinary problems in the kitchen, had not as yet had time to ferret it out. At four o'clock Major Verney, who had been restrained from dashing over to Briarwood hours before only by the necessity of soothing the ruffled feelings of his irate mother after her long wait for a belated sleigh on the porch of the Coatsville church, blustered in with the aggrieved old lady upon his arm. "'We've come to supper,' announced the Major. "'No, Dick,' as the Colonel rose, "'sit down. I know all about it, and tonight you're all going back to Fernlands with me to celebrate the betrothal of these two youngsters.' It has been a day of mystery, as the colonel said, but will someone please tell me what Uncle Noah was doing over at Fernlands this morning when he was needed here? A silence fell over the little group. The subject was one whose delicacy forbade the ghost of a blunder. It was the major who at last drew his old friend into the deep window recess, where but the night before he had watched Uncle Noah pursuing the elusive Job, and told him the story of the faithful old negro's Christmas Eve. The colonel listened intently the snowy landscape outside growing blurred and misty as the record of the old man's devotion gradually unfolded. Before the major had finished, the colonel's hand had crept to the bell at his side, and as the darky's shuffling footsteps echoed along the corridor, he turned again and stared with unseeing eyes at the outline of the old barn. Dick shifted the log, and a crimson glow irradiated the old library, making a halo of soft fire about the figure of the old darky as he paused before his master. "'Uncle Noah,' said the colonel brokenly, "'I—' But his voice failed him, and he wrung the old man's hand in silence. The major bent and whispered a few swift words to the startled darky, and a great light illumined the brown face. "'Don't you go for to thank me, Massa Dick,' he crooned, patting the colonel's hand with reverent devotion. "'I ain't worth it. All I need, sir, is just a good kick for disobeying orders.' "'Specs I don't understand it all, but I does know, sir, that the lady with the gray eyes what's at Major Verney's is—is is a good fairy, sir, and Colonel de Christmas supper am ready.' Joyously they filed out, Dick lingering in the firelight for a word with Ruth. Grandmother Verney, in high good humor, went out on the Colonel's arm, the grievance of the morning's belated sleigh quite forgotten in the genial warmth of the Fairfax hospitality. "'And what, Uncle Noah?' asked the colonel of the old darky, as usual. "'Have we to-night for supper?' "'Well, sir,' beamed Uncle Noah, "'we has ham and turkey, and cranberry sauce and celery, "'and baked apples, and mince pie, and fruit cake, and—and—' and, "'Laws a massy, massa, I's too kaflusterated to recommember any more.' "'We'll have them all,' cried the colonel. A terrific gobbling arose beneath the dining-room window, and the major rose and stared out in astonishment. "'Merciful goodness, Dick,' he demanded, "'what is that horrible racket?' "'Law's a massy, massa,' cried the old darky. "'It's Job. I let him out a while back, sir, "'and I done forgot to put him to roost. "'I reckon he's come to remind me.' And beaming happily at the radiant Christmas party, Uncle Noah flung up the window, and in a terrible voice commanded the tyrant to be silent. End of Uncle Noah's Christmas Inspiration by Leona Dalrymple The Voyage of the Wee Red Cap by Ruth Sawyer Durand. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. The Voyage of the Wee Red Cap by Ruth Sawyer Durand. It was the night of St. Stephen, and Tig sat alone by his fire with naught in his cupboard but a pinch of tea and a bare mixing of meal, and a heart inside of him as soft and warm as the ice on the water-bucket outside the door. The tuft was near burnt on the hearth, a handful of golden cinders left, just, 
and Tig took to counting them greedily on his fingers. There's one, two, three, and four, and five, he laughed. Faith, there be more bits of real gold hid under the loose clay in the corner. It was the truth, and it was the scraping and scrooching for the last piece that had left Teague's cupboard bare of a Christmas dinner. Gold is better nor eating and drinking, and if ye have not to give, there'll be not asked of ye, and he laughed again. He was thinking of the neighbors, and the doles of food and piggins of milk that would pass over their thresholds that night to the vagabonds and paupers who were sure to come begging, and on the heels of that thought followed another, who would be giving old Barney his dinner. Barney lived a stone's throw from Tig, alone, in a wee tumbled-in cabin, and for a score of years past Tig had stood on the doorstep every Christmas Eve, and, making a hollow of his two hands, had called across the road. "'Hey there, Barney, will ye come over for a sup?' And Barney had reached for his crutches, there being but one leg to him, and had come. Faith said teague trying another laugh barney can fast for the once twill be all the same in a month's time and he fell to thinking of the gold again a knock came at the door teague pulled himself down in his chair where the shadow would cover him and held his tongue teague teague it was the widow o'donnelly's voice if ye are there open your door i have not got the pay for the sprigging this month and the children are needing food. But Teague put the leash on his tongue and never stirred till he saw the tramp of her feet going on to the next cabin. Then he saw to it that the door was tight barred. Another knock came, and it was a stranger's voice this time. The other cabins are filled. Not one but has its hearth crowded. Will ye take us in, the two of us? The wind bites mortal sharp. Not a morsel of food have ne tasted this day. Master, will ye take us in? But Teague sat on, a holding his tongue, and the tramp of the stranger's feet passed down the road. Others took their place, small feet running. It was the miller's wee Cassie, and she called out as she ran by, Old Barney's watching for ye. Ye'll not be forgetting him, will ye, Teague? And then the child broke into a song, sweet and clear, as she passed down the road. Listen, all ye, tis the feast of St. Stephen. Mind that you keep it this holy even. Open your door, and greet ye the stranger. For ye mind that the wee lord had naught but a manger. Mir altra, feed ye the hungry, and rest ye the weary. This ye must do for the sake of our Mary. Tis well that ye mind, ye who sit by the fire, that the Lord he was born in a dark and cold byre. Miro astro. Tig put his fingers deep in his ears. A million murdering curses on them that won't let me be. Can't a man try to keep what it is without being pestered by them that has only idled and wasted their days? And then the strange thing happened. Hundreds and hundreds of wee lights began dancing outside the window, making the room bright. The hands of the clock began chasing each other round the dial, and the bolt of the door drew itself out slowly without a creak or a cringe the door opened and in there trooped a crowd of the good people their wee green cloaks were folded close about them and each carried a rush candle teague was filled with a great wonderment entirely when he saw the fairies but when they saw him they laughed oh we are taking the loan of your cabin this night teague said they ye are the only man hereabout with an empty hearth, and we're needin' one. Without saying more, they bustled about the room, making ready. They lengthened out the table and spread and set it. More of the good people trooped in, bringing stools and food and drink. The pipers came last, 
and they set themselves around the chimney-piece a-blowing their chanters and trying the drones the feasting began and the pipers played and never had teague seen such a sight in his life suddenly a wee man sang out clip clap clip clap i wish i had my wee red cap and out of the air there tumbled the neatest cap teague ever laid his two eyes on the wee man clapped it on his head crying i wish i was in spain and whist up the chimney he went and away out of sight it happened just as i am telling it another wee man called for his cap and away he went after the first and then another and another until the room was empty and teague sat alone again by my soul said teague i'd like to travel that way myself it's a grand saving of tickets and baggage and ye get to a place before ye've had time to change your mind faith there is no harm done if i try it so he sang the fairy's rhyme and out of the air dropped a wee cap for him for a moment the wonder had him but the next he was clapping the cap on his head and crying spain then whist up the chimney he went after the fairies and before he had time to let out his breath he was standing in the middle of spain and strangeness all about him he was in a great city the doorways of the houses were hung with flowers and the air was warm and sweet with the smell of them torches burned along the streets sweetmeat sellers went about crying their wares and on the steps of the cathedral crouched a crowd of beggars what's the meaning of that asked teague of one of the fairies they are waiting for those that are hearing mass when they come out they give half of what they have to those that have nothing so on this night all of the year there shall be no hunger and cold and then far down the street came the sound of a child's voice singing listen all ye tis the feast of saint stephen mind that you keep it this holy even curse it said teg can a song fly after a key and then he heard the fairies cry holland and cried holland too in one leap he was over france and another over belgium and with the third he was standing by long ditches of water frozen fast and over them glided hundreds upon hundreds of lads and maids outside each door stood a wee wooden shoe empty teague saw scores of them as he looked down the ditch of a street what is the meaning of the shoes he asked the fairies ye poor lad answered the wee man next to him are ye not knowing anything this is the gift night of the year when every man gives to his neighbor a child came to the window of one of the houses and in her hand was a lighted candle she was singing as she put the light down close to the glass and teague caught the words open your door and greet ye the stranger for ye mind that the wee lord had not but a manger mihor etro tis the devil's work cried teague and he set the red cap more firmly on his head i'm for another country i cannot be telling you a half of the adventures teague had that night nor half the sights that he saw but he passed by fields that held sheaves of grain for the birds and doorsteps that held bowls of porridge for the wee creatures he saw lighted trees sparkling and heavy with gifts and he stood outside the churches and watched the crowds pass in bearing gifts to the holy mother and child at last the fairies straightened their caps and cried now for the great hall in the king of england's palace whist and away they went and teague after them and the first thing he knew he was in london not an arm's length from the king's throne it was a grander sight than he had seen in any other country the hall was filled entirely with lords and ladies and the great doors were open for the poor and the homeless to come in and warm themselves by the king's fire and feast from the king's table and many a hungry soul did the king serve with his own hands those that had anything to give gave it in return it might be a bit of music played on a harp or a pipe or 
it might be a dance or a song but more often it was a wish just for good luck and safe-keeping teague was so taken up with the watching that he never heard the fairies when they wished themselves on moreover he never saw the wee girl that was fed and went laughing away but he heard a bit of her song as she passed through the door feed ye the hungry and rest ye the weary this ye must do for the sake of our mary then the anger had teague i'll stop your pestering tongue once and for all time and catching the cap from his head he threw it after her no sooner was the cap gone than every soul in the hall saw him the next moment they were about him catching at his coat and crying where is he from what does he hear bring him before the king and teague was dragged along by a hundred hands to the throne where the king sat he was stealing food cried one he was robbing the king's jewels cried another he looks evil cried a third kill him and in a moment all the voices took it up and the hall rang with ay kill him kill him teague's legs took to trembling and fear put the leash on his tongue but after a long silence he managed to whisper i have done evil to no one no one maybe said the king but have ye done good come tell us have you given aught to any one this night if ye have we will pardon ye not a word could teague say fear tightened the leash for he was knowing full well there was no good to him that night then you must die said the king will ye try hanging or beheading hanging please your majesty said teague the guards came rushing up and carried him off but as he was crossing the threshold of the hall a thought sprang at him and held him your majesty he called after him will you grant me a last request i will said the king thank ye there's a wee red cap that i'm mortal fond of and i lost it a while ago if i could be hung with it on i would hang a deal more comfortable the cap was found and brought to teague clip clap clip clap for my wee red cap i wish i was home he sang up and over the heads of the dumbfounded guard he flew and whist and away out of sight when he opened his eyes again he was sitting close by his own hearth with a fire burnt low the hands of the clock were still the bolt was fixed firm in the door the fairy's lights were gone and the only bright thing was the candle burning in old barney's cabin across the road a running of feet sounded outside and then the snatch of a song tis well that ye mind ye who sit by the fire that the lord he was born in a dark and cold byre mihir astro wait ye whoever ye are and teague was away to the corner digging fast at the loose clay as a terrier digs at a bone he filled his hands full of the shining gold then hurried to the door unbarring it the miller's wee cassie stood there peering at him out of the darkness take these to the widow o'donnelly do ye hear and take the rest to the store ye tell jamie to bring up all that he has that is eatable and drinkable and to the neighbors ye say teague's keepin the feast this night hurry now teague stopped a moment on the threshold until the tramp of her feet had died away then he made a hollow of his two hands and called across the road hey there barney will you come over for a sup end of the voyage of the wee red cap by ruth sawyer durand what christmas is as we grow older by charles dickens read in english this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bob Neufeld.
time was with most of us when christmas day encircling all our limited world like a magic ring left nothing out for us to miss or seek bound together all our home enjoyments affections and hopes grouped everything and every one around the christmas fire and made the little picture shining in our bright young eyes complete time came perhaps all so soon when our thoughts overleaped that narrow boundary when there was some one very dear we thought then very beautiful and absolutely perfect wanting to the fullness of our happiness when we were wanting too or we thought so which did just as well at the christmas hearth by which that same one sat and when we intertwined with every wreath and garland of our life that some one's name that was the time for the bright visionary christmases which have long arisen from us to show faintly after summer rain in the palest edges of the rainbow that was the time for the beatified enjoyment of the things that were to be never were and yet the things that were so real in our resolute hope that it would be hard to say now what realities achieved since have been stronger what did that christmas never really come when we and the priceless pearl who was our young choice were received after the happiest of totally impossible marriages by the two united families previously at daggers drawn on our account when brothers and sisters-in-law who had always been rather cool to us before our relationship was effected perfectly doted on us and when fathers and mothers overwhelmed us with unlimited incomes was that christmas dinner never really eaten after which we arose and generously and eloquently rendered honour to our late rival present in the company then and there exchanging friendship and forgiveness and founding an attachment not to be surpassed in greek or roman story which subsisted until death as that same rival long ceased to care for that same priceless pearl and married for money and become usurious above all do we really know now that we should probably have been miserable if we had won and worn the pearl and that we are better without her that christmas when we had recently achieved so much fame when we had been carried in triumph somewhere for doing something great and good when we had won an honoured and ennobled name and arrived and were received at home in a shower of tears of joy is it possible that that christmas has not come yet and is our life here at the best so constituted that pausing as we advance at such a noticeable milestone in the track of this great birthday that we look back on the things that never were as naturally and full as gravely as on the things that have been and are gone or have been and still are if it be so and so it seems to be must we come to the conclusion that life is little better than a dream and little worth the loves and strivings that we crowd into it no far be such miscalled philosophy from us dear reader on christmas day nearer and closer to our hearts be the christmas spirit which is the spirit of active usefulness perseverance cheerful discharge of duty kindness and forbearance it is in the last virtues especially that we are or should be strengthened by the unaccompanied visions of our youth for who shall say that they are not our teachers to deal gently even with the impalpable nothings of the earth therefore as we grow older let us be more thankful that the circle of our christmas associations and of the lessons that they bring expands let us welcome every one of them and summon them to take their places by the christmas hearth welcome old aspirations glittering creatures of an ardent fancy to your shelter underneath the holly we know you and have not outlived you yet welcome old projects and old loves however fleeting to your nooks among the steadier lights that burn around us welcome all that was ever real to our hearts and for the earnestness that made you real thanks to heaven 
do we build no christmas castles in the clouds now let our thoughts fluttering like butterflies among these flowers of children bear witness before this boy there stretches out a future brighter than we ever looked on in our old romantic time but bright with honour and with truth around this little head on which the sunny curls lie heaped the graces sport as prettily as airily as when there was no scythe within the reach of time to shear away the curls of our first love upon another girl's face near it placider but smiling bright a quiet and contented little face we see home fairly written shining from the word as rays shine from a star we see how when our graves are old other hopes than ours are young other hearts than ours are moved how other ways are smoothed how other happiness blooms ripens and decays no not decays for other homes and other bands of children not yet in being or for ages yet to be arise and bloom and ripen to the end of all welcome everything welcome alike what has been and what never was and what we hope may be to your shelter underneath the holly to your places around the christmas fire where what is sits open-hearted in yonder shadow do we see obtruding furtively upon the blaze an enemy's face by christmas day we do forgive him if the injury he has done us may admit to such companionship let him come here and take his place if otherwise unhappily let him go hence assured that we will never injure nor accuse him on this day we shut out nothing pause says a low voice nothing think on christmas day we will shut out from our fireside nothing not the shadow of a vast city where the withered leaves are lying deep the voice replies not the shadow that darkens the whole globe not the shadow of the city of the dead not even that of all days in the year we will turn our faces towards that city upon christmas day and from its silent hosts bring those we loved among us city of the dead in the blessed name wherein we are gathered together at this time and in the presence that is here among us according to the promise we will receive and not dismiss thy people who are dear to us yes we can look upon these children angels that alight so solemnly so beautifully among the living children by the fire and can bear to think how they departed from us entertaining angels unawares as the patriarchs did the playful children are unconscious of their guests but we can see them can see a radiant arm around one favourite neck as if there were a tempting of that child away among the celestial figures there is one a poor misshapen boy on earth of a glorious beauty now of whom his dying mother said it grieved her much to leave him here alone for so many years as it was likely would elapse before he came to her being such a little child but he went quickly and was laid upon her breast and in her hand she leads him there was a gallant boy who fell far away upon a burning sand beneath a burning sun and said tell them at home with my last love how much i could have wished to kiss them once but that i died contented and have done my duty or there was another over whom they read the words therefore we commit his body to the deep and so consigned him to the lonely ocean and sailed on and there was another who lay down to his rest in the dark shadow of great forests and on earth awoke no more oh shall they not from sand and sea and forest be brought home at such a time there was a dear girl almost a woman never to be one who made a morning christmas in a house of joy and went her trackless way to the silent city 
do we recollect her worn out faintly whispering what could not be heard then falling into the last sleep for weariness oh look upon her now oh look upon her beauty her serenity her changeless youth her happiness the daughter of jairus was recalled to life to die but she more blessed has heard the same voice saying unto her arise forever we had a friend who was a friend from early days with whom we often pictured the changes that were to come upon our lives and merrily imagined how we would speak and walk and think and talk when we came to be old his destined habitation in the city of the dead received him in his prime shall he be shut out from our christmas remembrance would his love have so excluded us lost friend lost child lost parent sister brother husband wife we will not so discard you you shall hold your cherished places in our christmas hearts and by our christmas fires and in the season of immortal hope and on the birthday of immortal mercy we will shut out nothing the winter sun goes down over town and village on the sea it makes a rosy path as if the sacred tread were fresh upon the water a few more moments and it sinks when night comes on and lights begin to sparkle in the prospect on the hillside beyond the shapelessly diffused town and in the quiet keeping of the trees that gird the village steeple remembrances are cut in stone planted in common flowers growing in grass entwined with lowly brambles around many a mound of earth in town and village there are doors and windows closed against the weather there are flaming logs heaped high there are joyful faces there is healthy music of voices be all ungentleness and harm excluded from the temples of the household gods but be those remembrances admitted tender encouragement they are of the time and all its comforting and peaceful reassurances and of the history that reunited even upon earth the living and the dead and of the broad beneficence and goodness that too many men have tried to tear into narrow shreds and of what christmas is as we grow older by charles dickens what think ye of christ by j c ryle this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. saying what think ye of christ whose son is he they say unto him the son of david matthew twenty two forty two first published by drummond's tract depot stirling scotland christmas is a season which almost all christians observe in one way or another some keep it as a religious season some keep it as a holiday but all over the world wherever there are christians in one way or another christmas is kept perhaps there is no country in which christmas is so much observed as it is in england christmas holidays christmas parties christmas family gatherings christmas services in churches christmas hymns and carols christmas holly and mistletoe who has not heard of these things they are as familiar to english people as anything in our lives they are among the first things we remember when we were children our grandfathers and grandmothers were used to them long before we were born they have been going on in england for many hundred years they seem likely to go on as long as the world stands but reader how many of those who keep christmas ever consider why christmas is kept how many in their christmas plans and arrangements give a thought to him without whom there would have been no christmas at all how many ever remember that the lord jesus christ is the cause of christmas how many ever reflect that the first intention of christmas was to remind christians of christ's birth and coming into the world reader how is it with you what do you think of at christmas bear with me a few minutes while i try to press upon you the question which heads this tract 
i do not want to make your christmas merriment less i do not wish to spoil your christmas cheer i only wish to put things in their right places i want christ himself to be remembered at christmas give me your attention while i unfold the question what think ye of christ one let us consider firstly why all men ought to think of christ two let us examine secondly the common thoughts of many about christ three let us count up lastly the thoughts of true christians about christ reader i dare say the demands upon your time this christmas are many your holidays are short you have friends to see you have much to talk about but still in the midst of all your hurry and excitement give a little time to your soul there will be a christmas some year when your place will be empty before that time comes suffer me as a friend to press home on your conscience the inquiry what think ye of christ one first then let us consider why all men ought to think of christ this is a question which needs to be answered at the very outset of this tract i know the minds of some people when they are asked about such things as i am handling to-day i know that many are ready to say why should we think about christ at all we want meat and drink and money and clothes and amusements we have no time to think about these high subjects we do not understand them let parsons and old women and sunday-school children mind such things if they like we have no time in a world like this to be thinking of christ such is the talk of thousands in this country they never go either to church or chapel they never read their bibles the world is their god they think themselves very wise and clever they despise those whom they call religious people but whether they like it or not they will all have to die one day they have all souls to be lost or saved in the world to come they will all have to rise again from their graves and to have a reckoning with god and shall their scoffing and contempt stop our mouths and make us ashamed no indeed not for a moment listen to me and i will tell you why all men ought to think of christ because of the office christ fills between god and man he is the eternal son of god through whom alone the father can be known approached and served he is the appointed mediator between god and man through whom alone we can be reconciled with god pardoned justified and saved he is the divine person whom god the father has sealed to be the giver of everything that man requires for his soul to him are committed the keys of death and hell in his favor is life in him alone there is hope of salvation for mankind without him no child of adam can be saved Quote, other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is jesus christ he that hath the son hath life and he that hath not the son of god hath not life first corinthians three eleven first john five twelve and ought not man to think of christ shall god the father honor him and shall not man i tell every reader of this tract that there is no person living or dead of such immense importance to all men as christ there is no person that men ought to think about so much as christ all men ought to think of christ because of what christ has done for all men he thought upon man when man was lost bankrupt and helpless by the fall and undertook to come into the world to save sinners in the fullness of time he was born of the virgin mary and lived for man thirty-three years in this evil world at the end of that time he suffered for sin on the cross as man's substitute he bore man's sins in his own body and shed his own life-blood to pay man's debt to god he was made a curse for man that man might be blessed he died for man that man might live he was counted a sinner for man that man might be counted righteous and ought not man to think of christ i tell every reader of this tract that if christ had not died for us we might all of us for anything we know be lying at this moment in hell all men ought to think of christ because of what christ will yet do to all men he shall come again one day to this earth with power and glory and raise the dead from their graves all shall come forth at his bidding 
those who would not move when they heard the church-going bell shall obey the voice of the archangel and the trump of god he shall set up his judgment seat and summon all mankind to stand before it to him every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is lord not one shall be able to escape that solemn assize not one but shall receive at the mouth of christ an eternal sentence every one shall receive according to what he has done in the body whether it be good or bad and ought not men to think of christ i tell every reader of this tract that whatever he may choose to think now a day is soon coming when his eternal condition will hinge entirely on his relations to christ but why should i say more on this subject the time would fail me if i were to set down all the reasons why all men ought to think of christ christ is the grand subject of the bible the scriptures testify of him christ is the great object to whom all the churches in christendom profess to give honour even the worst and most corrupt branches of it will tell you that they are built on christ christ is the end and substance of all sacraments and ordinances christ is the grand subject which every faithful minister exalts in the pulpit christ is the object that every true pastor sets before dying people on their deathbeds christ is the great source of light and peace and hope there is not a spark of spiritual comfort that has ever illumined a sinner's heart that has not come from christ surely it never can be a small matter whether we have any thoughts about christ reader i leave this part of my subject here there are many things which swallow up men's thoughts while they live which they will think little of when they are dying hundreds are wholly absorbed in political schemes and seem to care for nothing but the advancement of their own party myriads are buried in business and money matters and seem to neglect everything else but this world thousands are always wrangling about the forms and ceremonies of religion and are ready to cry down everybody who does not use their shibboleths and worship in their way but an hour is fast coming when only one subject will be minded and that subject will be christ we shall all find and many perhaps too late that it mattered little what we thought about other things so long as we did not think about christ reader i tell you this christmas that all men ought to think about christ there is no one in whom all the world has such a deep interest there is no one to whom all the world owes so much high and low rich and poor old and young gentle and simple all ought to think about christ two let us examine secondly the common thoughts of many about christ to set down the whole list of thoughts about christ would indeed be thankless labor it must content us to range them under a few general heads this will save us both time and trouble there were many strange thoughts about christ when he was on earth there are many strange and wrong thoughts about christ now when he is in heaven the thoughts of some people about christ are simply blasphemous they are not ashamed to deny his divinity they refuse to believe the miracles recorded of him they pretend to find fault with not a few of his sayings and doings they even question the perfect honesty and sincerity of some things that he did they tell us that he ought to be ranked with great reformers and philosophers like socrates seneca and confucius but no higher thoughts like these are purely ridiculous and absurd they utterly fail to explain the enormous influence which christ and christianity have had for eighteen hundred years in this world there is not the slightest comparison to be made between christ and any other teacher of mankind that ever lived the difference between him and others is a gulf that cannot be spanned and a height that cannot be measured it is the difference between gold and clay between the sun and a candle nothing can account for christ in christianity but the old belief that christ is very god reader are the thoughts i have just described your own if they are take care the thoughts of some people about christ are vague dim misty and indistinct that there was such a person they do not for a moment deny that he was the founder of christianity and the object of christian worship they are quite aware that they hear of him every time they go to public worship 
and ought to have some opinion or belief about him, they will fully admit. But they could not tell you what it is they believe. They could not accurately describe and define it. They have not thoroughly considered the subject. They have not made up their minds. Thoughts such as these are foolish, silly, and unreasonable. To be a dying sinner with an immortal soul, and to go on living without making up one's mind about the only person who can save us, the person who will at last judge us, is the conduct of a lunatic or an idiot, and not of a rational man. Reader, are the thoughts I have just described your own? If they are, take care. The thoughts of some men about Christ are mean and low. They have, no doubt, a distinct opinion about his position in their system of Christianity. They consider that if they do their best, and live moral lives, and go to church pretty regularly, and use the ordinances of religion, Christ will deal mercifully with them at last, and make up any deficiencies. Thoughts such as these utterly fail to explain why Christ died on the cross. They take the crown off Christ's head, and degrade him into a kind of make-weight to man's soul. They overthrow the whole system of the gospel, and pull up all its leading doctrines by the roots. They exalt man to an absurdly high position, as if he could pay some part of the price of his soul. They rob man of all the comfort of the gospel, as if he must needs do something and perform some work to justify his own soul. They make Christ a sort of judge far more than a saviour, and place the cross and the atonement in a degraded and inferior position. Reader, are the thoughts I have just described your own? If they are, take care. The thoughts of some men about Christ are dishonouring and libelous. They seem to think that we need a mediator between ourselves and our Saviour. They appear to suppose that Christ is so high and awful and exalted a person, that poor sinful man may not approach him. They say that we must employ an episcopacy-ordained minister as a kind of go-between, to stand between us and Jesus, and manage for our souls. They send us to saints or angels or the Virgin Mary, as if they were more kind and accessible than Christ. Thoughts such as these are a practical denial of Christ's priestly office. They overthrow the whole doctrine of his peculiar business as man's intercessor. They hide and bury out of sight his especial love to sinners and his boundless willingness to receive them. Instead of a gracious saviour, they make him out an austere and hard king. Reader, are the thoughts I have just described your own? If they are, take care. The thoughts of some men about Christ are wicked and unholy. They seem to think that they may live as they please, because Christ died for sinners. They will indulge every kind of wickedness, and yet flatter themselves that they are not blameworthy for it, because Christ is a merciful Saviour. They will talk complacently of God's election, and the necessity of grace, and the impossibility of being justified by works, and the fullness of Christ, and then make these glorious doctrines an excuse for lying, cheating, drunkenness, fornication, and every kind of immorality. Thoughts such as these are as blasphemous and profane as downright infidelity. They actually make Christ the patron of sin. Reader, are these thoughts I have described your own? If they are, take care. Reader, two general remarks apply to all these thoughts about Christ, of which I have just been speaking. They all show a deplorable ignorance of Scripture. I defy any one to read the Bible honestly, and find any warrant for them in that blessed book. Men cannot know their Bibles when they hold such opinions. They all help to prove the corruption and darkness of human nature. Man is ready to believe anything about Christ, except the simple truth. He loves to set up an idol of his own and bow down to it, rather than accept the Saviour whom God puts before him. I leave this part of my subject here. It is a sorrowful and painful one, but not without its use. It is necessary to study morbid anatomy if we would understand health. The ground must be cleared of rubbish before we build. 3. Let us now count up, lastly, the thoughts of true Christians about Christ. The thoughts I am going to describe are not the thoughts of many. I admit this most fully. 
it would be vain to deny it the number of right thinkers about christ in every age has been small the true christians among professing christians have always been few if it were not so the bible would have told an untruth straight is the gate says the lord jesus and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life and few there be that find it wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat many walk says paul of whom i tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of christ whose end is destruction matthew seven thirteen and fourteen philippians three eighteen and nineteen true christians have high thoughts of christ they see in him a wondrous person far above all other beings in his nature a person who is at one in the same time perfect god mighty to save and perfect man able to feel they see in him an all-powerful redeemer who has paid their countless debts to god and delivered their souls from guilt and hell they see in him an almighty friend who left heaven for them lived for them died for them rose again for them that he might save them for evermore they see in him an almighty physician who washed away their sins in his own blood put his own spirit in their hearts delivered them from the power of sin and gave them power to become god's children happy are they who have such thoughts reader have you true christians have trustful thoughts of christ they daily lean the weight of their souls upon him by faith for pardon and peace they daily commit the care of their souls to him as a man commits a treasure to a safe keeper they daily cling to him by faith as a child in a crowd clings to its mother's hand they look to him daily for mercy grace comfort help and strength as israel looked to the pillar of cloud and fire in the wilderness for guidance christ is the rock under their feet and the staff in their hands their ark and their city of refuge their sun and their shield their bread and their medicine their health and their light their fountain and their shelter their portion and their home their door and their ladder their root and their head, their advocate and their physician, their captain and their elder brother, their life, their hope, and their all. Happy are they who have such thoughts. Reader, have you? True Christians have experimental thoughts of Christ. The things that they think of him, they do not merely think with their heads. They have not learned them from schools or picked them up from others they think them because they have found them true by their own heart's experience they have proved them and tasted them and tried them they think out for themselves what they have felt there is all the difference in the world between knowing that a man is a doctor or a lawyer while we never have occasion to employ him and knowing him as our own because we have gone to him for medicine or law just in the same way there is a wide difference between head knowledge and experimental thoughts of christ happy are they who have such thoughts reader have you true christians have loving and reverent thoughts of christ they love to do the things that please him they like in their poor weak way to show their affection to him by keeping his words they love everything belonging to him his day his house his ordinances his people his book they never find his yoke heavy or his burden painful to bear or his commandments grievous love lightens all they know something of the mind of mr standfast in pilgrim's progress when he said as he stood in the river i have loved to hear my lord spoken of and whenever i have seen the print of his shoe in the earth then i have coveted to set my foot over it happy are they who have such thoughts reader have you true christians have hopeful thoughts of christ they expect to receive far more from him one day than they have ever received yet they hope that they shall be kept to the end and never perish but this is not all they look forward to christ's second coming and expect that then they shall see far more than they have seen and enjoy far more than they have yet enjoyed they have an earnest of an inheritance now in the spirit dwelling in their heart 
but they hope for a far fuller possession when this world has passed away they have hopeful thoughts of christ's second advent of their own resurrection from the grave of their reunion with all the saints who have gone before them of eternal blessedness in christ's kingdom happy are they who have such thoughts they sweeten life and lift men over many cares reader have you such thoughts reader thoughts such as these are the property of all true christians some of them know more of them and some of them know less but they all know something about them they do not always feel them equally at all time they do not always find such thoughts equally fresh and green in their minds they have their winter as well as their summer and their low tide as well as their high water but all true christians are more or less acquainted with these thoughts in this matter churchmen and dissenters rich and poor are all agreed if they are true christians in other things they may be unable to agree and see alike but they all agree in their thoughts about christ one word they can all say which is the same in every tongue that word is hallelujah praise to the lord christ one answer they can all make which in every tongue is equally the same that word is amen so be it and now reader i shall wind up my christmas tract by simply bringing before your conscience the question which forms its title i ask you this day what think ye of christ what others think about him is not the question now their mistakes are no excuse for you their correct views will not save your soul the point you have before you is simply this what do you think yourself reader this christmas may possibly be your last who can tell you but you may never live to see another december come round who can tell but your place may be empty when the family party next christmas is gathered together do not i entreat you put off my question or turn away from it it can do you no harm to look at it and consider it what do you think of christ again i beseech you this day to have right thoughts of christ if you never had them before let the time past suffice you to have lived without real and heartfelt religion let this present christmas be a starting point in your soul's history awake to see the value of your soul and the immense importance of being saved break off sharp from sin in the world get down your bible and begin to read it call upon the lord jesus christ in prayer and beseech him to save your soul rest not rest not till you have trustful loving experimental hopeful thoughts of christ reader mark my words if you will only take the advice i have now given you you will never repent it your life in future will be happier your heart will be lighter your christmas gatherings will be more truly joyful nothing makes christmas meetings so happy as to feel that we are all travelling on towards an eternal gathering in heaven reader i say for the last time if you would have a happy christmas have right thoughts about christ End of What Think Ye of Christ by J. C. Ryle Why the Sea's Salt by Mary Howitt Read in English This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org There were, in very ancient times, two brothers one of whom was rich and the other poor. Christmas was approaching, but the poor man had nothing in the house for a Christmas dinner, so he went to his brother and asked him for a trifling gift. The rich man was ill-natured, and when he heard his brother's request he looked very surly, but as Christmas is a time when even the worst people give gifts, he took a fine ham down from the chimney, where it was hanging to smoke, threw it at his brother, and bade him be gone and never show his face again. The poor man thanked his brother for the ham, put it under his arm, and went his way. He had to pass through a great forest on his way home, and when he reached the thickest part of it, he saw an old man with a long white beard, hewing timber. "'Good evening,' said the poor man. "'Good evening,' returned the old man, raising himself from his work and looking at him. "'That is a fine ham you are carrying.' 
On hearing this, the poor man told him all about the ham and how it was obtained. "'It is lucky for you,' says the old man, "'that you have met with me. "'If you will take that ham into the land of the dwarfs, "'the entrance to which lies just under the roots of this tree, "'you can make a capital bargain with it, "'for the dwarfs are very fond of ham and rarely get any. "'But mind what I say, you must not sell it for money, "'but demand for it the old handmill which stands behind the door. "'When you come back, I'll show you how to use it.' The poor man thanked his new friend, who showed him a door under the stone below the roots of the tree, and by this door he entered the land of the dwarfs. No sooner had he set foot in it than the dwarfs swarmed about him, attracted by the smell of the ham. They offered him queer, old-fashioned money and gold and silver ore for it, but he refused all their tempting offers and said that he would sell it only for the old handmill behind the door. At this the dwarfs held up their little old hands and looked quite perplexed. "'We cannot make a bargain, it seems,' said the poor man, "'so I'll bid you all good day.' The fragrance of the ham had by this time reached the remote parts of the land. The dwarfs came flocking around in little troops, leaving their work of digging out precious oars, eager for the ham. "'Let him have the old mill,' said some of the newcomers. "'It is quite out of order, and he does not know how to use it. Let him have it, and we will have the ham.' So the bargain was made. The poor man took the old handmill, which was a little thing, not half so large as the ham, and went back to the woods. Here the old man showed him how to use it. All this had taken up a great deal of time, and it was midnight before he reached home. "'Where in the world have you been?' said his wife. "'Here I have been waiting and waiting, and we have no wood to make a fire, nor anything to put in the porridge pot for our Christmas supper.' The house was dark and cold. But the poor man bade his wife wait and see what would happen. He placed the little handmill on the table and began to turn the crank. First, out there came some grand lighted wax candles, and a fire on the hearth, and a porridge pot boiling over it, because in his mind he said they should come first. Then he ground out a tablecloth, and dishes, and spoons, and knives, and forks, and napkins. He was himself astonished at his good luck, as you may believe and his wife was almost beside herself with joy and astonishment. Well, they had a capital supper, and after it was eaten, they ground out of the mill every possible thing to make their house and themselves warm and comfortable. So they had a merry Christmas Eve and morning, made merrier by the thought that they need never want again. When the people went by the house to the church the next day, they could hardly believe their eyes. There was glass in the windows instead of wooden shutters, and the poor man and his wife, dressed in new clothes, were seen devoutly kneeling in the church. "'There's something very strange in all this,' said every one. "'Something very strange indeed,' said the rich man, when three days afterwards he received an invitation from his once poor brother to a grand feast. And what a feast it was! The table was covered with a cloth as white as snow, and the dishes were all of silver or gold. The rich man could not in his great house, and with all his wealth, set out such a table or serve such food where did you get all these things exclaimed he his brother told him all about the bargain he had made with the dwarfs and putting the mill on the table ground out boots and shoes coats and cloaks stockings gowns and blankets and bade his wife give them to the poor people that had gathered about the house to get a sight of the grand feast the poor brother had made for the rich one and to sniff the delightful odours that came from the kitchen the rich man was very envious of his brother's good fortune, and wanted to borrow the mill, intending, for he was not an honest man, never to return it again. His brother would not lend it, for the old man with the white beard had told him never to sell or lend it to any one, no matter what inducements might be offered. Some years went by, and at last the possessor of the mill built himself a grand castle on a rock by the sea, facing west. Its windows— reflecting the golden sunset, could be seen far out from the shore, and it became a noted landmark for sailors. Strangers from foreign parts often came to see this castle and the wonderful mill, of which the most extraordinary tales were told. At length a great foreign merchant came, and when he had seen the mill, inquired whether it would grind salt. Being told that it would, he wanted to buy it, for he traded in salt, 
and thought that if he owned the mill he could supply all his customers without taking long and dangerous voyages. The man would not sell it, of course. He was so rich now that he did not want to use it for himself, but every Christmas he ground up food and clothes and coal for the poor, and nice presents for the little children. So he rejected all the offers of the rich merchant, who, however, determined to have it. He bribed one of the man's servants to let him go into the castle at night, and he stole the mill and sailed away in triumph, feeling certain that his fortune was made. He had scarcely got out to sea before he determined to set the mill to work. "'Now, mill, grind salt,' said he. "'Grind salt with all your might. Salt, salt, and nothing but salt.' The mill began to grind, and the sailors to fill the sacks. But these were soon full, and in spite of all that could be done, it began to fill the ship. The dishonest merchant was now very much frightened. What was to be done? The mill would not stop grinding, and at last the ship was overloaded, and down it went, making a great whirlpool where it sank. The ship went to pieces, but the mill stands on the bottom of the sea, and keeps grinding out, Salt! Salt! Nothing but salt! That is the reason, say the peasants of Denmark and Norway, why the sea is salt. End of Why the Sea is Salt by Mary Howitt Read by Lucy Perry in Bath on November 6, 2011